This is Audible. From the studios of Books in Motion in Spokane, Washington, this is Jack Sondricker, reading This Present Darkness by Frank E. Peretti. Chapter 1 Late on a full moon Sunday night, the two figures in work clothes appeared on Highway 27, just outside the small college town of Ashton. They were tall, at least seven feet, strongly built, perfectly proportioned. One was dark-haired and sharp-featured, the other blonde and powerful. From a half a mile away they looked toward the town, regarding the cacophonic sounds of gaiety from the storefronts, streets, and alleys within it. They started walking. It was the time of the Ashton Summer Festival, the town's yearly exercise in frivolity and chaos. It's way of saying thank you, come again, good luck, and nice to have you to the 800 or so college students at Whitmore College, who would be getting their long-awaited summer break from classes. Most would pack up and go home, but all would definitely stay at least long enough to take in the festivities, the street disco, the carnival rides, the nickel movies, and whatever else could be had over or under the table for kicks. It was a wild time. A chance to get drunk, pregnant, beat up, ripped off, and sick, all in the same night. In the middle of town, a community-conscious landowner had opened up a vacant lot and permitted a traveling troop of enterprising migrants to set up their carnival with rides, booths, and porta-potties. The rides were best viewed in the dark, an escapade in gaily lit rust powered by unmuffled tractor engines that competed with the wavering carnival music which squawked loudly from somewhere in the middle of it all. But on this warm summer night, the roaming cotton-candied masses were out to enjoy, enjoy, enjoy. A Ferris wheel slowly turned, hesitated for boarding, turned some more for unboarding, then took a few full rotations to give its passengers their money. A merry-go-round spun in a brightly lit, gaudy circle, the peeling and dismembered horses still prancing to the melody of the canned calliope. Carnival goers threw baseballs at baskets, dimes at ashtrays, darts at balloons, and money to the wind along the hastily assembled ramshackle midway where the hawkers ranted the same try-your-luck chatter for each passerby. The two visitors stood tall and silent in the middle of it all, wondering how a town of 12,000 people, including college students, could produce such a vast, teeming crowd. The usually quiet population had turned out in droves, augmented by diversion seekers from elsewhere, until the streets, taverns, stores, alleys, and parking spots were jammed. Anything was allowed, and the illegal was ignored. The police did have their hands full, but each rowdy, vandal, drunk, or hooker in cuffs only meant a dozen more still loose and roaming about the town. The festival, reaching a crescendo now on its last night, was like a terrible storm that couldn't be stopped. One could only wait for it to blow over, and there would be plenty to clean up afterward. The two visitors made their way slowly through the people-packed carnival listening to the talk, watching the activity. They were inquisitive about this town, so they took their time observing here and there, on the right, on the left, before and behind. The milling throngs were moving around them like swirling garments in a washing machine, meandering from this side of the street to the other in an unpredictable, never-ending cycle. The two tall men kept eyeing the crowd. They were looking for someone. "'There,' said the dark-haired man. "'They both saw her. "'She was young, very pretty, but also very unsettled, "'looking this way and that, a camera in her hands "'and a stiff-lipped expression on her face. "'The two men hurried through the crowd and stood beside her. "'She didn't notice them. "'You know,' the dark-haired one said to her, "'you might try looking over there.' With that simple comment, he guided her by a hand on her shoulder toward one particular booth on the midway. She stepped through the grass and candy wrappers, moving toward the booth where some teenagers were egging each other on and popping balloons with darts. None of that interested her, but then... 
some shadows moving stealthily behind the booth did. She held her camera ready, took a few more silent, careful steps, and then quickly raised the camera to her eye. The flash of the bulb lit up the trees behind the booth as the two men hurried away to their next appointment. They moved smoothly, unfalteringly, passing through the main part of town at a brisk pace. Their final destination was a mile past the center of town, right on Poplar Street, and up to the top of Morgan Hill about a half mile. Practically no time at all had passed before they stood before the little white church on its postage stamp lot, with its well-groomed lawn and dainty Sunday school and service billboard. Across the top of the little billboard was the name Ashton Community Church, and in black letters hastily painted over whatever name used to be there, it said, Henry L. Bush, Pastor. They looked back. From this lofty hill one could look over the whole town and see it spread from city limit to city limit. To the west sparkled the caramel-colored carnival. To the east stood the dignified and matronly Whitmore College campus. Along Highway 27, Main Street through town, were the storefront offices, the small town-sized Sears, a few gas stations at war, a true-value hardware, the local newspaper, several small family businesses. From here the town looked so typically American, small, innocent, and harmless, like the background for every Norman Rockwell painting. But the two visitors did not perceive with eyes only. Even from this vantage point, the true substratum of Ashton weighed very heavily upon their spirits and minds. They could feel it. Restless, strong, growing, very designed and purposeful, a very special kind of evil. It was not unlike either of them to ask questions, to study, to probe. More often than not, it came with their job. So they naturally hesitated in their business, pausing to wonder, Why here? But only for an instant. It could have been some acute sensitivity, an instinct, a very faint but for them discernible impression. But it was enough to make them both instantly vanish around the corner of the church, melding themselves against the beveled siding, almost invisible there in the dark. They didn't speak, they didn't move but they watched with a piercing gaze as something approached. The night scene of the quiet street was a collage of stark blue moonlight and bottomless shadows. But one shadow did not stir with the wind as did the tree shadows, and neither did it stand still as did the building shadows. It crawled, quivered, moved along the street toward the church, while any light it crossed seemed to sink into its blackness, as if it were a breach torn in space. But this shadow had a shape, an animated creature-like shape, and as it neared the church sounds could be heard, the scratching of claws along the ground, the faint rustling of breeze-blown membranous wings wafting just above the creature's shoulders. It had arms and it had legs, but it seemed to move without them, crossing the street and mounting the front steps of the church. Its leering, bulbous eyes reflected the stark blue light of the full moon with their own jaundiced glow. The gnarled head protruded from hunched shoulders, and wisps of rancid red breath seethed in labored hisses through rows of jagged fangs. It either laughed or it coughed. The wheezes puffing out from deep within its throat could have been either. From its crawling posture it reared up on its legs and looked about the quiet neighborhood, the black leathery jowls pulling back into a hideous death mask grin. It moved toward the front door. The black hand passed through the door like a spear through liquid. The body hobbled forward and penetrated the door, but only halfway. Suddenly, as if colliding with a speeding wall, the creature was knocked backward and into a raging tumble down the steps, the glowing red breath tracing a corkscrew trail through the air. With an eerie cry of rage and indignation, it gathered itself up off the sidewalk and stared at the strange door that would not let it pass through. Then the membranes on its back began to billow, 
enfolding great bodies of air, and it flew with a roar headlong at the door, through the door, and into the foyer, and into a cloud of white-hot light. The creature screamed and covered its eyes, then felt itself being grabbed by a huge, powerful vice of a hand. In an instant it was hurling through space like a rag doll, outside again, forcefully ousted. The wings hummed in a blur as it banked sharply in a flying turn and headed for the door again, red vapors chugging in dashes and streaks from its nostrils, its talons bared and poised for attack, a ghostly siren of a scream rising in its throat. Like an arrow through a target, like a bullet through a board, it streaked through the door and instantly felt its insides tearing loose. There was an explosion of suffocating vapor, one final scream, and the flailing of withering arms and legs. Then there was nothing at all except the ebbing stench of sulfur and the two strangers suddenly inside the church. The big blond man replaced a shining sword as the white light that surrounded him faded away. A spirit of harassment? he asked. Or doubt. Nor fear. Who knows? And that was one of the smaller ones. I have not seen one smaller. No, indeed. And uh, just how many would you say there are? More. Much more than we. And everywhere. Never idle. <sighs> so I've seen, the big man sighed. But what are they doing here? We've never seen such concentration before. Not here. Oh, the reason won't be hidden for long. He looked through the foyer doors and toward the sanctuary. Let's see this man of God. They turned from the door and walked through the small foyer. The bulletin board on the wall carried requests for groceries for a needy family, some babysitting, and prayer for a sick missionary. A large bill announced a congregational business meeting for next Friday. On the other wall, the record of weekly offerings indicated the offerings were down from last week. So was the attendance from 61 to 42. Down the short and narrow aisle they went, past the orderly ranks of dark-stained plank and slat pews, toward the front of the sanctuary, where one small spotlight illumined a rustic two-by-four cross hanging above the baptistry. In the center of the worn carpeted platform stood the little sacred desk, the pulpit, with a Bible laid open upon it. These were humble furnishings, functional but not at all elaborate, revealing either humility on the part of the people or neglect. Then the first sound was added to the picture a soft, muffled sobbing from the end of the right pew. There, kneeling in earnest prayer, his head resting on the hard wooden bench and his hands clenched with fervency, was a young man. Very young, the blond man thought at first. Young and vulnerable. It all showed in his countenance, now the very picture of pain, grief, and love. His lips moved without sound as names, petitions, and praises poured forth with passion and tears. The two couldn't help but just stand there for a moment, watching, studying, pondering. The little warrior, said the dark-haired one. The big blond man formed the words himself in silence, looking down at the contrite man in prayer. Yes, he observed, this is the one. Even now he's interceding, standing before the Lord for the sake of the people, for the town. Almost every night he's here. At that remark, the big man smiled. He's not so insignificant. But he's the only one. He's alone. No, the big man shook his head. There are others. There are always others. They just have to be found. For now, his single vigilant prayer is the beginning. He's going to be hurt, you know that. And so will the newspaper man, and so will we. But will we win? The big man's eyes seemed to burn with a rekindled fire. We will fight. We will fight, 
his friend agreed. They stood over the kneeling warrior on either side, and at that moment, little by little, like the bloom of a flower, white light began to fill the room. It illumined the cross on the back wall, slowly brought out the colors and grain in every plank of every pew, and rose in intensity until the once plain and humble sanctuary came alive with an unearthly beauty. The walls glimmered, the worn rugs glowed, the little pulpit stood tall and stark as a sentinel backlit by the sun. And now the two men were brilliantly white, their former clothing transfigured by garments that seemed to burn with intensity. Their faces were bronzed and glowing, their eyes shone like fire, and each man wore a glistening golden belt from which hung a flashing sword. They placed their hands upon the shoulders of the young man, and then, like a gracefully spreading canopy, silken, shimmering, nearly transparent membranes began to unfold from their backs and shoulders, and rise to meet and overlap above their heads, gently undulating in a spiritual wind. Together they ministered peace to their young charge, and his many tears began to subside. The Ashton Clarion was a small-town grassroots newspaper. It was little and quaint, maybe just a touch unorganized at times, unassuming. It was, in other words, the printed expression of the town of Ashton. Its offices occupied a small storefront space on Main Street in the middle of town, just a one-story affair with a large display window and a heavy, toe-scuffed door with a mail slot. The paper came out twice a week on Tuesdays and Fridays, and didn't make a lot of money. By the appearance of the office and layout facilities, you could tell it was a low-budget operation. In the front hall of the building was the office and newsroom area. It consisted of three desks, two typewriters, two wastebaskets, two telephones, one coffee maker without a cord, and what looked like all the scattered notes, papers, stationery, and office bric-a-brac in the world. An old worn counter from a torn-down railroad station formed a divider between the functioning office and the reception area. And, of course, there was a small bell above the door that jingled every time someone came in. Toward the back of this maze of small-scale activity was one luxury that looked just a little too big town for this place, a glassed-in office for the editor. It was, in fact, a new addition. The new editor-owner was a former big city reporter, and having a glassed-in editor's office had been one of his life's dreams. This new fellow was Marshall Hogan, a strong, big-framed bustler-hustler whom his staff, the typesetter, the secretary reporter ad girl, the paste-up man, and the reporter columnist lovingly referred to as Attila the Hogan. He had bought the paper a few months ago, and the clash between his big city polish and their small town easy go still roused some confrontations from time to time. Marshall wanted a quality paper, one that ran efficiently and smoothly and made its deadlines with a place for everything and everything in its place. But the transition from the New York Times to the Ashton Clarion was like jumping off a speeding train into a wall of half-set jello. Things just didn't click as fast in this little office, and the high-powered efficiency Marshall was used to had to give way to such Ashton Clarion quirks as saving all the coffee grounds for the secretary's compost pile, and someone finally turning in a long-awaited human interest story, but with parakeet droppings on it. On Monday morning, the traffic patterns were hectic, with no time for any weekend hangovers. The Tuesday edition was being brought forth in a rush, and the entire staff was feeling the labor pains, dashing back and forth between their desks in front and the paste-up room in the back, squeezing past each other in the narrow passage, carrying rough copy for articles and ads to be typeset, finished typeset galleys and assorted shapes and sizes of half-tones of photographs that would highlight the news pages. In the back, amid bright lights, cluttered work tables, and rapidly moving bodies, Marshall and Tom the paste-up man bent over a large, bench-like easel, assembling Tuesday's clarion out of bits and pieces that seemed to be scattered everywhere. This goes here. This can't. 
so we have to shove it somewhere else. This is too big. What do we use to fill this? Marshall was getting miffed. Every Monday and Thursday, he got miffed. Edie, he hollered, and his secretary answered, Coming! And he told her for the umpteenth time, The galleys go in the trays over the table, not on the table, not on the floor, not on the... I didn't put any galleys on the floor, Edie protested as she hurried into the paste-up room with more galleys in her hand. She was a tough little woman of forty with just the right personality to stand up to Marshall's brusqueness. She still knew where to find things around the office better than anyone, especially her new boss. I've got them right in your cute little trays where you want them. So how'd these get here on the floor? Wind, Marshall, and don't make me tell you where that came from. All right, Marshall, said Tom. That takes care of pages three, four, six, seven. What about one and two? What are we going to do with all these empty slots? We're going to put in Bernie's coverage of the festival with clever writing, dramatic human interest photos, the whole bit. As soon as she gets her rear in here and gives them to us, Edie, yo, Bernie's an hour late for crying out loud. Call her again, will you? Just did. No answer. Nuts. George, the small retired typesetter who still worked for the fun of it, swiveled his chair away from the typesetting machine and offered, How about the ladies' auxiliary barbecue? I'm just finishing that up, and the photo of Mrs. Marmosel is spicy enough for a lawsuit. Eh, Marshall groaned, right on page one. That's all I need, a good impression. So, what now? Edie asked. Uh, anybody make it to the festival? Went fishing, said George. That festival's too wild for me. My wife wouldn't let me, said Tom. I caught some of it, said Edie. Start writing, said Marshall. The biggest town buster of the year, and we've got to have something on it. The phone rang. Saved by the bell? Edie chirped as she picked up the backroom extension. Good morning, the clarion. Suddenly she brightened. Hey, Bernice, where are you? Where is she? Marshall demanded at the same time. Edie listened and her face filled with horror. Yes, well, well calm down now. Sure, well, don't worry, we'll get you out. Marshall spouted. Well, where the heck is she? Edie gave him a scolding look and answered. In jail. Chapter 2 Marshall hurried into the basement of the Ashton police station and immediately wished he could disconnect his nose and ears. Beyond the heavily barred gate to the cell block, the crammed jail cells didn't smell or sound much different from the carnival the night before. On his way here, he had noticed how quiet the streets were this morning. No wonder. All the noise had moved inside to these half-dozen peeling painted cells set in cold, echoing concrete. Here were all the dopers, vandals, rowdies, drunks, and no-goods the police could scrape off the face of the town, collected in what amounted to an overcrowded zoo. Some were making a party of it, playing poker for cigarettes with finger-smeared cards and trying to outdo each other's tales of illicit exploits. Toward the end of the cells, a gang of young bucks made obscene comments to a cage full of prostitutes with no better place to be locked up. Others just slumped in corners in a drunken stew or a depressed slump or both. The remainder glared at him from behind the bars, made snide remarks, begged for peanuts. He was glad he had left Kate upstairs. Jimmy Dunlop, the new deputy, was stationed loyally at the guard desk, filling out forms and drinking strong coffee. Hey, Mr. Hogan, you got right down here. I couldn't wait. And I won't wait, he snapped. He wasn't feeling well. This had been his first festival, and that was bad enough. But he never expected, never dreamed of such a prolonging of the agony. He towered over the desk, his big frame shifting forward to accentuate his impatience. Well, he demanded, hmm? I'm here to get my reporter out of the can. Sure, I know that. Have you got a release? 
Listen, I just paid off those yo-yos upstairs. They were supposed to call you down here. Well, I haven't heard a thing, and I have to have authorization. Jimmy. Yeah? Your phone's off the hook. Oh. Marshall set the phone down right in front of him with a firmness that made the phone jingle in pain. Call him. Marshall straightened up and watched Jimmy dial wrong, dial again, try to get through. He goes well with the rest of the town, Marshall thought, nervously running his fingers through his graying red hair. Ah, oh, it was a nice town, sure. Cute, maybe a little dumb, kind of like a bumbling kid who always got himself into jams. Things weren't really better in the big city, he tried to remind himself. Uh, Mr. Hogan, Jimmy asked, his hand over the receiver. Uh, who was it you talked to? Kinney. Uh, Sergeant Kinney, please. Marshall was impatient. Let's have the key for the gate. I'll let her know I'm here. Jimmy gave him the key. He'd argued with Marshall Hogan before. A whoop of mock welcome poured out of the cells along with hurled cigarette butts and whistled march tunes as he passed by. He lost no time in finding the cell he wanted. All right, Kruger. I know you're in there. Come and get me, Hogan, came the reply from a desperate and somewhat outraged female voice down near the end. Well, stick out your arm, wave at me or something. A hand stuck out through the bodies and bars and gave him a desperate wave. He got there, gave the palm a slap, and found himself face to face with Bernice Kruger, jailbird, his prize columnist and reporter. She was a young, attractive woman in her mid-twenties, with unkempt brown hair and large wire-rimmed glasses, now smudged. She had obviously had a hard night and was presently keeping company with at least a dozen women, some older, some shockingly younger, mostly trucked-in prostitutes. Marshall didn't know whether to laugh or spit. "'I won't mince words. You look terrible,' he said. "'Only in keeping with my vocation. I'm a hooker now.' "'Yeah, yeah, one of us,' a chunky girl sang out. Marshall grimaced and shook his head. What kind of questions were you asking out there? Right now, no joke is funny. No anecdote of last night's events is funny. I'm not laughing, I'm seething. The assignment was an insult in the first place. Look, somebody had to cover the carnival. But we were quite right in our prognostication. There was certainly nothing new under the sun, nor the moon, as it were. You got arrested, he offered. For the sake of grabbing the reader with a scandalous lead, what else was there to write about? So, read it to me. A Spanish girl from the back of the cell offered, She tried to do business with the wrong trick. At which the whole cell block guffawed and hooted. I demand to be released, Bernice fumed. And have you stepped in epoxy? Do something. Jimmy's on the phone with Kenny. I paid your bail. We'll get you out of here. Bernice took a moment to simmer down and then reported. In answer to your questions, I was carrying on spot interviews trying to get some good pictures, good quotes, good anything. I assume that Nancy and Rosie here, she looked toward two young ladies who could have been twins and they smiled at Marshall, wondered what I was doing, constantly circumnavigating the carnival grounds looking bewildered. They struck up a conversation that really got us nowhere news-wise but did get us all in trouble when Nancy propositioned an undercover cop, and we all got busted together. I think she'd be good at it, quipped Nancy as Rosie gave her a playful hit. Marshall asked, and you didn't show him your ID, your press card? He wouldn't give me a chance. I told him who I was. Well, did he hear you? Marshall asked the girls. Did he hear her? They only shrugged. But Bernice shifted her voice into high gear and cried, Is this voice loud enough for you? I employed it last night while they slapped the cuffs on me. Welcome to Ashton. I'll have his badge. It'll only turn your chest green. Hogan held up his hand to halt another outburst. Hey, listen, it isn't worth the trouble. 
there are different schools of thought. Bernie, I have some things I would love to print. Four columns wide, all about super cop and that do-nothing cretin of a chief. Where is he, anyway? Who? You mean Bramel? He has a very handy way of disappearing, you know. He knows who I am. Where is he? I don't know. I couldn't reach him this morning. And he turned his back last night. What are you talking about? Suddenly she clammed up. But Marshall read her face clear as a bell. Make sure you ask me later. Just then the big gate opened and in came Jimmy Dunlop. We'll discuss it later, said Marshall. All set, Jimmy? Jimmy was too intimidated by the yells, demands, hoots, and jeers coming from the cages to answer right away. But he did have the key to the cell in his hand, and that said enough. Step away from the door, please, he ordered. Hey, when's your voice gonna change? was characteristic of the answers he got. They did move away from the door. Jimmy opened it. Bernice stepped out quickly, and he slammed it shut again behind her. Okay, he said. You're free to leave on bail. You'll be notified of the date for your arraignment. Just return my purse, my press card, my notepad, and my camera, Bernice hissed, heading for the door. Kate Hogan, a slender, dignified redhead, had tried to make good use of her time while waiting upstairs in the courthouse lobby. There was much to observe here after the festival, although it certainly wasn't pleasant. Some woeful souls were escorted and or dragged in, struggling against their cuffs all the way and spouting obscenities. Many others were just now being released after spending the night behind bars. It almost looked like a change of shifts at some bizarre factory, the first shift leaving somewhat sheepishly, their scant belongings still in little paper bags, and the second shift coming in, all bound up and indignant. Most of the police officers were strangers from elsewhere, overtimers sent in to beef up the very small Ashton staff, and they weren't being paid to be kind or courteous. The heavily jowled lady at the main desk had two cigarettes smoldering in her ashtray, but little time to take a drag between processing papers on every case coming in or going out. From Kate's viewpoint, the whole operation looked very hurried and slipshod. There were a few cheap lawyers passing out their cards, but one night in jail seemed to be the extent of punishment any of these people would have to bear, and now they only wanted to get out of town in peace. Kate unconsciously shook her head. To think of poor Bernice being herded through this place like so much rabble. <laughs> she must be furious. She felt a strong but gentle arm around her and let herself sink into its embrace. Hmm, she said. Now there's a pleasant change. After what I had to look at downstairs, I need some healing up, Marshall told her. She put her arm around him and pulled him close. Is it like this every year? she asked. No, I hear it gets worse each time. Kate shook her head again, and Marshall added, But the clarion will have something to say about it. Ashton could use a change of direction. They should be able to see that by now. How is Bernice? She'll be one heck of an editorialist for a while. <laughs> She's okay. She'll live. Are you going to talk to somebody about this? Alf Bramell's not around. He's smart. But I'll catch him later today and see what I can do. And I wouldn't mind getting my twenty-five dollars back. Well, he must be busy. I'd hate to be the police chief on a day like this. Oh, he'll hate it even more if I can help it. Bernice's return from a night of incarceration was marked by an angry countenance and sharp staccato footsteps on the linoleum. She, too, was carrying a paper bag, angrily rummaging through it to make sure everything was there. Kate extended her arms to give Bernice a comforting hug. Bernice, how are you? Bramel's name will soon be mud, the mayor's name will be dung, and I won't be able to print what that cop's name will be. I'm indignant I could be constipated, and I desperately need a bath. 
Well, said Marshall, take it out on your typewriter, swat some flies. I need that festival story for Tuesday's edition. Bernice immediately fumbled through her pockets and retrieved a wad of crinkled toilet paper, giving it to Marshall with forcefulness. Your loyal reporter, always on the job, she said. What else was there to do in there besides watch the paint peel and wait in line for the toilet? I think you'll find the whole write-up very descriptive. And I threw in an on-the-spot interview with some jailed hookers for extra flavor. Who knows? Maybe it'll make this town wonder what it's coming to. Any pictures? Marshall asked. Bernice handed him a can of film. You should find something in there you can use. I've got some film still in the camera, but that's of personal interest to me. Marshall smiled. He was impressed. Take the day off on me. Things will look better tomorrow. Perhaps by then I will have regained my professional objectivity. You'll smell better. Marshall, said Kate. It's okay, said Bernice. He hands me that stuff all the time. By now she had recovered her purse, press card, and camera and threw the wadded paper bag spitefully into a trash can. So what's the car situation? Kate brought your car, Marshall explained. If you could take her home, that should work things out best for me. I've got to get things salvaged at the paper and then try to track down Bramel. Bernice's thoughts snapped into gear. Bramel, right. I've got to talk to you. She started pulling Marshall aside before he could say yea or nay, and he could only give Kate an apologetic glance before he and Bernice rounded a corner and stood out of sight near the restrooms. Bernice spoke in lowered tones. If you're going to accost Chief Bramel today, I want you to know what I know. Besides the obvious? That he's a crumb, a coward, and a cretin? Yes, besides that. It's pieces, disjointed observations, but maybe they'll make sense someday. You always said to have an eye for details. I think I saw your pastor and him together at the carnival last night. Pastor Young? Ashton United Christian Church, right? President of the local ministerial. Endorses religious tolerance and condemns cruelty to animals. Yeah, yeah, okay. But Bramel doesn't even go to your church, does he? No, he goes to that little dinky one. They were off behind the dart-throwing booth, in the semi-dark with three other people, some blonde woman, some short, pudgy old fellow, and a ghostly-looking black-haired shrew in sunglasses. Sunglasses at night? Marshall wasn't impressed yet. She continued as if she was trying to sell him something. I think I committed a cardinal sin against them. I snapped their picture, and from all appearances, they didn't want that. Bramel was quite unnerved and stuttered at me. Young asked me in firm tones to leave. This is a private meeting. The pudgy fellow turned away. The ghostly-looking woman just stared at me with her mouth open. Have you considered how this might all appear to you after a good bath and a decent night's sleep? Just let me finish, and then we'll find out, all right. Now, right after that little incident was when Nancy and Rosie latched on to me. I mean to say, I did not approach them. They approached me. And soon afterward, I was arrested, and my camera confiscated. She could see she wasn't getting through to him. He was looking around impatiently, shifting his weight back toward the lobby. All right, all right. One more thing, she said, trying to hold him in place. Bromel was there, Marshal. He saw the whole thing. What whole thing? My arrest. I was trying to explain who I was to the cop. I was trying to show him my press card. He only took my purse and camera away from me and handcuffed me. And I looked over toward the dart-throwing booth again, and I saw Bromel watching. He ducked out of sight right away, but I swear I saw him watching the whole thing. Marshal, I went over this all last night. I replayed it and replayed it, and I think... Well... I don't know what to think, but it has to mean something. 
To continue the scenario, Marshall ventured, the film has gone from your camera. Bernice checked. Oh, it's still in the camera, but that means nothing. Hogan sighed and thought the thing over. Okay, so shoot up the rest of the roll and try to get something we can use, right? Then develop it and we'll see. Can we go now? Have I ever made any impulsive, imprudent, over-assuming mistakes like this before? Sure you have. Oh, come on now. Extend me a little grace just this once. I'll try to close my eyes. Your wife's waiting. I know, I know. Marshall didn't quite know what to say to Kate when they rejoined her. Sorry about this, he muttered. Now then, Kate said, trying to pick up from where they left off. We were talking about vehicles. Bernice, I had to drive your car here so you could have it to get home. If you drop me off at our house... Yes, right, right, said Bernice. And Marshall, I have a lot of things to do this afternoon. Can you pick up Sandy after her psychology class? Marshall didn't say a word, but his face showed a resounding no. Kate took a set of keys from her purse and handed them to Bernice. Your car is right around the corner next to ours in the press space. Why don't you bring it around? Bernice took her cue and went out the door. Kate held Marshall with a loving arm and searched his face for a moment. Hey, come on, try it, just once. But cockfights are illegal in this state. If you ask me, she's just a chip off the old block. I don't know where I'll start, he said. Just being there to pick her up will mean something. Cash in on it. As they started for the door, Marshall looked around and let his gut senses feel things out. Can you figure this town, Kate? He said finally. It's like some kind of disease. Everybody's got the same weird disease around here. A sunny morning always helps make the previous night's problem seem less severe. That's what Hank Bush thought as he pushed open his front screen door and stepped out onto the small concrete stoop. He lived in a low-rent, one-bedroom house not far from the church, a little white box settled in one corner with beveled siding, small hedged yard, and mossy roof. It wasn't much, and often seemed far less, but it was all he could afford on his pastor's salary. Well, he wasn't complaining. He and Mary were comfortable and sheltered, and the morning was beautiful. This was their day to sleep in, and two quarts of milk waited at the base of the steps. He snatched them up, looking forward to a bowl of milk-sodden Wheaties, a bit of distraction from his trials and tribulations. He had known trouble before. His father had been a pastor while Hank was growing up and the two of them had lived through a great many glories and hassles, the kind that come with pioneering churches, pastoring, itinerating. Hank knew from the time he was young that this was the life he wanted for himself, the way he wanted to serve the Lord. For him, the church had always been a very exciting place to work, exciting helping his father out in the earlier years, exciting going through Bible school and seminary and then two years of pastoral internship, it was exciting now, too, but it resembled the exhilaration the Texans must have felt at the Alamo. Hank was just twenty-six and usually full of fire. But this pastorate, his very first, seemed a difficult place to get the fire spread around. Somebody had wetted down all the kindling, and he didn't know what to make of it yet. For some reason, he had been voted in as pastor, which meant somebody in the church wanted his kind of ministry. But then there were all the others, the ones who made it exciting. They made it exciting whenever he preached on repentance. They made it exciting whenever he confronted sin in the fellowship. They made it exciting whenever he brought up the cross of Christ and the message of salvation. At this point, it was more Hank's faith and assurance that he was where God wanted him than any other factor that kept him by his guns, standing steadfast while getting shot at. Ah, oh, well, Hank thought to himself, at least enjoy the morning. The Lord put it here just for you. 
Had he backed into the house again without turning, he would have spared himself an outrage and kept his lightened spirit. But he did turn to go back in and immediately confronted the huge black dripping letters spray-painted on the front of the house. You're dead meat, you... The last word was an obscenity. His eyes saw it, then did a slow pan from one side of the house to the other, taking it all in. It was one of those things that take time to register. All he could do was stand there for a moment, first wondering who could have done it, then wondering why, then wondering if it would ever come off. He looked closer and touched it with his finger. It had to have been done during the night. It was quite dry. Honey, came Mary's voice from inside, you're leaving the door open. Hmm, was all he said, having no better words. He didn't really want her to know. He went back inside, closing the door firmly, and joined young, beautiful, long-tressed Mary over a bowl of Wheaties and some hot buttered toast. Here was the sunny spot in a cloudy sky for Hank, this playful little wife with the melodic giggle. She was a doll, and she had real grit, too. Hank often regretted that she had to go through the struggles they were now having. After all, she could have married some stable, boring accountant or insurance salesman. But she was a terrific support for him, always there, always believing God for the best, and always believing in Hank, too. What's wrong? she asked immediately. Rats. You do what you can to hide it, you try to act normal, but she still picks it up, Hank thought. Mmm, he started to say. Still bothered about the board meeting? There's your out, Bush. Sure, a little. I didn't even hear you come home. Did the meeting last real late? No, Alf Rommel had to take off for some important meeting he wouldn't talk about, and the others just... You know, had their say and went home. Just left me to lick my wounds. I stuck around and prayed for a while. I, I think that worked. I felt okay after that. He brightened just a little. As a matter of fact, I really felt the Lord comforting me last night. I still think they picked a funny time to call a board meeting right during the festival, she said. And on Sunday night, he said through his flakes, I no sooner give the altar call than I get them calling a meeting. About the same thing? Oh, I think they're just using Lou as an excuse to make trouble. Well, what did you tell them? The same thing all over again. We did just what the Bible says. I went to Lou, then John, and I went to Lou, and we brought it before the rest of the church, and then we, well, we removed him from fellowship. Well, it did seem to be what the congregation decided. But why can't the board go along with it? They can't read. Don't the Ten Commandments have something in there about adultery? I know, I know. Hank set down his spoon so he could gesture better. And they were mad at me last night. They started giving me all this stuff about judging not, lest I be judged. Who did? Oh, the same old Alf Brumell camp. Alf, Sam Turner, Gordon Mayer, you know, the old guard. Well, don't just let them push you around. They won't change my mind anyway. Don't know what kind of job security that gives me. Now Mary was getting indignant. Well, what on earth is wrong with Alf Brumell? Has he got something against the Bible or the truth or what? If it weren't this, it would certainly be something else. Jesus loves him, Mary, Hank cautioned. It's just that he feels under heavy conviction. He's guilty, he's a sinner, he knows it. And guys like us will always bother guys like him. The last pastor preached the word and Alf didn't like it. Now I'm preaching the word and he still doesn't like it. He pulls a lot of weight in that church, so I guess he thinks he can dictate what comes across that pulpit. Well, he can't. Not in my case, anyway. So why doesn't he just go somewhere else? Hank pointed his finger dramatically. That, dear wife, is a good question. There seems to be a method in his madness, like it's his mission in life to destroy pastors. It's just the picture they keep painting of you. You're just not like that. 
Hmm. Yes, painting. Are you ready? Ready for what? Hank drew a breath, sighed it out, then looked at her. We had some visitors last night. They, uh, they painted a slogan on the front of the house. What? Our house? Well, our landlord's house. She got up. Where? She went out the front door, her fuzzy slippers scuffing on the front walk. Oh, no. Hank joined her, and they drank in the view together. It was still there, real as ever. Now that makes me mad, she declared. But now she was crying. What did we ever do to anybody? I think we were just talking about it, Hank suggested. Mary didn't catch what he said, but she had a theory of her own, the most obvious one. Maybe the festival. It always brings out the worst in everyone. Hank had his own theory, but said nothing. It had to be someone in the church, he thought. He'd been called a lot of things, a bigot, a heel-dragger, an overly moral troublemaker. He had even been accused of being a homosexual and of beating his wife. Some angry church member could have done this, perhaps a friend of Lou Stanley, the adulterer, perhaps Lou himself. He would probably never know, but that was all right. God knew. Chapter 3 Just a few miles east of town on Highway 27, a large black limousine raced through the countryside. In the plush back seat, a plump middle-aged man talked business with his secretary, a tall and slender woman with long jet-black hair and a pale complexion. He talked crisply and succinctly as she took fluid shorthand, laying out some big-scale business deal. Then something occurred to the man. That reminds me, he said, and the secretary looked up from her memo pad. The professor claimed she sent me a package some time ago, but I don't recall ever receiving it. What kind of package? A small book, a personal item. Why not make a note to yourself to check for it back at the ranch? The secretary opened her portfolio and appeared to make a note of it. Actually, she wrote nothing. It was Marshall's second visit to Courthouse Square in the same day. The first time was to get Bernice bailed out, and now it was to pay a visit to the very man Bernice wanted to string up, Alf Brimel, the chief of police. After the clarion finally got to press, Marshall was about to call Brumell, but Sarah, Brumell's secretary, called Marshall first and made an appointment for two o'clock that afternoon. That was a good move, Marshall thought. Brumell was calling for a truce before the tanks began to roll. He pulled his Buick into his reserved parking space in front of the new courthouse complex and paused beside his car to look up and down the street surveying the aftermath of the festival's final Sunday night death throes. Main Street was trying to be the same old Main Street again, but to Marshall's discerning eye, the whole town seemed to be walking with a limp, sort of tired, sore, and sluggish. The usual little gaggles of half-hurried pedestrians were doing a lot of pausing, looking, head-shaking, regretting. For generations, Ashton had taken pride in its grassroots warmth and dignity and had striven to be a good place for its children to grow up. But now there were inner turmoils, anxieties, fears, as if some kind of cancer was eating away at the town and invisibly destroying it. On the exterior, there were the store windows now replaced with unsightly plywood, the many parking meters broken off, the litter and broken glass up and down the street. But even as the store owners and businessmen swept up the debris, there seemed to be an unspoken sureness that the inner problems would remain, the troubles would continue. Crime was up, especially among the youth. Simple, common trust in one's neighbor was diminishing. Never had the town been so full of rumors, scandals, and malicious gossip. In the shadow of fear and suspicion, life here was gradually losing its joy and simplicity, and no one seemed to know why or how. Marshall headed into Courthouse Square. 
The square consisted of two buildings, tastefully garnished with willows and shrubs, facing a common parking lot. On one side was the classy two-story brick courthouse, which also housed the town's police department and that somewhat decadent basement cell block. One of the town's three squad cars was parked outside. On the other side was the two-story glass-fronted town hall, housing the mayor's office, the town council, and other decision-makers. Marshall headed for the courthouse. He went through the unimposing plain doorway marked police and found the small reception area empty. He could hear voices from down the hall and behind some of the closed doors, but Sarah, the secretary, seemed temporarily out of the room. No. Behind the receptionist for Mike atop counter, a huge file was slowly rocking back and forth, and grunts and groans were coming up from below. Marsha leaned over the counter to see a comical sight. Sarah, on her knees, dress or no dress, was in the middle of a blue streak struggle with a jammed file drawer that had entangled itself with her desk. Apparently, the score was file drawers three, Sarah's shin zero, and Sarah was a poor loser. So were her pantyhose. She let out an ill-timed curse just as her eye caught him standing there, and by then it was too late to rebuild her usual poised image. Oh, hi, Marshal. Wear your marine boots next time. They're better for kicking things in. At least they knew each other, and Sarah was glad for that. Marshal had been in this place often enough to become well acquainted with most of the staff. These, she said with the tone of an articulate tour guide, are the infamous file cabinets of Mr. Alf Brumel, chief of police. He just got some fancy new cabinets, so now I've inherited these. Why I have to have them in my office is beyond me, but upon his express orders, here they must stay. They're too ugly to go into his office. But khaki? It's him, you know. Oh, well, maybe a little decoupage would cheer them up. If they must move in here, the least they can do is smile. Just then the intercom buzzed. She pressed the button and answered. Yes, sir? Bramil's voice squawked out of the little box. Hey, my security alarm is flashing. <laughs> Sorry, that was me. I was trying to get one of your file drawers shut. Yeah, right. Well, try to rearrange things, will you? Uh, Marshal Hogan is here to see you. Oh, right. Send him in. She looked up at Marshal and only shook her head pathetically. Got an opening for a secretary, she muttered. Marshal smiled. She explained, he's got these files right next to the silent alarm button. Every time I open a drawer, the building's surrounded. With a goodbye wave, Marshal went to the nearest office door and let himself into Bramell's office. Alf Bramell stood and extended his hand, his face exploding in a wide, ivory smile. Hey, there's the man! Hey, Alf. They shook hands as Bramell ushered Marshall in and closed the door. Bramell was a man somewhere in his thirties, single, a one-time hotshot city cop with a big-buck lifestyle that belied his policeman's salary. He always came on like a likable guy, but Marshall never really trusted him. Come to think of it, he didn't like him that much, either. Too much teeth showing for no reason. Well, Grimmel grinned, have a seat, have a seat. He was talking again before either man's cushion could compress. Looks like we made a laughable mistake this weekend. Marshall recalled the sight of his reporter sharing a cell with prostitutes. Bernice didn't laugh the whole night, and I'm out twenty-five dollars. Well, said Bramell, reaching into his top desk drawer, that's why we're having this meeting, to clear this whole thing up. Here. He produced a check and handed it to Marshall. This is your refund on that bail money, and I want you to know that Bernice will be receiving an official signed apology from myself in this office. But Marshall, please tell me what happened. If I'd just been there, I could have put a stop to it. Bernie says you were there. I was? Where? I know I was in and out of the station all night, but no, she saw you there at the carnival. 
Grimmel forced a wider grin. Well, I don't know who it was she saw in actuality, but I wasn't at the carnival last night. I was busy here. Marshall had too much momentum by now to back off. She saw you right at the time she was being arrested. Bramell didn't seem to hear that statement. But go on, tell me what happened. I need to get to the bottom of this. Marshall halted his attack abruptly. He didn't know why. Maybe it was out of courtesy. Maybe it was out of intimidation. Whatever the reason, he began to rattle a story off in neat, almost news-copy form, much the way he heard it from Bernice. But he cautiously left out the implicating details she shared with him. As he talked, his eyes studied Bramell, Bramell's office, and any particular details in decor, layout, agenda. It was mostly reflex. Over the years, he had developed the knack of observing and gathering information without looking like he was doing it. Maybe it was because he didn't trust this man. But even if he did, once a reporter, always a reporter. He could see that Bramell's office belonged to a fastidious man, from the highly polished, orderly desk, right down to the pencils in the desk caddy, every point honed to perfect sharpness. Along one wall, where the ugly filing cabinets used to stand, stood a very attractive set of shelves and cabinets of oil-rubbed oak with glass door panels and brass hardware. "'Say, moving up in the world, huh, Alf?' Marshall quipped, looking toward the cabinets. "'Like them?' "'Love them. What are they?' "'A very attractive replacement for those old filing cabinets. It just goes to show what you can do if you save your pennies.' I hated having those file cabinets in here. I think an office should have a little class, right? Uh, yeah, sure. Boy, you have your own copier. Yes, and bookshelves, extra storage. And another phone? A phone? Uh, what's that wire coming out of the wall? Oh, uh, that's for the coffee maker. But um, uh, where were we, anyway? Yeah, yeah, what happened to Bernice? And Marshall continued his story. He was well practiced in reading upside down, and while he continued to talk, he scanned Bramell's desk calendar. Tuesday afternoons stuck out a little because they were consistently blank, even though they were not Bramell's day off. One Tuesday did have an appointment written down. Reverend Oliver Young at 2 p.m. Oh, he said conversationally. Going to pay my pastor a visit tomorrow? He could tell right away that he had overstepped his bounds. Bramell looked amazed and irritated at the same time. Bramell forced a toothy grin and said, Oh, yes, uh, Oliver Young is your pastor, isn't he? You two know each other? Well, not really. We have met on an occasional professional basis, I suppose. But don't you go to that other church, that little one? Yes, Ashton Community. But go on, let's hear the rest of what happened. Marshall was impressed at how easy this guy was to fluster, but he tried not to press his challenge any further. Not yet, anyway. Instead, he picked up his tail where he left off and brought it to a neat finish, including Bernice's outrage. He noticed that Bramell had found some important paperwork to look over, papers that covered up the desk calendar. Marshall asked, Say, just who was this turkey cop who wouldn't let Bernice identify herself? An outsider, not even on a force here. If Bernice can get us the name or badge number, I can see that he's confronted with his behavior. Uh, you see, we had to bring some auxiliaries down from Windsor to beef things up for the festival. As for our own men, they all know full well who Bernice Kruger is. Bramill said that last line with a slightly wolfish tone. So why isn't she sitting here hearing all this apologizing instead of me? Bramill leaned forward and looked rather serious. I thought it best to talk to you, Marshal, rather than cause her to parade through this office, already somewhat stigmatized. Uh, I suppose you know what that girl's been through. Okay, thought Marshal, I'll ask. I'm new in town, Alf. She hasn't told you? 
and you'd love to. It slipped out, and it stung. Bromel sank back in his chair just a little and studied Marshall's face. Marshall was just now thinking that he didn't regret what he said. I'm upset, in case you hadn't noticed. Bromel started a new paragraph. Marshall, I wanted to see you personally today because I wanted to heal this thing up. So let's hear what you have to say about Bernice. Bromel, you'd better choose your words carefully, Marshall thought. Well, Bromel stammered, suddenly put on the spot, I thought you might want to know about it in case you might find the information helpful in dealing with her. You see, it was several months before you took over the paper that she herself came to Ashton. Just a few weeks before that, her sister, who had been attending the college, <laughs> committed suicide. Bernice came to Ashton with a fierce vindictiveness, trying to solve the mystery surrounding her sister's death. But, well, we all knew it was just one of those things for which there will never be an answer. Marshall was silent for a significant amount of time. I didn't know that. Bermel's voice was quiet and mournful as he said, she was positive it had to be some kind of foul play. It was quite an aggressive investigation she had going. Well, she does have a reporter's nose. Oh, that she does. But, you see, Marshal, her arrest, it was a mistake. A humiliating one, quite frankly. I really didn't think she would want to see the inside of this building for some time to come. Do you understand now? But Marshall wasn't sure he did. He wasn't even sure he'd heard all of it. He suddenly felt very weak, and he couldn't figure out where his anger had gone so quickly. And what about his suspicions? He knew he didn't buy everything this guy was saying. Or did he? He knew Brumel had lied about not being at the carnival. Or had he? Or did I just hear him wrong? Or where were we anyway? Come on, Hogan, didn't you get enough sleep last night? Marshall? Marshall looked into Bromel's gazing gray eyes, and he felt a little numb, like he was dreaming. Marshall, Bromel said, I hope you understand. You do understand now, don't you? Marshall had to force himself to think, and he found it helped not to look Bromel in the eye for a moment. Uh, it was a stupid beginning, but it was the best he could do. Uh, hey, yeah, Alf, I think I see your point. You did the right thing, I suppose. But I do want to heal this whole thing up, particularly between you and me. Ah, uh, don't worry about it. It's no big deal. Even as Marshall said it, he was asking himself if he really had. Bromel's big teeth reappeared. I'm really glad to hear that, Marshall. But say, listen, you might give her a call at least. She was hurt in a pretty personal way, you know. I'll do that, Marshall. Then Bromel leaned forward with a strange smile on his face, his hands folded tightly on the desk and his gray eyes giving Marshall that same numbing, penetrating, strangely pacifying gaze. Marshall, let's talk about you and the rest of this town. You know, we're really glad to have you here to take over the Clarion. We knew your fresh approach to journalism would be good for the community. I can be straightforward in saying that the last editor was <coughs> rather injurious to the mood of this town, especially toward the end. Marshall felt himself going right along with this pitch, but he could sense something coming. Bromel continued, We need your kind of class, Marshall. You wield a great deal of power through the press, and we all know it. But it takes the right man to keep that power guided in the right direction for the common good. All of us in the offices of public service are here to serve the best interests of the community. 
of the human race when you get right down to it. But so are you, Marshall. You're here for the sake of the people, just like the rest of us. Brumel combed his hair with his fingers a bit, a nervous gesture, then asked, Well, do you get what I'm saying? No. Well, Brumel groped for a new opener. I guess it's like you said, you're new in town. Why don't I simply try the direct approach? Marshall shrugged a why not and let Brumel continue. It's a small town, first of all, and that means that one little problem, even between a handful of people, is going to be felt and worried about by almost everyone else. And you can't hide behind anonymity because there simply is no such thing. Now, the last editor didn't realize that and really caused some problems that affected the whole population. He was a pathological soapboxer. He destroyed the good faith of the people and their local government, their public servants, each other, and ultimately himself. That hurt. It was a wound in our side. And it's taken time for all of us to heal up from that. I'll uh, cap it off by telling you for your own information that that man finally had to leave this town in disgrace. He'd molested a 12-year-old girl. I tried to get that case settled as quietly as I could, but in this town it was really awkward, difficult. I did what I felt would cause the least amount of trouble and pain for the girl's family and the people at large. I didn't press for any legal proceedings against this man, provided he leave Ashton and never show his face around here again. He was agreeable to that. But I'll never forget the impact it made. And I doubt that the town has ever forgotten it. Which brings us to you, and we, the public servants, and also the citizens of this community. One of the greatest reasons I regret this mix-up with Bernice is that I really desired a good relationship between this office and the clarion. Between myself and you personally, I'd hate to see anything ruin that. We need unity around here, comradeship, a, a good community spirit. He paused for effect. Marshal, we'd like to know that you'll be standing with us in working toward that goal. Then came the pause and the long expectant gaze. Marshal was on. He shifted around a little in his chair, sorting his thoughts, probing his feelings, almost avoiding those gazing gray eyes. Maybe this guy was on the up and up. Or maybe this whole little speech was some sly diplomatic ploy to shy him away from whatever Bernice may have stumbled upon. But Marshall couldn't think straight, or even feel straight. His reporter had been arrested falsely and thrown into a sleazy jail for the night, and he didn't seem to care anymore. This toothy-smiled police chief was making a liar out of her, and Marshall was buying it. Come on, Hogan, remember why you came down here? But he just felt so tired. He kept recalling why he had moved to Ashton in the first place. It was supposed to be a change of lifestyle for him and his family— a time to quit fighting and scratching the big city intrigues and just get down to the simpler stories. Things like high school paper drives and cats up trees. Maybe it was just force of habit from all those years at the Times that made him think he had to take on Brumel like some kind of inquisitor. For what? More hassles? For crying out loud, how about a little peace and quiet for a change? Suddenly, and contrary to his better instincts, he knew that there was nothing at all to worry about. Bernice's film would be just fine, and the pictures would prove that Brumel was right and Bernice was wrong. And Marshall really wanted it to be that way. But Brumel was still waiting for an answer, still giving him that numbing gaze. I... Marshall began, and now he felt stupidly awkward in trying to get started. I, Listen, I really am tired of fighting, Alf. Maybe I was raised that way. Maybe that's what made me good at my job with the Times, but 
I did decide to move here, and that's got to say something. I'm tired, Alf, not any younger. I need to heal up. I need to learn what being human and living in a town with other humans is really like. Yes, said Bramel. That's it. That's exactly it. So, don't worry. I'm here after some peace and quiet, just like everybody else. I don't want any fights. I don't want any trouble. You've got nothing to fear from me. Bramel was ecstatic and shot out his hand to shake on it. As Marshall took the hand and they shook, he almost felt he had sold part of his soul. Did Marshall Hogan really say all that? I must be tired, he thought. Before he knew it, he was standing outside Bramel's door. Apparently, their meeting was over. After Marshall was gone and the door was safely closed, Alf Bramel sank into his chair with a relieved sigh and just sat there for a while, staring into space, recuperating, building up the nerve for his next difficult assignment. Marshall Hogan was just the warm-up as far as he was concerned. The real test was coming up. He reached for his telephone, pulled it a little closer, stared at it for a moment, and then dialed the number. Hank was touching up his paint job on the front of the house when the phone rang, and Mary called, Hank, it's Alf Brumell. Wow, Hank thought. And here I am with a loaded paintbrush in my hand. I wish he was standing here. He confessed his sin to the Lord on his way in to answer the phone. Hi there, he said. In his office, Bramell turned his back to the door to make it a private conversation, even though he was alone, and spoke in a lowered voice. Hi, Hank. This is Alf. I thought I should call you this morning and see how you are since last night. Oh, said Hank, feeling like a mouse in a cat's mouth. I'm okay, I guess. Better, maybe. So, you've given it some thought? Oh, sure, I've thought about it a lot. I've prayed about it, rechecked the word regarding some questions. Hmm, sounds like you haven't changed your mind. Well, if the word of God would change, then I'd change, but I guess the Lord won't back down from what he says, and you know where that leaves me. Hank, you know the congregational meeting is this Friday. I know that. Hank, I'd really like to help you. I don't want to see you destroy yourself. You've been good for the church, I think, but what can I say? The division, the bickering, it's all about to tear that church apart. Who's bickering? Oh, come on. And for that matter, who called that congregational meeting in the first place? You, Sam, Gordon... I have no doubt that Lou is still at work out there, as well as whoever it was that painted on the front of my house. We're just concerned, that's all. You're, well, you're fighting against what's best for the church. That's funny, I thought I was fighting against you. But did you hear me? I said someone painted on the front of my house. What? Painted what? Hank let him have it all. Bramell let out a groan. Oh, Hank, that's sick. And so is Mary, and so am I. Put yourself in our position. Hank, if I were in your position, I'd reconsider. Can't you see what's happening? Word's getting around now, and you're setting the whole town against you. That also means the whole town's going to be set against our church before long. We have to survive in this town, Hank. We're here to help people, to reach out to them, not drive a wedge between ourselves and the community. I preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, and there are plenty who appreciate it. Just where is this wedge you're talking about? Bramel was getting impatient. Hank, learn from the last pastor. He made the same mistake. Look what happened to him. I did learn from him. I learned that all I have to do is give up, bag it, bury the truth in a drawer somewhere so it won't offend anybody. 
Then I'll be fine. Everybody will like me, and we'll all be one happy family again. Apparently, Jesus was misguided. He could have kept a lot of friends by wilting and just playing politics. But you want to be crucified. I want to save souls. I want to convict sinners. I want to help newborn believers grow up in the truth. If I don't do that, I'll have a lot more to fear than you and the rest of the board. I don't call that love, Hank. I love you all, Alf. That's why I give you your medicine, and that goes especially for Lou. Bromel pulled a big gun. Hank, have you considered that he could sue you? There was a pause at the other end. Finally, Hank answered, No. He could sue you for damages, slander, defamation of character, mental anguish, who knows what else. Hank drew a deep breath and called on the Lord for patience and wisdom. You see the problem, he said finally. Too many people don't know or don't want to know what the truth is anymore. We don't stand for something, so we fall for anything. And now guys like Lou get themselves into a fog where they can hurt their own family, start their own gossip, ruin their own reputations, make themselves miserable in their sin, and then look for someone else to blame. Just who's doing what to whom? Bromel only sighed. We'll talk it all out Friday night. You will be there. Yes, I will. I'll be counseling somebody, and then I'll go in for the meeting. <laughs> Ever done any counseling? No. It gives you a real respect for the truth when you have to help clean up lives that have been based on a lie. Think about it. Hank, I have other people's wishes to think about. Bromel hung up loudly and wiped the sweat from his palms. Chapter 4 Could anyone have seen him, the initial impression would not have been so much his reptilian warted appearance as the way his figure seemed to absorb light and not return it. As if he were more a shadow than an object, a strange animated hole in space. But this little spirit was invisible to the eyes of men, unseen and immaterial, drifting over the town, banking one way and then the other, guided by will and not wind, his swirling wings quivering in a grayish blur as they propelled him. He was like a high-strung little gargoyle, his hide a slimy bottomless black, his body thin and spider-like, half humanoid, half animal, totally demon. Two huge yellow cat eyes bulged out of his face, darting to and fro, peering, searching. His breath came in short, sulfurous gasps, visible as glowing yellow vapor. He was carefully watching and following his charge, the driver of a brown Buick moving through the streets of Ashton far below. Marshall got out of the clarion office just a little early that day. After all the morning's confusion, it was a surprise to find Tuesday's clarion already off to the printer and the staff gearing up for Friday. A small-town paper was just about the right pace. Perhaps he could get to know his daughter again. Sandy. Yes, sir, a beautiful redhead, their only child. She had nothing but potential but had spent most of her childhood with an overtime mother and a hardly-there father. Marshall was successful in New York, all right, at just about everything except being the kind of father Sandy needed. She had always let him know about it, too. But, as Kate said, the two of them were too much alike. Her cries for love and attention always came out like stabs, and Marshall gave her attention all right, like dogs give to cats. No more fights, he kept telling himself. No more picking and scratching and hurting. Let her talk. Let her spill how she feels and don't be harsh with her. Love her for who she is. Let her be herself. Don't try to corral her. It was crazy how his love for her kept coming out like spite, with anger and cutting words. 
He knew he was only reaching for her, trying to bring her back. It just never worked. Oh, well, Hogan, try, try again, and don't blow it this time. He made a left turn and could see the college ahead. The Whitmore College campus looked like most American campuses, beautiful with stately old buildings that made you feel learned just to look at them, wide, neatly lawned plazas with walkways in carefully laid patterns of brick and stone, landscaping with rocks, greenery, statuary. It was everything a good college should be right down to the 15-minute parking spaces. Marshall parked the Buick and set out in search of Stewart Hall, home of the psychology department and Sandy's last class for the day. Whitmore was a privately endowed college founded by some landholder as a memorial to himself back in the early 20s. From old photos of the place, one could discover that some of the red brick and white pillared lecture halls were as old as the college itself monuments of the past and supposedly guardians of the future. The summertime campus was relatively quiet. Marshall got directions from a frisbee-throwing sophomore and turned left down an elm-lined street. At the end of the street, he found Stuart Hall, an imposing structure patterned after some European cathedral with towers and archways. He pulled open one of the big double doors and found himself in a spacious, echoing hallway. The close of the big door made such a reverberating thunder off the vaulted ceiling and smooth walls that Marshall thought he had disturbed every class on the floor. But now he was lost. This place had three floors and some thirty classrooms, and he had no idea which one was Sandy's. He started walking down the hall, trying to keep his heels from tapping too loudly. You couldn't even get away with a burp in this place. Sandy was a freshman this year. Their move to Ashton had been just a little late, so she was enrolled in summer classes to catch up. But all in all, it had been the right point of transition for her. She was an undeclared major for now, feeling her way and taking prerequisites. Where a class in psychology of self fit into all that, Marshall couldn't guess. But he and Kate weren't out to rush her. From somewhere down the cavernous hall echoed the indistinguishable but well-ordered words of a lecture in progress, a woman's voice. He decided to check it out. He moved past several classroom doors, their little black numbers steadily decreasing, then a drinking fountain, the restrooms, and a ponderously ascending stone and iron staircase. Finally, he began to make out the words of the lecture as he drew near room 101. So, if we settle for a simple ontological formula, I think, therefore I am, that should be the end of the question. But being does not presuppose meaning. Yeah, here was more of that college stuff, that funny conglomeration of $64 words which impress people with your academic prowess but can't get you a paying job. Marshall smirked to himself a little bit. Psychology. If all those shrinks could just agree for a change, it would help. First, Sandy blamed her snotty attitude on a violent birth experience, and then what was it? Poor potty training? Her new thing was self-knowledge, self-esteem, identity. She already knew how to be hung up on herself. Now they were teaching it to her in college. He peeked in the door and saw a theater arrangement with rows of seats built in steadily rising levels toward the back of the room, and a small platform in front with the professor lecturing against a massive blackboard backdrop. And meaning doesn't necessarily come from thinking, for some have said that the self is not the mind at all, and that the mind actually denies the self and inhibits self-knowledge. Whoosh! For some reason, Marshall had expected an older woman, skinny, her hair in a bun, wearing horn-rimmed glasses with a little beady chain looped around her neck. But this one was a startling surprise, something right out of a lipstick or fashion commercial. Long blonde hair, trim figure, deep dark eyes that twitched a bit but certainly needed no glasses, horn-rimmed or otherwise. 
Then Marshall caught the glint of deep red hair, and he saw Sandy sitting toward the front of the hall, listening intently and feverishly scrawling notes. Bingo! That was easy. He decided to slip in quietly and listen to the tail end of the lecture. It might give him some idea of what Sandy was learning, and then they'd have something to talk about. He stepped silently through the door and took one of the empty seats in the back. Then it happened. Some kind of radar in the professor's head must have clicked on. She homed in on Marshall sitting there and simply would not look away from him. He had no desire to draw any attention to himself. He was rapidly getting too much of that anyway from the class. So he said nothing. He was rapidly getting too much of that anyway from the class. So he said nothing. But the professor seemed to examine him, searching his face as if it were familiar to her, as if she were trying to remember someone she had known before. The look that suddenly crossed her face gave Marshall a chill. She gave him a knife-like gaze like the eyes of a treed cougar. He began to feel a corresponding defense instinct twisting a knot in his stomach. Is there something you want? the professor demanded, and all Marshall could see were her two piercing eyes. I'm just waiting for my daughter, he answered, and his tone was courteous. Would you like to wait outside? she said, and it wasn't a question. And he was out in the hall. He leaned against the wall, staring at the linoleum, his mind spinning, his senses scrambled, his heart pounding. He had no understanding of why he was there, but he was out in the hall, just like that. How? What happened? <laughs> Come on, Hogan, stop shaking and think. He tried to replay it in his mind, but it came back slowly, stubbornly, like recalling a bad dream. That woman's eyes. The way they looked told him she somehow knew who he was, even though they had never met. And he had never seen or felt such hate. But it wasn't just the eyes, it was also the fear, the steadily rising, face-draining, heart-pounding fear that had crept into him for no reason, with no visible cause. He had been scared half to death. By nothing. It made no sense at all. He had never run or backed down from anything in his life, but now, for the first time in his life, for the first time, the image of Alf Brumel's gazing gray eyes flashed across his mind, and the weakness returned. He blinked the image away and took a deep breath. Where was the old Hogan gut strength? Had he left it back in Brumel's office? But he had no conclusions, no theories, no explanations, only derision for himself. He muttered, So I gave in again like a rotted tree. And like a rotted tree, he leaned against the wall and waited. In a few minutes, the door to the lecture hall burst open and students began to fan outward like bees from a hive. They ignored him so thoroughly that Marshall felt invisible but that was fine with him for now. Then came Sandy. He straightened up, walked toward her, started to say hello, and she walked right by. She didn't pause, smile, return his greeting, anything. He stood there dumbly for a moment, watching her walk down the hall toward the exit. Then he followed. He wasn't limping, but for some reason he felt like he was. He wasn't really dragging his feet, but they felt like lead weights. He saw his daughter go out the door without looking back. The clunk of the big doors closing echoed through the huge hall with a ponderous, condemning finality, like the crash of a huge gate dividing him forever from the one he loved. He stopped there in the broad hall, numb, helpless, even tottering a little, his big frame looking very small. Unseen by Marshall, small wisps of sulfurous breath crept along the floor like slow water, along with an unheard scraping and scratching over the tiles. Like a slimy black leech, the little demon clung to him, 
its taloned fingers entwining Marshall's legs like parasitic tendrils, holding him back, poisoning his spirit. The yellow eyes bulged out of the gnarled face, watching him, boring into him. Marshall was feeling a deep and growing pain, and the little spirit knew it. This man was getting hard to hold down. As Marshall stood there in the big empty hall, the hurt, the love, the desperation began to build inside him. He could feel the tiniest remaining ember of fight still burning. He started for the door. Move, Hogan, move! That's your daughter! With each determined step, the demon was dragged along the floor behind him, its hands still clinging to him, a deeper rage and fury rising in its eyes and the sulfurous vapors chugging out of its nostrils. The wings spread in search of an anchor, any way to hold Marshall back, but they found none. Sandy, Marshall thought, give your old man a break. By the time he reached the end of the hall, he was nearly into a run. His big hands hit the crash bar and the door, and the door flung open, slamming into the doorstop on the outside steps. He ran down the stairs and out onto the pedestrian walkway shaded by the elms. He looked up the street, across the lawn in front of Stuart Hall, down the other way. But she was gone. The demon gripped him tighter and began to climb and slither upward. Marshall felt the first pangs of despair as he stood there alone. I'm over here, Daddy. Immediately, the demon lost its grip and fell free, snorting with indignation. Marshall spun around and saw Sandy, standing just beside the door he had just burst through, apparently trying to hide from her classmates among the camellia bushes and looking very much like she was about to take him to task. Well, anything was better than losing her, Marshall thought. Well, he said before he considered, pardon me, but I get the distinct impression you disowned me in there. Sandy tried to stand straight to face him in her hurt and anger, but she still could not look him squarely in the eye. It was... it was just too painful. What was? You know, that whole thing in there. Well, I like coming on with a real splash, you know. Something people will remember. Daddy. So who stole all the no parents allowed signs? How was I to know she didn't want me in there? And just what's so all fired precious and secret that she doesn't want any outsiders to hear it? Now Sandy's anger rose above her hurt, and she could look at him squarely. Nothing. Nothing at all. It was just a lecture. So just what is her problem? Sandy groped for an explanation. I don't know. I guess she must know who you are. No way. I've never even seen her before. And then a question automatically popped into Marshall's mind. What do you mean she must know who I am? Sandy looked cornered. I mean... Oh, come on. Maybe she knows you're the editor of the paper. Maybe she doesn't want reporters snooping around. Well, I hope I can tell you I wasn't snooping. I was just looking for you. Sandy wanted to end the discussion. All right, Daddy, all right. She just read you wrong, okay? I don't know what her problem was. She has the right to choose her audience, I suppose. And I don't have the right to know what my daughter's learning? Sandy stopped a word halfway up her throat and inferred a few things first. You were snooping. Even as it happened, Marshall knew good and well that they were at it again. The old cats and dogs fighting roosters routine. It was crazy. Part of him didn't want it to happen, but the rest of him was too frustrated and angry to stop. As for the demon... It only cowered nearby, shying from Marshall as if he were red-hot. The demon watched, waited, fretted. In a pig's eye I was snooping, Marshall roared. I'm here because I'm your loving father, and I wanted to pick you up after classes. Stuart Hall, that's all I knew. I just happened to find you, and... He tried to break himself. He deflated a little, covered his eyes with his hand, and sighed. And you thought you'd keep an eye on me, Sandy suggested spitefully. Got some law against that? Okay, I'll lay it all out for you. 
I'm a human being, Daddy, and every human entity, I don't care who he or she is, is ultimately subject to a universal scheme and not to the will of any specific individual. As for Professor Langstrand, if she doesn't want you present at her lecture, it's her prerogative to demand that you leave. And just who's paying her salary, anyway? She ignored the question. And as for me, and what I'm learning, and what I'm becoming, and where I'm going, and what I wish, I say you have no right to infringe on my universe unless I personally grant you that right. Marshall's eyesight was getting blurred by visions of Sandy turned over his knee. Enraged, he had to lash out at somebody, but now he was trying to steer his attacks away from Sandy. He pointed back toward Stuart Hall and demanded, Did, did she teach you that? You don't need to know. I have a right to know. You waived that right, Daddy, years ago. That punch sent him into the ropes and he couldn't fully recover before she took off down the street, escaping him, escaping their miserable, bullish battle. He hollered after her some stupid-sounding question about how she'd get home, but she didn't even slow down. The demon grabbed its chance, and Marshall, and he felt his anger and self-righteousness give way to sinking despair. He'd blown it. The very thing he never wanted to do again, he did, why in the world was he wired up this way? Why couldn't he just reach her, love her, win her back? She was disappearing from sight even now, becoming smaller and smaller as she hurried across the campus. And she seemed so very far away, farther than any loving arm could ever reach. He had always tried to be strong, to stand tough through life and through struggles, but right now the hurt was so bad he couldn't keep that strength from crumbling away from him in pitiful pieces. As he watched, Sandy disappeared around a distant corner without looking back, and something broke inside him. His soul felt like it would melt, and at this moment there was no person on the face of the earth he hated more than himself. The strength of his legs seemed to surrender under the load of his sorrow, and he sank to the steps in front of the old building, despondent. The demon's talons surrounded his heart, and he muttered in a quivering voice, What's the use? Ha! came a thundering cry from the nearby shrubs. A bluish-white light glimmered. The demon released its grip on Marshall and bolted like a terrified fly landing some distance away in a trembling defensive stance, its huge yellow eyes nearly popping out of its head and a soot-black barbed scimitar ready in its quivering hand. But then there came an unexplainable commotion behind those same bushes, some kind of struggle, and the source of the light disappeared around the corner of Stuart Hall. The demon did not stir, but waited, listened, watched. No sound could be heard except the light breeze. The demon stalked ever so cautiously back to where Marshall still sat, went past him and peered through the shrubbery and around the corner of the building. Nothing. As if held for this entire time, a long, slow breath of yellow vapor curled in lacy wisps from the demon's nostrils. Yes, it knew what it had seen. There was no mistaking it. But why had they fled? Chapter 5 A short distance across the campus, but enough distance to be safe, two giant men descended to earth like glimmering bluish-white comets, held aloft by rushing wings that swirled in a blur and burned like lightning. One of them, a huge, burly, black-bearded bull of a man, was quite angry and indignant, bellowing and making fierce gestures with a long, gleaming sword. The other was a little smaller and kept looking about with great caution, trying to get his associate to calm down. In a graceful, fiery spiral, they drifted down behind one of the college dormitories and came to rest in the cover of some overhanging willows. The moment their feet touched down, the light from their clothes and bodies began to fade, and the shimmering wings gently subsided. Save for their towering stature, they appeared as two ordinary men, one trim and blonde, the other built like a tank, 
both dressed in what looked like matching tan fatigues. Golden belts had become like dark leather, their scabbards were dull copper, and the glowing bronze bindings on their feet had become simple leather sandals. The big fellow was ready for a discussion. Triscoll, he growled. But at his friend's desperate gestures, he spoke just a little softer. What are you doing here? Triscoll kept his hands up to keep his friend quiet. Shh, Lilo. The spirit brought me here, the same as you. I arrived yesterday. You know what that was? A demon of complacency and despair, if ever I saw one. If your arm hadn't held me, I would have struck him, and only once. Oh, yes, Gylo, only once, his friend agreed. But it's a good thing I saw you and stopped you in time. You've just arrived, and you don't understand. What don't I understand? Triscoll tried to say it in a convincing manner. We must not fight, Gylo. Not yet. We must not resist. Gylo was sure his friend was mistaken. He took firm hold of Triscoll's shoulder and looked him right in the eye. Why should I go anywhere but to fight, he stated. Here I was called. Here I will fight. Yes, said Triscoll, nodding furiously. Just not yet, that's all. Then you must have orders. You do have orders. Triscoll paused for effect, then said, Tal's orders. Gylo's angry expression at once melted into a mixture of shock and perplexity. Dusk was settling over Ashton, and the little white church on Morgan Hill was washed with the warm, rusty glow of the evening sun. Outside in the small churchyard, the church's young pastor hurriedly mowed the lawn, hoping to be finished before mealtime. Dogs were barking in the neighborhood, people were arriving back home from work, Kids were being called in for supper. Unseen by these mortals, Gylo and Triscoll came hurriedly up the hill on foot, secretive and unglorified, but moving like the wind nevertheless. As they arrived in front of the church, Hank Bush came around the corner behind the roaring lawnmower, and Gylo had to pause to look him over. Is he the one? he asked Triscoll. Did the call begin with him? Yes, Triscoll answered, months ago. He's praying even now, and often walks the streets of Ashton interceding for it. But this place is so small. Why was I called? No, no, why was Tal called? Triscoll only pulled at his arm. Hurry inside. They passed quickly through the walls of the church and into the humble little sanctuary. Inside they found a contingent of warriors already gathered, some sitting in the pews, others standing around the platform, still others acting as sentries, looking cautiously out the stained-glass windows. They were all dressed, much as Triscoll and Gylo, in the same tan tunics and breeches, but Gylo was immediately impressed by the imposing stature of them all. These were the mighty warriors, the powerful warriors, and more than he had ever seen gathered in one place. He was also struck by the mood of the gathering. This moment could have been a joyful reunion of old friends, except that everyone was strangely somber. As he looked around the room, he recognized many whom he had fought alongside in times far past. Nathan, the towering Arabian who fought fiercely and spoke little, it was he who had taken demons by their ankles and used them as war clubs against their fellows. Armoth, the big African whose war cry and fierce countenance had often been enough to send the enemy fleeing before he even assailed them. Gylo and Armoth had once battled the demon lords of villages in Brazil and personally guarded a family of missionaries on their many long treks through the jungles. Shimon, the meek European with the golden hair, who bore on his forearms the marks of a fading demon's last blows before Shimon banished him forever into the abyss. Gylo had never met this one, but had heard of his exploits and his ability to take blows simply as a shield for others, and then to rally himself to defeat untold numbers alone. Then came the greeting of the oldest and most cherished friend. Welcome, Gylo, the strength of many. 
Yes, it was indeed Tal, the captain of the host. It was so strange to see this mighty warrior standing in this humble little place. Gilo had seen him near the throne room of heaven itself in conference with none other than Michael. But here stood the same impressive figure with golden hair and ruddy complexion, intense golden eyes like fire and an unchallengeable air of authority. Gilo approached his captain and the two of them clasped hands. And we're together again, said Gilo, as a thousand memories flooded his mind. No warrior Gilo had ever seen could fight as Tal could. No demon could outmaneuver or outspeed him. No sword could parry a blow from the sword of Tal. Side by side, Gilo and his captain had vanquished demonic powers for as long as those rebels had existed, and had been companions in the Lord's service before there had been any rebellion at all. Greetings, my dear captain, Tal said by way of explanation. It's a serious business that brings us together again. Gilo searched Tal's face. Yes, there was plenty of confidence there and no timidity, but there was definitely a strange grimness in the eyes and mouth, and Gilo looked around the room once again. Now he could feel it, that typically silent and ominous prelude to the breaking of grim news. Yes, they all knew something he didn't, but were waiting for the appointed person, most likely Tal, to speak it. Gilo couldn't stand the silence, much less the suspense. Twenty-three, he counted, of the very best, the most gallant, the most undefeatable, gathered now as though under siege, cowering in a flimsy fortress from a dreaded enemy. With a dramatic flare, he drew his huge sword and cradled the blade in his free hand. Captain Tal, who is this enemy? Tal answered slowly and clearly, Rephar, the Prince of Babylon. All eyes were now on Gilo's face, and his reaction was much like that of every other warrior upon hearing the news. Shock, disbelief, an awkward pause to see if anyone would laugh and verify that it was only a mistake. There was no such reprieve from the truth. Everyone in the room continued to look at Gilo with the same deadly serious expression, driving the gravity of the situation home mercilessly. Gilo looked down at his sword. Was it now shaking in his hands? He made a point of holding it still, but he couldn't help staring for a moment at the blade, still gashed and discolored from the last time Gilo and Tal had confronted this Baal prince from the ancient times. Gilo and Tal had struggled against him twenty-three days before finally defeating him on the eve of Babylon's fall. Gilo could still remember the darkness, the shrieking and horror, the fierce, terrible grappling while pain seared every inch of his being. The evil of this would-be pagan god seemed to envelop him and everything around him like thick smoke. And half the time the two warriors had to maneuver and strike blindly, each one not even knowing if the other was still in the fight. To this day neither of them even knew which one finally delivered the blow that sent Rafar plummeting into the abyss. All they remembered was his heaven-shaking scream as he fell through a jagged rift in space, and then seeing each other again when the great darkness that surrounded them cleared like a melting fog. I know you speak the truth, Gilo said at last. But would such as Rafar come to this place? He is a prince of nations, not mere hamlets. What is this place? What interest could he possibly have in it? Tal only shook his head. We don't know. But it is Rafar, there's no question. And the stirrings in the enemy's realm indicate something is in the making. The spirit wants us here. We must confront whatever it is. And we are not to fight. We are not to resist, Gilo exclaimed. I will be most fascinated to hear your next order, Tal. We cannot fight? Not yet. We're too few, and there's very little prayer cover. There are to be no skirmishes, no confrontations. 
We're not to show ourselves in any way as aggressors. As long as we stay out of their way, keep close to this place, and pose no threat to them, our presence here will seem like normal watch care over a few struggling saints. Then he added with a very direct tone, And it will be best if it not be spread that I am here. Gilo now felt a little out of place, still holding his sword, and sheathed it with an air of disgust. And, he prodded, you do have a plan. We were not called here to watch the town fall. The lawnmower roared by the windows, and Tal guided their attention to its operator. It was Shimon's task to bring him here, he said to blind the eyes of his enemies and slip him through ahead of the adversary's choice for the pastor of this flock. Shimon succeeded. Hank was voted in to the surprise of many, and now he's here in Ashton, praying every hour of every day. We were called here for his sake, for the saints of God and for the Lamb. For the saints of God and for the Lamb, they all echoed. Tal looked at a tall, dark-haired warrior, the one who had taken him through the town the night of the festival, and smiled. And you had him win by just one vote? The warrior shrugged. The Lord wanted him here. Shimon and I had to make sure he won, and not the other man who has no fear of God. Tal introduced Gilo to this warrior. Gilo, this is Creone. Watch-carer of our prayer warrior here and of the town of Ashton. Our call began with Hank, but Hank's presence here began with Creone. Gilo and Creone nodded silent greeting to each other. Tal watched Hank finishing up the lawn and praying out loud at the same time. So now... As his enemies in the congregation regroup and try to find another way to oust him, he continues to pray for Ashton. He's one of the last. If not the last, lamented Creone. No, cautioned Tal, he's not alone. There's still a remnant of saints somewhere in this town. There is always a remnant. There is always a remnant, they all echoed. Our conflict begins in this place. We'll make this our location for now, hedge it in and work from here. He spoke to a tall oriental in the back of the room. Signa, take as your charge this building, and choose two now to stand with you. This is our rest point. Make it secure. No demon is to approach it. Signa immediately found two volunteers to work with him. They vanished to their posts. Now, Triscoll, I'll hear news of Marshal Hogan. I followed him up to my encounter with Gilo. Though Creone has reported a rather eventless situation up to the time of the festival, ever since then Hogan has been hounded by a demon of complacency and despair. Tal received the news with great interest. Hmm, could be he's beginning to stir. They're covering him, trying to hold him in check. Creone added, I never thought I'd see it happen. The Lord wanted him in charge of the clarion, and we took care of that, too. But I've never seen a more tired individual. Tired, yes, but that will only make him more usable in the Lord's hands. And I perceive that he is indeed waking up, just as the Lord foreknew. Though he could awaken only to be destroyed, said Triscoll, they must be watching him. They fear what he could do in his influential position. True, replied Tal. So while they bait our bear, we must be sure they stir him up, and no more than that. It's going to be a very critical business. Now Tal was ready to move. He addressed the whole group. I expect Rafar to take power here by nightfall. No doubt we'll all feel it when he does. 
Be sure of this. He will immediately search out the greatest threat to him and try to remove it. Ah, oh, Henry Bush, said Gilo. Creone and Triscoll, you can be sure that a troop of some kind will be sent to test Hank's spirit. Select for yourselves four warriors and watch over him. Tal touched Creone's shoulder and added, Creone, up until now you've done very well in protecting Hank from any direct onslaughts. I commend you. Thank you, Captain. I ask you now to do a difficult thing. Tonight you must stand by and keep watch. Do not let Hank's life be touched. But aside from that, prevent nothing. It will be a test he must undergo. There was a slight moment of surprise and wonderment, but each warrior was ready to trust Tal's judgment. Tal continued, As for Marshal Hogan, he's the only one I'm not sure about yet. Rayfar will give his lackeys incredible license with him, and he could either collapse and retreat, or, as we all hope, rouse himself and fight back. He'll be of special interest to Rayfar, and to me, tonight. Gilo, select two warriors for yourself and two for me. We'll watch care over Marshal tonight and see how he responds. The rest of you will search out the remnant. Tal drew his sword and held it high. The others did the same, and a forest of shining blades appeared, held aloft in strong arms. Rayfar, Tal said in a low, musing voice, we meet again. Then in the voice of a captain of the host, for the saints of God and for the Lamb, for the saints of God and for the Lamb, they echoed. Complacency unfurled his wings and drifted into Stuart Hall, sinking down through the main floor and into the catacombs of the basement level, the area set aside for administration and the private offices of the psychology department. In this dismal nether world, the ceiling was low and oppressive, and crawling with water pipes and heat ducts that seemed like so many huge snakes waiting to drop. Everything... Walls, ceiling, pipes, woodwork, was painted the same dirty beige, and light was scarce, which suited Complacency and his associates just fine. They preferred the darkness, and Complacency noticed that there seemed to be a touch more than usual. The others must have arrived. He floated down a long burrow of a hallway to a large door at the end marked Conference Room and passed through the door into a cauldron of living evil. The room was dark, but the darkness seemed more of a presence than a physical condition. It was a force, an atmosphere that drifted and crept about the room. Out of that darkness glared many pairs of dull yellow cat eyes, belonging to a horrible gallery of grotesque faces. The various shapes of Complacency's fellow workers were outlined and backlit by a sourceless red glow. Yellow vapor slithered in lacy wisps about the room and filled the air with its stench as the many apparitions carried on their hushed, gargling conversations there in the dark. Complacency could sense their common disdain for him, but the feeling was mutual enough. These belligerent egotists would walk on anyone to exalt themselves, and complacency just happened to be the smallest, hence the easiest to persecute. He approached two hulking forms in the middle of some debate, and from their massive spine-covered arms and poisonous words, he could tell they were demons who specialized in hate, planting, aggravating, and spreading it, using their crushing arms and venomous quills to constrict and poison the love out of anyone. Complacency asked them, Where is Prince Lucius? Find him yourself, lizard, one of them growled. A demon of lust, a slithery creature with darting and shifty eyes and slippery hide, overheard and joined in, snatching Complacency with his long, sharp talons. And where have you been sleeping today? It asked with a sneer. I do not sleep, Complacency retorted. I cause people to sleep. 
To lust and steal innocence is far better. But someone must turn away the eyes of others. Lust thought that over and gave a smirk of approval. He dropped complacency rudely as those who watched laughed. Complacency passed deception, but didn't bother to ask him anything. Deception was the proudest, haughtiest demon of them all, very arrogant in his supposedly superior knowledge of how to control men's minds. His appearance was not even as gruesome as the other demons. He almost looked human. His weapon, he boasted, was always a compelling, persuasive argument, with lies ever so subtly woven in. Many others were there. Murder, his talons still dripping with blood. Lawlessness, his knuckles honed into spike-like protrusions and his hide thick and leathery. Jealousy, as suspicious and difficult a demon to work with as any. But complacency finally found Lucius, the Prince of Ashton, the demon who held the highest position of all of them. Lucius was in conference with a tight huddle of other power holders, going over the next strategies for controlling the town. He was unquestionably the demon in charge. Huge to begin with, he always maintained an imposing posture with his wings wrapped loosely around him to widen his outline, his arms flexed, his fists clenched and ready for blows. Many demons coveted his rank, and he knew it. He had fought and banished many to get where he was, and he had every intention of staying there. He trusted no one and suspected everyone, and his black, gnarled face and hawk-sharp eyes always carried the message that even his associates were his enemies. Complacency was desperate and enraged enough to violate Lucius's ideas of respect and decorum. He shoved his way through the group and right up to Lucius, who glared at him, surprised by the rude interruption. "'My prince,' complacency pleaded, "'I must have a word with you.' Lucius's eyes narrowed. Who was this little lizard to interrupt him in the middle of a conference, to violate decorum in front of these others? "'Why aren't you with Hogan?' he growled. "'I must speak with you.' Dare you speak to me without my first speaking to you? It is vitally important. You're, you're making a mistake. You're bothering Hogan's daughter and... Lucius immediately became a small volcano, spewing forth horrible cursings and wrath. You accuse your prince of a mistake. You dare to question my actions. Complacency cowered, expecting a stinging blow any moment. But he spoke anyway. Hogan will do us no harm if you let him alone. But you have only lit a fire within him, and he casts me off. The blow came, a walloping swat from the back of Lucius's hand. And as complacency tumbled across the room, he debated whether or not to speak another word. When he came to rest and regathered himself, he looked up to see every eye upon him, and he could feel their mocking disdain. Lucius walked slowly toward him and towered over him like a giant tree. Hogan casts you off. Is it not you who releases him? Do not strike me. Only hear my appeal. Lucius's big fists clenched painfully around handfuls of complacency's flesh and snatched him up so they were eye to eye. He could stand in our way, and I won't have that. You know your duty. Perform it. I, will, I was, I was, complacency cried. He was nothing to fear at all, a slug, a lump of clay. I could have held him there forever. So do it. Prince Lucius, please hear me. Give him no enemy. Let him have no need to fight. Lucius dropped him on the floor in a humiliated heap. The prince addressed the others in the room. We have given Hogan an enemy? They all knew how to answer. No, indeed. Deception, Lucius called, and deception stepped forward, giving Lucius a formal bow. Complacency accuses his prince of bothering Hogan's daughter. You would know about that. 
You have ordered no attack on Sandy Hogan, Prince, Deception answered. Complacency pointed his talon finger and screamed, You have followed her, you and your lackeys. You have spoken words to her mind, confused her. Deception only raised his eyebrows in mild indignation and answered sedately, Only upon her own invitation. We've only told her what she prefers to know. That can hardly be called an attack. Lucius seemed to take on some of Deception's maddening haughtiness as he said, Sandy Hogan is one case, but certainly her father is quite another. She poses no threat to us. He does. Shall we send someone else to hold him in check? Complacency had no answer, but added another note of concern. I... I saw messengers of the living God today. That only brought laughter from the group. Lucius sneered. Are you becoming that timid complacency? We see messengers of the living God every day. But they were close, about to attack. They knew my actions, I'm sure. You look all right to me. Though if I were one of them, I would surely pick you as an easy prey. More laughter from the group spurred Lucius on. A limp and easy target for mere sport. A lame demon with which a weak angel can prove his strength. Complacency cowered in shame. Lucius strode about, addressing the group. Do we fear the host of heaven? he asked. As you do not, we do not, they all answered with great polish. As the demons remained in their basement lair, patting each other's backs and stabbing complacencies, they took no notice of the strange, unnatural cold front outside. It moved slowly over the town, bringing a harsh wind and chilling rain. Though the evening had promised to be bright and clear, it now grew dark under a low, oppressive shroud, half natural, half spirit. Atop the little white church, Signa and his two companions continued to stand guard as the darkness descended over Ashton, deeper and colder with each passing moment. All over the nearby neighborhood, dogs began to bark and howl. Here and there, a quarrel broke out among humans. He's here, Signa said. In the meantime, Lucius's preoccupation with his own glory kept him from noticing the little attention he was now getting from his troops. All the other demons in the room, large or small, were gripped by a steadily rising fear and agitation. They could all feel something horrible coming closer and closer. They began to fidget, their eyes darting about, their faces twisting with apprehension. Lucius gave complacency a kick in the side as he walked by and continued his boasting. Complacency, you can be sure that we have things very much in control here. No worker from our numbers ever had to sneak about for fear of attack. We roam this town freely, doing our work unhampered, and we will succeed in every place until the town is fully ours. You listless, limp little bungler, to fear is to fail! Then it happened, and so very suddenly that none of them could react with anything other than air-piercing shrieks of terror. Lucius had hardly gotten the word fail out of his mouth before a violent boiling cloud crashed and thundered into the room like a tidal wave, a sudden avalanche of force that crushed like iron. The demons were swept across the room like so much debris in a raging tide, tumbling, screaming, wrapping their wings tightly around themselves in terror, all except for Lucius. As the demons recovered from the initial shockwave of this new presence, they looked up and saw Lucius's body, contorted like a broken toy, in the grip of a huge black hand. He struggled, choked, gagged, cried for mercy, but the hand only tightened its crushing grip, inflicting punishment without mercy, descending down out of the darkness like a cyclone from a thundercloud. Then the full figure of a spirit appeared, carrying Lucius by the throat and shaking him about like a rag doll. 
The thing was bigger than any they had ever seen before, a giant demon with a lion-like face, fiery eyes, incredibly muscular body, and leathery wings that filled the room. The voice gargled up from deep within the demon's torso and sprayed out in clouds of fiery red vapor. You who have no fear, are you now afraid? The spirit angrily hurled Lucius across the room to join the others, then stood like a mountain in the center of the room, wielding a deadly S-curved sword the size of a door. Obviously, this prince of princes had been greatly honored for past victories. His jet-black hair hung like a mane to his shoulders, and on each wrist he wore a gold bracelet studded with sparkling stones. His fingers displayed several rings, and a ruby-red belt and scabbard adorned his waist. The expansive black wings draped down behind him now like the robe of a monarch. For an eternity he stood there, glaring at them with sinister smoldering eyes, studying them, and all they could do was remain motionless in their terror, like a macabre tableau of frightened goblins. Finally, the big voice echoed off the walls. Lucius, I feel I was not expected. You will announce me. On your feet. The sword moved across the room, and the tip snagged Lucius in the height of his neck, jolting him to his feet. Lucius knew he was being belittled in the sight of his underlings, but he made every effort to hide his rising bitterness and anger. His fear showed well enough to adequately cover his other feelings. Fellow workers, he said, his voice quivering despite every effort. Baal Rapha, the prince of Babylon. Automatically, they all leaped to their feet, partly out of fearful respect, mostly out of fear of the tip of Rafar's sword, still waving slowly back and forth, ready to move against any dawdlers. Rafar gave them all a quick looking over. Then he inflicted another personal blow against Lucius. Lucius, you will stand with the others. I have come, and only one prince is needed. Friction. Everyone could feel it immediately. Lucius refused to move. His body was stiff, his fist clenched as tightly as ever, and though he was visibly trembling, he purposely returned the glaring look of Rafar and stood his ground. You have not asked me to yield my place, he challenged. The others were not about to intervene or even get close. They backed off, remembering that Rafar's sword could probably sweep a very wide radius. The sword did move, but so quickly that the very first thing anyone perceived was a scream of pain from Lucius as he coiled into a twisted knot on the floor. Lucius's sword and scabbard lay on the floor, skillfully cut away by one swift slash from Rafar. Again the sword moved, and this time the flat of the blade clamped Lucius to the floor by his hair. Rafar leaned over him, blood-red breath spewing from his mouth and nostrils as he spoke. I perceive you wish to challenge for my position. Lucius said nothing. Answer! No, Lucius cried. I yield. Up! Get up! Lucius struggled to his feet, and Rafar's strong arm stood him with the others. By now, Lucius was a most pitiful sight, totally humiliated. Rafar reached down with his sword and with the barbed tip picked up Lucius's sword and scabbard. The sword swung like a huge crane and deposited Lucius's weapons in the deposed demon's hands. Listen well, all of you, Rafar addressed them. Lucius, who fears not the hosts of heaven, has shown fear. He is a liar and a worm that is not to be heeded. I say to you, fear the hosts of heaven. They are your enemies, and they are intent on defeating you. As they are ignored, as they are given place, so they shall overcome you. 
Rafar walked with heavy, ponderous steps up and down the line of demons, giving them all a closer look. When he came to complacency, he drew close, and complacency fell backwards. Rafar caught him around the back of the neck with one finger and pulled him up straight. Tell me, little lizard, what did you see today? Complacency was suffering from a sudden memory lapse. Rafar prodded him. Messengers of the living God, you said? Complacency nodded. Where? Just outside this building. What were they doing? I, I... Did they attack you? Uh, no. Was there a flash of light? That seemed to register with complacency. He nodded. When a messenger of God attacks, there is always light. Rafar addressed all of them angrily. And you let it slip by. You laughed. You mocked. A near attack from the enemy, and you ignored it. Now Rafar returned to grill Lucius some more. Tell me, deposed prince, how stands the town of Ashton? Is it ready? Lucius was quick to say, Yes, Mayor Rafar. Oh, then you have taken care of this praying bush and this sleeping troublemaker Hogan. Lucius was silent. You have not. First you allow them to come into places we reserved for our own special appointments. It was a mistake, Bail Rafar, Lucius blurted. The clarion editor was eliminated according to our orders, but no one knows where this Hogan came from. He bought the paper before anything could be done. And Bush? It was my understanding that he fled from your attacks. That, that was another man of God. The first one. He did flee. And? This younger man sprung up in his place. From nowhere. A long, foul sigh hissed out through Rafar's fangs. The host of heaven, he said. While you have taken them for granted, they have moved in the Lord's chosen right under your noses. It is no secret that Henry Bush is a man who prays. Do you fear that? Lucius nodded. Yes, of course, more than anything. We have been attacking him, trying to drive him out. And how has he responded? He, he... Speak up. He prays. Rafar shook his head. Yes, yes, he is a man of God. And what about Hogan? What have you done about him? We, we have attacked his daughter. Complacency's ears perked up at that. His daughter? But complacency couldn't contain himself. I told him it wouldn't work. It would only make Hogan more aggressive and wake him from his lethargy. Lucius grabbed for Rafar's attention. If my lord would allow me to explain. Explain. Rafar instructed Lucius while warily eyeing complacency. Lucius quickly formulated a plan in his mind. Sometimes a direct attack is not wise, so we found a weakness in his daughter and felt we could divert his energies toward her, perhaps destroy him at home and disintegrate his family. It seemed to work on the former editor. It was at least a start. It will fail! cried complacency. He was harmless until they tampered with his sense of well-being and comfort. Now I fear I won't be able to hold him back. 
He is a quick, threatening gesture from Rayfar's outstretched hand stifled complacency's wailings. I do not want Hogan held back, Rayfar said. I want him destroyed. Yes, take his daughter, take anything else that can be corrupted. A risk is best removed, not tolerated. But, <laughs> cried complacency, but Rayfar quickly took hold of him and spoke with noxious fumings right into his face. Discourage him. Surely you can do that. Well. But Rayfar was in no mood to wait for an answer. With a powerful spin of his wrist, he hurled complacency out of the room and back to work. We will destroy him, assault him on every side until he has no solid ground left from which to fight. As for this new man of God who has sprung up, I'm sure an adequate trap can be laid. But concerning our enemies, how strong are they? Not strong at all, answered Lucius trying to recover his competency rating. But cunning enough to make you think they are weak. A fatal mistake, Lucius. He addressed all of them. You are to no longer take the enemy for granted. Watch him. Count his numbers. Know his whereabouts, his skill, his name. No mission was ever undertaken that was not challenged by the hosts of heaven. And this mission is nothing small. Our Lord has very important plans for this town. He has sent me to fulfill them. And that is enough to draw the very hordes of the enemy down upon our heads. Be fearful of that, and give place nowhere. And as for these two thorns in our hoof, these two implanted barriers, tonight we will see what they are made of. Chapter 6 it was a dark, rainy night, and the raindrops pelting against the old single-pane windows made sleep difficult for Hank and Mary. She dropped off eventually, but Hank, already troubled in spirit, found it much harder to relax. It had been a lousy day anyway. He had worked on painting that slogan off the front of the house and tried to figure out who in the world would write such a thing against him. His ears were still ringing with the conversation he'd had with Alf Bramell, and his mind was still playing over and over the bitter comments from the board meeting. Now he could add to his apprehensions the congregational meeting on Friday, and he prayed to the Lord in desperate hushed whispers as he lay there in the dark. Funny how every lump in the mattress seems so much more lumpy when you're upset. Hank began to worry that he would keep Mary awake with all his tossing and turning. He lay on his back, his side, his other side, put his arms under his pillow, over his pillow. He grabbed a Kleenex and blew his nose. He looked over at the clock, 12.20. They had turned in at 10. But sleep finally does come, usually in such an unannounced way that you don't even know you're out until you wake up. Sometime that night, Hank dozed off. But after a few hours, his dreams began to go sour. They were the usual silly things at first, like driving a car through his living room and then flying in the car as it turned into an airplane. But then the images began to rush and riot through his head, growing frantic and chaotic. He started running from dangers. He could hear screams. There was the sensation of falling and the sight and taste of blood. Images were from bright and colorful to monochromatic and dismal. He was constantly fighting, struggling for his life. Innumerable dangers and enemies surrounded him, closing in. None of it made any sense. But one thing was very definite throughout. Stark terror. He wanted desperately to scream, but didn't have time between fighting off enemies, monsters, unseen forces. 
His pulse began to pound in his ears. The whole world was reeling and throbbing. The horrible conflict rushing in his head began to push its way to the surface of the conscious everyday Hank. He stirred in the bed, rolled over on his back, drew a deep waking up breath. His eyes half opened, not focused on anything. He was in that strange state of stupor halfway between sleep and consciousness. Did he really see it? It was an eerie projection in midair, a glowing painting on black velvet. Right above the bed, so close he could smell sulfurous breath, a hideous mask of a face hovered, contorting in grotesque movements as it spit out vicious words he couldn't understand. Hank's eyes opened like a sprung trap. He thought he could still see the face, just fading away, but instantly he felt like he'd been struck by a very heavy blow to his chest. His heart began to race and pound like it would burst through his ribs. He could feel his pajamas and the bedsheets sticking to him, drenched in sweat. He lay there panting for breath, waiting for his heart to calm down, for the stark terror to go away. But nothing changed, and he couldn't make it change. You're just having a nightmare, he kept telling himself, but he couldn't seem to wake up. He purposely opened his eyes wide and looked around the darkened room, even though part of him wanted to regress back to childhood and just hide under the covers until the ghosts and monsters and burglars went away. He saw nothing in the room out of the ordinary. A goblin in the corner was nothing but his shirt hanging on a chair, and the strange halo of light on the wall was only the street light reflecting off the crystal of his watch. But he had been severely frightened, and he was still scared. He could feel himself shaking as he desperately tried to sort hallucination from reality. He watched, listened. Even the silence seemed sinister. He found no comfort in it, only the dread that something evil hid behind it, an intruder or a demon waiting, watching for the right moment. What was that? A creak in the house? Footsteps? No, he told himself, just the wind against the windows. The rain had stopped. Another noise, this time a rustling in the living room. He had never heard that noise at night before. I gotta wake up, I gotta wake up. Come on, Hart, quiet down so I can hear. He forced himself to sit up in bed, even though it made him feel more vulnerable, and he remained there for several minutes, trying to stifle his heart's pounding with his hand over his chest. The pounding finally settled back a little, but the rate remained rapid. Hank could feel the sweat turning cold against his skin. To get up or go back to sleep? Sleep was definitely out. He decided to get up, look around, walk it off. A clatter this time in the kitchen. Now Hank started praying. Marshall had had the same kind of dreams and felt the same heart-pounding fear. Voices. It sure sounded like voices somewhere. Sandy? Maybe a radio. But who knows, he thought to himself. This town is going crazy anyway, and now the sickies are in my house. He slid stealthily out of bed, put on his slippers, and moved over to the closet to procure a baseball bat. Just like back home, he thought. Now somebody's going to have mush for brains. He looked out his bedroom door, up and down the hallway. No lights were on anywhere. No flashlight beams played about. But his guts were doing a square dance under his ribs and there had to be some reason for it. He reached for the hallway light and flipped the switch. Nuts! The bulb was burned out. Since when, he didn't know, but he stood in the dark and felt his courage deflated just that much more. He gripped the bat more tightly and moved down the hall, staying close to the wall, looking ahead, looking behind, listening. He thought he could hear a quiet rustling somewhere, something moving. At the archway that led into the living room, his eyes caught something, and he pressed himself against the wall for concealment. The front door was open. Now his heart really started pounding, thudding rudely in his ears. In a strange, jungle way, he felt better. At least there was indication of a real enemy. It was this lousy fear without any reason that was spooking him. He had already been through that sort of thing once today. 
With that thought came a strange idea. That professor lady must be in the house. He moved down the hall to check Sandy's room and make sure she was all right. He wanted to stay between Kate and Sandy and whatever's out there in the rest of the house. Sandy's bedroom door was open, and that was unusual. It made him all the more cautious. He inched along the wall toward the doorway, and then, bat ready in his hands, he peered into the room. Something was up. Sandy was, at least. Her bed was empty, and she was gone. He flicked on her bedroom light. The bed had been slept in, but now the covers were thrown back hastily, and the room was in disarray. As Marshall moved cautiously down the darkened hallway, it did occur to him that Sandy might just be up getting a drink, using the bathroom, reading. But such simple logic weakened against the horrible feeling that something was dreadfully wrong. He took deep breaths, trying with his greatest effort to hold himself steady, while all the time he felt an insidious, unearthly terror, as if he were inches from the crushing teeth of some monster he couldn't see. The bathroom was cold and dark. He turned on the light, dreading what he thought he might see. He saw nothing out of the ordinary. He left that light on and headed back toward the living room. He peered like some kind of stalking fugitive through the archway. There was that rustling sound again. He flipped on the lights. Ah, the cold night air was coming in through the front door, rustling the drapes. No, Sandy was nowhere to be seen. Not in the living room, not anywhere in or near the kitchen. Perhaps she was right outside. But he had undeniable qualms about crossing the living room to the front door, walking past all the furniture that could hide an assailant. He gripped the bat tightly, keeping it up and ready. He kept his back to the wall as he made his way around the perimeter of the room, stepping around the sofa after checking behind it, hurriedly maneuvering around the stereo and finally reaching the door. He went out onto the porch, into the cool night air, and for some reason suddenly felt safer. The town was still quiet this time of night. Everyone else was certainly asleep right now, not sneaking around their houses with baseball bats. He took a moment to regather himself and then went back inside. Locking the door behind him was just like shutting himself in a dark closet with a couple of hundred vipers. The fear returned and he tightened his grip on the bat. With his back against the door, he looked around the room again. Why was it so dark? The lights were on, but every bulb seemed so dim, as if there were some kind of brownout. Hogan, he thought to himself, either you've really lost a screw or you're in big, big trouble. He remained frozen there by the door, motionless, looking and listening. There had to be somebody or something in the house. He couldn't hear them or see them, but he could certainly feel them. Outside the house, lying low in the evergreens and hedges, Tal and his company watched as demons, at least forty according to Tal's count, played havoc with Marshall's mind and spirit. They swooped like deadly black swallows in and out of the house, through the rooms, around and around Marshall, screaming taunts and blasphemies and playing with and ever increasing his fears. Tal kept careful watch for the dreaded Rayfar, but the Baal wasn't among this wild group. There could be no doubt, however, that Rayfar had sent them. Tal and the others agonized, feeling Marshall's pain. One demon, an ugly little imp with bristling needle-sharp quills all over his body, leaped upon Marshall's shoulders and beat upon his head, screaming, You're going to die, Hogan! You're going to die! Your daughter is dead, and you are going to die! Gylo could hardly control himself. His big sword slipped with a metallic ring from its sheath, but Tal's strong arm held him back. Please, Captain, Gylo pleaded. Never before have I only watched this happen. Bridle yourself, dear warrior, Tal cautioned. I will strike them only once. Gylo could see that even Tal was severely pained by his own order. Forbear, forbear. He must go through it. Hank had the lights on in the house, 
but he thought his eyes must have been playing tricks on him because the room still looked very dark, the shadows deep. Sometimes he couldn't tell if it was himself moving or the shadows in the room. A strange undulating motion in the light and shadows made the depths in the house shift back and forth like the slow, steady motion of breathing. Hank stood in the doorway between kitchen and living room, watching and listening. He thought he could feel a wind moving through the house, but not a cold one from outside. It was like hot, sticky breath laden with repulsive odors, close and oppressive. He had discovered that the clatter in the kitchen was due to a spatula sliding off the drainboard and onto the floor. That should have calmed his nerves right down, but he still felt terrified. He knew that he would sooner or later have to come into the living room to have a look. He took his first step out of the doorway and into the room. It was like falling into a bottomless well of blackness and terror. The hairs on his neck bristled as if with static electricity. His lips started spilling out a frantic prayer. He went down. Before he even knew what was happening, his body pitched forward and slammed onto the floor. He became a trapped animal, instinctively struggling, trying to get loose from the unseen crushing weight that held him. His arms and legs were smacking into furniture and knocking things over, but in his terror and shock he felt no pain. He squirmed, twisted, gasped for breath, and lashed out at whatever it was, feeling resistance against the motion of his arms like stroking through water. The room seemed filled with smoke. Blackness like blindness, a loss of hearing, a loss of contact with the real world, time standing still. He could feel himself dying. An image, a hallucination, a vision, or a real sight broke through for an instant, two ghastly yellow eyes full of hate. His throat began to compress, squeezing shut. Jesus, he heard his mind cry out, help me. His next thought, a tiny instant flash, must have come from the Lord. Rebuke it. You have the authority. Hank spoke the words, though he couldn't hear the sound of them. I rebuke you in Jesus' name. The crushing weight upon him lifted so quickly, Hank felt he would sail upward from the floor. He filled his lungs with air and noticed he was now struggling against nothing. But the terror was still there, the black, sinister presence. He sat up halfway, drew another breath, and spoke it clearly and loudly. In the name of Jesus, I command you to get out of this house. Mary awoke with a jerk, startled and then terrified by the sound of a multitude screaming in anguish and pain. The cries were deafening at first, but they faded as if moving off into the unseen distance. Hank! she screamed. Marshall roared like a savage and raised the bat high to strike down his attacker. The attacker screamed also out of stark terror. It was Kate. They had unknowingly backed into each other in the dark hallway. Marshall! she exclaimed, and her voice quivered. She was close to tears and angry at the same time. What on earth are you doing out here? "'Kate,' Marshall sighed, feeling himself shrink like a punctured inner tube. "'What are you trying to do, get yourself killed?' "'What's wrong?' She was looking at the baseball bat and knew something was up. She clung to him in fear. "'Is there someone in the house?' "'No,' he muttered in a combination of relief and disgust. "'Nobody. I looked.' "'What happened?' Who was it? Nobody, I said. But I thought you were talking to someone. He looked at her with the utmost impatience and said with steadily building volume, Do I look like I've been having a friendly chat with someone? Kate shook her head. I must have been dreaming. But it was the voices that woke me up. What voices? Marshall, it sounded like a New Year's Eve party in there. Come on, who was it? Nobody. There wasn't anybody here. I looked. Kate was very flustered. I know I was awake. You heard ghosts. He could feel her hand squeezing the blood out of his arm. 
Don't talk like that. Sandy's gone. What do you mean, gone? Gone where? She's gone. Her room's empty. She's not in the house. She's poof, gone. Kate hurried down the hall and looked in Sandy's room. Marshall followed her and observed from the doorway as Kate checked the room over, looking through the closet and some of the drawers. She reported with alarm, Some of her clothes are gone. Her school books are missing. She looked at him helplessly. Marshall, she's left home. He looked back at her for a long moment, then around the room, then rested his head against the door jamb with a quiet thud. Nuts, he said. I knew she wasn't herself tonight. I should have found out what was wrong. We didn't hit it off too well today. Well, that was obvious. You came home without her. How'd she get home, anyway? Her girlfriend Terry brought her. Maybe she went over to Terry's for the night. Should we call and find out? I don't know. You don't know? Marshall closed his eyes and tried to think. No, it's late. Either she's there or she isn't. If she isn't, we'll be getting them out of bed for nothing. And if she is, well, she's okay anyway. Kate seemed a little panicked. I'm going to call. Marshall held up his hand and leaned his head against the door jamb again as he said, Hey, don't get all spooked now, all right? Give me a minute. I just want to see if she's there. All right, all right. But Kate could see something was very wrong with Marshall. He was pale, weak, shaken. What's the matter, Marshall? Give me a minute. <laughs> She put her arm around him, concerned. What is it? He had quite a struggle getting it out. I'm scared. Trembling a bit, his eyes closed, his head resting against the door jamb, he said again, I'm really scared, and I don't know why. That scared Kate. Marshall? Don't get upset, will you? Keep it level. Can I do anything? Just be tough, that's all. Kate thought for a moment. Well, why don't you get your robe on? I'll warm you some milk, okay? Yeah, great. It was the first time any demons had ever been actually confronted and rebuked by Hank Bush. They had certainly come with an arrogant brashness at first, descending on the house in the dead of night to raid and ravage, screaming and swooping through the rooms and leaping on Hank, trying to terrify him. But as Creone, Triscoll, and the others watched from their hiding place, confused and scattered flocks of demons suddenly came thundering and fluttering out of the house like bats, screaming, indignant, stopping their ears. There must have been close to a hundred— all the usual demonic pranksters and troublemakers Creone had seen at work all over the town. No doubt the great Baal had sent them, and now that they had been routed, there was no telling what Rafar's reaction or his next plan would be. But Hank had proven himself very well. In a moment the coast was clear, the trouble was over, and the warriors came out of hiding, breathing easier. Creone and Triscal were impressed. Creone commented, Tal was right. He's not so insignificant. Triscoll agreed. Stern stuff, this Henry Bush. But as Hank and Mary sat trembling at their kitchen table, she preparing an ice pack and he sporting a welt on his forehead and a great many bruises and scrapings on his arms and shins, neither one of them felt entirely stern, powerful, or victorious. Hank was thankful to have escaped with his life and Mary was still in a mild state of shock and disbelief. It was awkward, with neither of them wanting to relate his or her experiences first, for fear that the whole thing was nothing but an excess of pickles and pastrami before bedtime. But Hank's wealth kept growing, and he could only tell what he knew. Mary bought every word of it, scared as she was by the screams that had awakened her. 
As they shared their not-so-pleasant experiences, they were able to accept the fact that the whole night of madness had been very frighteningly real and not some nightmare. Demons, Hank concluded. Mary could only nod. But why? Hank pleaded to know. What was it for? Mary wasn't ready to come up with any answers. She kept waiting for Hank to do that. He muttered, My lesson number one in front lines combat. I wasn't a bit ready for it. I think I flunked. Mary gave him the ice pack and he placed it against the welt, wincing at the pressure. What makes you think you flunked? she asked. I don't know. I just walked into it, I guess. I let them clobber me. Then he prayed, Lord God, help me to be ready next time. Give me the wisdom, the sensitivity to know what they're up to. Mary squeezed his hand and said, Amen, and then commented, You know, I might be wrong, but hasn't the Lord already done that? I mean, how are you going to know how to fight Satan's direct attacks unless you just do it? That was what Hank needed to hear. Wow, he mused. I'm a veteran. And I don't think you've flunked either. They're gone, aren't they? And you're still here, and you should have heard those screams. <laughs> Are you sure it wasn't me? Quite sure. Then came a long, troubled silence. So what now? Mary finally asked. Uh, let's pray, said Hank. For him, that option was always easy to jump to. And pray they did, clasping hands at the little kitchen table, having a conference with the Lord. They thanked him for the experience of that night, for protecting them from danger, for showing them a very close glimpse of their enemy. Over an hour passed, and during that time the field of concern continued to grow outward. Their own problems began to take a small place in a vastly wider perspective as Hank and Mary prayed for their church, the people in it, the town, the people that ran it, the state, the nation, the world. Through it all came the beautiful assurance that they had indeed connected with the throne of God and had conducted serious business with the Lord. Hank grew more determined to stay in the battle and give Satan a real run for his money. He was sure... That was what God wanted. The warm milk and Kate's company had a soothing effect on Marshall's nerves. With each swallow and each additional minute of normalcy, he gained more and more assurance that the world would still go on. He would live. The sun would rise in the morning. He was amazed at how bleak things had looked just a little while ago. Feeling better? Kate asked, buttering some fresh toast. Yeah, he answered, noticing that his heart had retreated back into his chest and returned to its normal everyday pace. Boy, I don't know what got into me. Kate placed the two slices of toast on a plate and set them on the table. Marshall crunched off a bite of toast and asked, So she's not at Terry's? Kate shook her head. Do you want to talk about Sandy? Marshall was ready. We probably need to talk about a lot of things. I don't know how to start. You think it's my fault? Oh, Marshall, come on, be honest now. I've been getting my behind whipped off all day. I'll listen. Her eyes met his and remained in place, denoting a sincerity and firm love. Categorically no, she said. I botched it today. I think we've all botched it, and that includes Sandy. She's made some choices, too, remember? Yeah, but maybe it was because we didn't have anything better to give her. What do you think of talking to Pastor Young? Case in point. Hmm? Hogan shook his head despondently. Maybe, maybe Young's just a little too... Cush, you know. He's into all this family of man stuff. Discovering yourself. Saving the whales. Kate was a little surprised. I thought you liked Pastor Young. 
Well, I guess I do, but sometimes, <laughs> no, a lot of the time, I don't even feel like I'm going to church. I may as well be sitting at a lodge meeting or in one of Sandy's weird classes. He checked her eyes. They were still steady. She was listening. Kate, don't you ever get the feeling that God's got to be, you know, a little bigger, tougher? The God we get at that church, I, I feel like he isn't even a real person. And if he is, he's dumber than we are. I can't expect Sandy to buy that stuff. I don't even go for it myself. I never knew you felt this way, Marshal. Well, maybe I never did either. It's just that this thing tonight, I, I've really got to think about it. There's, There's been so much of it going on lately. What do you mean? What's been going on? I can't tell her, Marshal thought to himself. How could he explain the strange hypnotic persuasion he was sure he got from Bromel? The spooky feelings he'd gotten from Sandy's professor, the stark terror he'd felt that night. None of it made sense. And now, to top it off, Sandy was gone. All through these situations, he had been horrified by his own inability to fight back. He had felt controlled. But he couldn't tell Kate anything like that. Ah, uh, it's a long story, he said finally. All I know is this whole thing, our lifestyle, our schedule, our family, our religion, whatever it is, just isn't working. Something's got to change. But you don't think you want to talk to Pastor Young? Ah, oh, he's a turkey. Just then, 1 a.m. or not, the phone rang. Sandy, Kate exclaimed. Marshall snatched up the receiver. Hello? Hello, said a female voice. You're up. Marshall recognized the voice with disappointment. It was Bernice. Oh, hi, Bernie, he said, looking at Kate, whose face sank now with frustration. Don't hang up. I'm sorry for calling at this late hour, but I had a date and I didn't get home until late. But I wanted to develop that film. Are you mad? I'll be mad tomorrow. Right now I'm too tired. What have you got? Get this. I know the film and the camera had twelve pictures of the carnival, including the ones of Bramel Young and those three unknowns. Today I went home and shot the rest of the roll. Twelve more frames. My cat, the neighbor lady with the big mole, the evening news, etc. Today's pictures came out. There was a pause, and Marshall knew he would have to ask. What about the other ones? The emulsion was blacked out, totally exposed. The film scratched and fingerprinted in a few places. There's nothing wrong with the camera. Marshall said nothing for a long moment. Marshall? Hello? That's interesting, he said. They're up to something. It's got me all excited. I'm wondering if I can trace those prints. There was another long pause. Hello? What did the other woman look like, the blonde one? Not too old, long blonde hair, kind of mean-looking. Heavy, thin, in between. She looked good. Marshall's forehead crinkled a bit, and his eyes shifted about as he followed his ideas. I'll see you in the morning. Goodbye, and thanks for answering. Marshall hung up the phone. He stared at the tabletop, drumming his fingers. What was that all about? Kate asked. Mm, he said, still thinking. Then he answered. Uh, newspaper stuff, no biggie. What was it we were talking about, anyway? Well, if it still matters, we were just talking about whether or not you should talk to Pastor Young about our problem. Young, he said, and almost sounded angry. But if you don't want to... Marshall stared at the table while his warm milk got cold. Kate waited, then roused him with, Would you rather talk about this in the morning? I'll talk to him, Marshall said flatly. I... I want to talk to him. 
<laughs> you bet I'll talk to him. It couldn't hurt. No, it sure couldn't. I don't know when he'd be able to see you, but one o'clock would be nice. He scowled a bit. One o'clock would be perfect. Marshall, Kate started, but she kept it back. There was something happening to her husband, and she picked it up in his voice and his expression. She had never really missed that fire in his eyes. Perhaps she'd never known it was gone until this moment, when for the first time since they left New York, she saw it again. Some old, unpleasant feelings rose up within her, feeling she had no desire to cope with late at night with her daughter mysteriously missing. Marshall, she said, sliding her chair out and picking up the plate of half-eaten toast, let's get some sleep. I may not be able to sleep. I know, she said quietly. All this time, Tal, Gilo, Nathan, and Armoth had stood in the room, carefully observing, and now Gilo began to chuckle in his gruff, quaking way. Tal said with a smile, no, Marshal Hogan, you never were much of a sleeper. And now Rayfar has helped to awaken you again. Chapter 7 On Tuesday morning, the sun was shining through the windows, and Mary was busy beating the daylights out of some bread dough. Hank found the name and number in the church records, the Reverend James Farrell. He had never met Farrell, and all he knew was the tasteless and malicious gossip going around about the man who had been his predecessor and had since moved far away from Ashton. It was a whim, a stab in the dark, Hank knew that. But he sat down on the couch, picked up the phone, and dialed the number. Hello? A tired older man's voice answered. Hello, said Hank, trying to sound pleasant despite his tight nerves. James Farrell? Yes, who is this? Uh, this is Hank Bush, pastor of the... He heard Farrell give a drawn-out, knowledgeable sigh. Ashton Community Church. I guess you must know who I am. Yes, Pastor Bush. So, how are you? How do I answer that, Hank wondered. Um, okay in some respects. And not okay in other respects, Farrell offered, completing Hank's thought. Boy, you've really been keeping up on things. Well, not actively. I do hear from some of the members from time to time. Then he added quickly, I'm glad you called. What can I do for you? Um, talk to me, I guess. Farrell answered, I'm sure there's a lot I could say to you. I do hear there's a congregational meeting this Friday. Is that true? Yes, it is. A vote of confidence, I understand. That's right. Yes, I went through the same thing, you know. From L. Turner, Mayor and Stanley were in charge of that one, too. you got to be kidding. Oh, it's strictly history repeating itself, Hank. Take it from me. They drummed you out? They decided they didn't like what I was preaching and the direction of my ministry. So they stirred up the congregation against me and then managed to take it to a vote. I didn't lose my much, but I did lose. The same four guys? The same four. But now, did I hear right? Did you really put Lou Stanley out of fellowship? Well, yeah. Now that is something. I can't imagine Lou letting anyone do that to him. Well, the other three made that a pivotal issue. They haven't left me alone about it. And how is the congregation leaning? I don't know. They could be pretty evenly divided. So, how are you standing up under all this? Hank could think of no better way to phrase it, he said. I think I'm under attack. Direct spiritual attack. Silence at the other end. Hello? Oh, I'm here. Farrell talks slowly, falteringly, as if thinking hard while trying to converse. 
What kind of spiritual attack? Hank stammered a bit. He could imagine how last night's experience would sound to a stranger. Well, I just think Satan is really involved here. Farrell was almost demanding. Hank, what kind of spiritual attack? Hank began his account carefully, trying very hard to sound like a sane and responsible individual as he related the major points. The mania Bromel seemed to have for getting rid of him, the church division, the gossip, the angry church board, the slogan painted on his house, and then the spiritual wrestling match he had gone through last night. Farrell interrupted only to ask clarifying questions. I know it all sounds crazy, Hank concluded. All Farrell could do was let out a deep sigh and mutter, Oh, blast it all. Well, like you say, it's just history repeating itself. No doubt you've encountered things like this, right? Or am I the one who has the real problem here? Farrell struggled with the words. I am glad you called. I always struggled with whether or not I should call you. I don't know if you're going to like hearing this, but... Farrell paused for new strength, then said... Hank, are you sure you belong there? Uh-oh. Hank felt a defensiveness rising in him. I do firmly believe in my heart that God has called me here, yes. Do you know you were chosen as pastor by accident? Well, some are saying that, but it is true, Hank. You really should consider that. You see... The church ousted me. They had some other minister all picked out and ready to move in. Some guy who had a wide and liberal enough religious philosophy to suit them. Hank, I, I really don't know how you ended up with the job. But it was definitely some kind of organizational fluke. The one thing they did not want in there was another fundamentalist minister, not after they went to such great lengths to get rid of the one they had. But they voted me in. It was an accident. Bramell and the others were definitely not planning on it. Well, that's obvious now. Okay, good, you can see that. So, let me just get right down to some direct advice. Now, after Friday, this may all be moot anyway, but... If I were you, I'd get packing and start looking for a position elsewhere, no matter how the vote comes out. Hank deflated a little. This conversation was turning sour. He just couldn't buy it. All he could do was sigh into the phone. Farrell was forceful. Hank, I've been there. I've been through it. I know what you're going through, and I know what you have yet to go through. Believe me, it isn't worth it. Let them have that church. Let them have the whole town. Just don't sacrifice yourself. But I can't leave. Yeah, right, you have a calling from God. Hank, so did I. I was ready to go into battle to make a real stand in that town for God. You know, it cost me my home, my reputation, my health... It almost cost me my marriage. I left Ashton literally planning on changing my name. You have no idea who you're really dealing with. There are forces at work in that town. What kind of forces? Well, political, social, spiritual too, of course. Oh, yeah, you never did answer my question. What about what happened to me last night? What do you think about that? Farrell hesitated, then said, Hank, I don't know why, but it's very difficult for me to talk about such things. All I can say to you is get out of that place while you can. Just drop it. The church doesn't want you there. The town doesn't want you there. I can't leave. I told you that. Farrell paused for a long time. Hank was almost afraid he had hung up. 
But then he said, All right, Hank. I'll tell you. And you listen. What you went through last night, well, I think I may have had similar experiences. But I can assure you, whatever it was, it was only the beginning. Pastor Farrell, I'm not a pastor. Call me Jim. That's what the gospel is all about. Fighting Satan, shining the light of the gospel into the darkness. Hank, all the nice homilies you can dig up won't help you there. Now, I don't know how equipped or ready you are, but to be perfectly honest, if you come through it all with even your life, I'll be surprised. I'm serious. Hank had no other answer he could give. Jim, <laughs> I'll let you know how it turns out. Maybe I'll win, maybe I won't come out alive. But God didn't tell me I'd come out alive. He just told me to stay and fight. You've made one thing clear to me. Satan does want this town. I can't let him have it. Hank replaced the receiver and felt he would cry. Lord God, he prayed, Lord God, what shall I do? The Lord gave no immediate answer, and Hank sat there on the couch for several minutes trying to regather his strength and confidence. Mary was still busy in the kitchen. That was good. He couldn't talk to her right now. There were too many thoughts and feelings to be sorted out. Then a verse came to his mind. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it, and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Well, it sure beats sitting home just fussing and fuming and not really doing anything. So on went his sneakers, and out the door he went. Creone and Triscoll were outside waiting for their charge. Invisibly they joined Hank, one on each side, and walked with him down Morgan Hill toward the center of town. Hank was not a man of great stature anyway, but between these two giants he looked even smaller. He did, however, appear very, very safe. Triscoll kept a wary eye open, saying, What's he up to, anyway? Creone knew Hank pretty well by now. I don't think he even knows. The spirit is driving him. He's giving action to a burden in his heart. Oh, we'll have action, all right. Just don't be a threat. So far, it's the best way to survive in this town. So tell that to the little pastor here. As Hank neared the main business district, he paused on a corner to look up and down the street, watching old cars, new cars, vans and four-by-fours, shoppers, walkers, joggers, and bicyclers stream in four and more directions, regarding the orders of the traffic light as mere suggestions. So where was the evil? How could it be so vivid last night in a distant, dubious memory today? No demons or devils lurked in the office windows or reached out of the storm drains. The people were the same simple, ordinary folks he had always seen, still ignoring him and passing by. Yes, this was the town he prayed for night and day with deep groanings of the heart because of a burden he couldn't explain, and now it was taxing his patience and settling him. Well, are you in trouble or aren't you? Or don't you even care? he said aloud. Nobody listened. No deep, sinister voices answered back with a threat. But the spirit of the Lord inside him wouldn't leave him alone. Pray, Hank. Pray for these people. Don't let them escape your heart. The pain is there. The fear is there. The danger is there. So when do we win? Hank answered the Lord. Do you know how long I've been sweating and praying over this place? Just once I'd like to hear my little pebble make a splash. I'd like to see this dead dog twitch when I poke it. It was amazing how well the demons could hide, even behind the doubts he sometimes felt about their very existence. I know you're out there, he said quietly, gazing carefully over the blankly staring faces of the buildings, 
the concrete, the brick, the glass, the trash. The spirits were teasing him. They could descend on him in a moment, terrorize and choke him, and then vanish, slipping back into the hiding places behind the facade of the town, snickering, hide-and-seeking, watching him grope about it like a blind fool. He sat down on a sidewalk bench, feeling miffed. I'm here, Satan, he said. I can't see you, and maybe you can move faster than I can, but I'm still here, and by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, I intend to be a thorn in your side until one of us has had enough. Hank looked across the street at the impressive structure of the Ashton United Christian Church. Hank had known some terrific Christians who belonged to that denomination, but this particular bunch in Ashton were different, liberal, even bizarre. He had met Pastor Oliver Young a few times and could never get very close to him. Young seemed rather cold and aloof, and Hank could never figure out why. As Hank sat there watching a brown Buick pull into the church parking lot, Triscoll and Creone stood beside the bench, also watching the car come to a stop. Only the two of them could see the car's special passengers. Sitting on the roof were two big warriors, the Arabian and the African, Nathan and Armoth. No swords were visible. They were taking a passive, non-combatant posture, according to Tal's orders, just like all the rest. Marshall had seen Bernice's film. He had seen the minute scratches from some kind of mishandling. He had seen the clumsy fingerprints at regular intervals that could very well have been placed there by a hand pulling the film out of the camera, unrolling it in the light. Marshall had gotten his appointment with Young for one o'clock. He pulled into the vast, black-top parking lot at 12.45, still downing a deluxe cheeseburger and large coffee. Ashton United Christian was one of the large, stately-looking edifices around town, constructed in the traditional style with heavy stone, stained glass, towering lines, majestic steeple. The front door fit the motif, large, solid, even a little intimidating, especially when you tried to heave it open all by yourself. The church was located near the center of town, and the carillon in the tower chimed each hour and gave a short concert of hymns at noon. It was a respected establishment, Young was a respected minister. The people who attended the church were respected members of the community. Marshall had often thought that respect and status just might be a prerequisite for membership. He engaged the big front door in a short Indian arm wrestle and finally got inside. No, this congregation had never spared the expense, that was for sure. The floors of the foyer, stairs, and sanctuary were covered with thick red carpeting, the woodwork was all deep furnished oak and walnut. On top of that was all the brass. Brass door handles, coat hooks, stairway railing, window latches. The windows, of course, were stained glass, and all the ceilings were lofty with great hanging chandeliers and delicate scrollwork. Marshall entered the sanctuary through another ponderous door and walked down a long center aisle toward the front. This room was a cross between an opera house and a cavern. The platform was big, the pulpit was big, the choir loft was big. Of course, the choir was big, too. Pastor Young's big office, just to the side of the sanctuary, afforded a very visible access to the platform and pulpit, and Pastor Young's entrance through the big oak door each Sunday morning was a traditional part of the ceremonies. Marshall pushed that big door open and stepped into the reception office. The pretty secretary greeted him, but didn't know who he was. He told her she checked the appointment book and verified it. Marshall checked the book, too, reading upside down again. The two o'clock hour was marked A. Bramell. Well, Marshall, Young said with a cordial business-like smile and handshake. Come in, come in. Marshall followed Young into his plush office. Young, a large-framed man in his sixties with a roundish face, wire-rimmed glasses, and thin, well-oiled hair, seemed to enjoy his position both in the church and in the community. His dark-paneled walls sported many plaques from community and charitable organizations. 
Along with those were several framed photographs of him posing with the governor, a few popular evangelists, some authors, and a senator. Behind his impressive desk, Young created a perfect picture of the successful professional. The high-backed leather chair became a throne, and his own reflection in the desktop made him all the more scenic and impressive, like a mountain reflected in an alpine lake. He motioned Marshall to a chair, and Marshall sat down, noticing that he sank to an eye level quite below Young's. He began to feel a familiar tinge of intimidation. This whole office seemed designed for it. Nice office, he commented. Thank you very much, said Young with a smile that shoved his cheeks into piles against his ears. He leaned back in his chair, his fingers interlaced and wiggling on the edge of his desk. I enjoy it. I'm thankful for it, and I rather appreciate the warmth, the atmosphere of the place. Sets one at ease. Sets you at ease, thought Marshall. Yeah, yeah. So, how is the clarion these days? Oh, pulling itself together. Did you get today's? Yes, it was very good. Very neat, stylish. You brought some of that big city class here with you, I see. Hmm. Marshall suddenly didn't feel too talkative. I'm glad you're with us, Marshall. We're looking forward to a very good relationship. Well, yeah, thanks. So, what's on your mind? Marshall fidgeted just a little, then jumped to his feet. That chair made him feel too much like a microbe under a microscope. Next time I'll bring my own big desk, he thought. He walked around the office, trying to look casual. We've got a lot to cover in an hour, he began. We can always have more meetings. Yeah, sure. Well, first of all, Sandy, that's my daughter, ran off last night. We haven't heard anything. We don't know where she is. He gave Young a quick synopsis of the problem and its history, and Young listened intently with no interruptions. So, Young finally asked, you think she's turned her back on your traditional values and that disturbs you? Hey, I'm not a deeply religious person. You know what I mean. But some things have to be right and some things have to be wrong. And I have trouble with Sandy just, just jumping over the fence from one to the other like she does. Young rose majestically from his desk and walked toward Marshall with the air of an understanding father. He put his hand on Marshall's shoulder and said, Do you think she's happy, Marshall? I never see her happy, but that's probably because she's around me every time I see her. And that could be because you find it hard to understand the direction she's now choosing for her life. Obviously, you project a definite displeasure toward her philosophies. Yeah, and toward that professor lady who dumps all those philosophies on her. You ever met that, uh, what's-her-name, Professor Langstrat out at the college? Young thought, then shook his head. I think Sandy's taken a couple of courses from her now, and every quarter I find my daughter more out of touch with reality. Young chuckled a bit. Marshall? <laughs> It sounds like she's just exploring, just trying to find out about the world, about the universe she lives in. Don't you remember growing up? So many things just weren't true until you could prove them yourself. That's probably the way it is right now with Sandy. She's a very bright girl. I'm sure she just needs to explore to find herself. Well, whenever she finds out where she is, I hope she calls. Marshall, I'm sure she would feel much more free to call if she could find understanding hearts at home. It's not for us to determine what another person must do with himself or think about his place in the cosmos. Each person must find his own way, his own truth. If we're ever going to get along like any kind of civilized family on this earth, we're going to have to learn to respect the other man's right to his own views. Marshall felt a flash of deja vu as if a recording from Sandy's brain had been plugged into Young's. He couldn't help but ask, You sure you never met Professor Langstrat? Quite sure, Young answered with a smile. How about Alf Brumel? Who? Alf Brumel, the police chief. Marshall watched his face. 
Was he struggling for an answer? Young finally said, I may have met him on occasion. I was just trying to match the name with the face. Well, he thinks the way you do. Talks a lot about getting along and being peaceful. How he got to be a cop, I'll never know. But weren't we talking about Sandy? Yeah, okay. Speak on. Young spoke on. All the questions you're struggling with, the matters of right and wrong, or what truth is, or our different views of these issues, so many of these things are unknowable, save in the heart. We all feel the truth like a common heartbeat in each of us. Every human has the natural capacity for good, for love, for expecting and striving for the best interests of himself and his neighbor. I guess you weren't here for the festival. Young chuckled. I'll admit we humans can certainly misdirect our better inclinations. Say, did you make the festival, by the way? Yes, yeah, some parts of it. Most of it was of little interest to me, I'm afraid. So you didn't drop by the carnival, eh? Certainly not. It's a waste of money. But about Sandy? Yeah, we were talking about what's true in everyone's view. Like the whole subject of God, for example. She can't seem to find him. I'm just trying to pin him down. We can't agree on our religion, and so far you haven't helped much. Young smiled thoughtfully. Marshall could feel a very lofty homily coming. Your God, said Young, is where you find him. And to find him, we need only to open our eyes and realize that he is truly within all of us. We've never been without him at all, Marshall. It's just that we've been blinded by our ignorance, and that has kept us from the love, security, and meaning that we all desire. Jesus revealed our problem on the cross, remember? He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not. So, his example to us is to search for knowledge, wherever we may find it. That's what you're doing, and I'm convinced that's what Sandy's doing. The source of your problem is a narrow perspective, Marshal. You must be open-minded. You must search, and Sandy must search. So, Marshal said thoughtfully, you're saying it's all a matter of how we look at things. That would be a part of it, yes. And if I might perceive something a certain way, that doesn't mean everybody's going to see it that way, right? Yes, that's right. Young seemed very pleased with his student. So, let me see if I've got this right. If my reporter, Bernice Kruger, perceived that you, Bramel, and three other people were having some kind of little meeting behind the dart-throwing booth at the carnival, well, that was just her perception of reality. Young smiled with an odd, what are you trying to pull, grin, and answered, I suppose so, Marshal. I guess that would be a case in point. I was nowhere near the carnival, and I told you that. I abhor that kind of event. You weren't there without Bramel? No, not at all. So you see, Miss Kruger had quite an incorrect perception of someone else. Of both of you, I suppose. Young smiled and shrugged. Marshall pressed a little. What do you suppose the odds are of that happening? Young kept smiling, but his face got a little red. Marshal, what do you wish me to do, argue with you? Certainly you didn't come here for that sort of thing. Marshal took a real stab at whatever it might catch. She even took some pictures of you. Young sighed and looked for a moment at the floor. Then he said coolly, Then why don't you bring those photographs next time and then we can discuss it? The little smile on Young's face hit Marshall like spittle. Okay, Marshall muttered, not dropping his eyes. Marge will set another appointment for you. Thanks a lot. Marshall checked his watch, went to the door, and opened it. Come on in, Alf. Alf Brumell had been sitting in the reception area. At the sight of Marshall, he jumped awkwardly to his feet. He looked the way one might a split second before being hit by a train. Marshall grabbed Alf by the hand and shook that hand excitedly. 
Hey, buddy, seeing as how the two of you don't seem to know each other very well, let me introduce you. Alf Bramell, this is Reverend Oliver Young. Reverend Young, Alf Bramell, Chief of Police. Bramell didn't seem to appreciate Marshall's cordiality at all, but Young did. He stepped forward, grabbed Bramell's hand, shook it, and then pulled Bramell quickly into his office, saying over his shoulder, Marge, make another appointment for Mr. Hogan. But Mr. Hogan had left. Chapter 8 Sandy Hogan sat dismally at a small lunch table in a campus plaza shaded by an expansive grape arbor. She was staring at a slowly cooling microwave packaged hamburger and a slowly warming half-pint carton of milk. She had made her classes that morning, but they had all slipped by her, mostly unabsorbed. Her mind was too much on herself, her family, and her belligerent father. Besides, it had been a horrible way to spend the night, walking clear across town and sitting all night in the Ashton bus depot, reading from her psychology textbook. After her last class of the day, she tried to take a nap out on the lawn in the sculpture garden, and had managed to doze for a short time. When she awoke, her world was no better, and she had only two impressions, hunger and loneliness. Now, sitting at this little table with a machine-vended lunch, her loneliness was stealing away her hunger, and she was on the brink of tears. Why, Daddy, she whispered in very soft tones, dabbling her straw in her carton of milk. Why can't you just love me for what I am? How could he have been so much against her when he hardly even knew her? How could he be so adamant against her thoughts and philosophies when he couldn't even understand them? They were living in two different worlds, and each disdained the others. Last night she and her father had not said a word to each other the whole evening, and Sandy had gone to bed depressed and angry. Even as she lay there listening to her folks turning out the lights, brushing their teeth, and turning in for the night, they seemed half a world away. She wanted to call them into her room and reach out to them, but she knew it wouldn't work. Daddy would make demands and place conditions on their relationship instead of loving her, just loving her. She still didn't know what had terrified her in the pit of the night. All she could remember was waking up plagued by every fear she had ever known, fear of dying, fear of failure, fear of loneliness. She had to get out of the house. She knew even as she hastily dressed and ran out the door that it was foolish and pointless, but the feelings were greater than any common sense she could muster. Now she felt very much like some poor animal shot into space with no means of returning, floating listlessly, waiting for nothing in particular and with nothing to look forward to. Oh, Daddy, she whimpered, and then she began to cry. She let her red hair fall down like soft blinds on either side of her face, and the tears dropped one by one to the tabletop. She could hear people passing, but they chose to live in their own world and left her alone in hers. She tried to cry softly, which was hard to do when her emotions wanted to rush out of her like the cascade from a broken dam. Uh, came a soft and hesitant voice. Excuse me? Sandy looked up and saw a young man, blonde, slightly thin, with big brown eyes full of compassion. The young man said, Please forgive me for intruding, but is there anything I can do to help? It was dark in the living room of Professor Julian Langstrat's apartment, and very, very quiet. One candle on the coffee table cast a dull yellow light on the ceiling-high bookcases, the strange oriental masks, the neatly arranged furniture, and the faces of two people who sat opposite each other, the candle between them. One of the people was the professor, her head resting against the back of her chair, her eyes closed, her arms outstretched in front of her, her hands making gentle sweeping motions as if she were treading water. The man sitting opposite her was Bramell, also with eyes closed, but not mirroring Langstrat's expression and actions very well. He looked stiff and uncomfortable. At short intervals, and for a split second, he would crack his eyes open just enough to see what Langstrat was doing. 
Then she began to moan, and her face registered pain and displeasure. She opened her eyes and sat upright. Bramel looked back at her. You don't feel well today, do you? she asked. He shrugged and looked at the floor. Eh, I'm okay, just tired. She shook her head, not satisfied with his answer. No, no, it's the energy I feel from you. You're very disturbed. Bramel had no answer. Did you talk to Oliver today? She probed. He hesitated and finally said, Yeah, sure. And you went to talk to him about our relationship? That got a reaction. No, that's... Don't lie to me. He wilted a little and let out a frustrated sigh. Yeah, sure, we talked about it. We, we talked about other things, too, though. Langstrat probed him with her eyes as if doing some kind of X-ray scan. Her hands opened and began to wave in the air just slightly. Bramel tried to sink out of sight into his chair. Hey, listen, he said shakily. It's no big deal. She began to speak as if reading off a note pinned on his chest. You're frightened. You feel cornered. You went to tell Oliver. You also feel controlled. She looked at his face. Controlled? By whom? I, I don't feel controlled. She laughed a little to put him at ease. <laughs> well, of course you do. I just read it. Bramel looked for a split second toward the telephone on the end table. Did Young call you? She smiled with amusement. There was no need to. Oliver is very close to the universal mind. I'm beginning to meld with his thoughts now. Her expression hardened. Alf, I really wish you were doing as well. Bramel sighed again, hid his face behind his hands, then finally blurted, Hey, listen, I can't tackle everything at once. There's just too much to learn. She put her hand on his comfortingly. Well, then, let's deal with these things one at a time. Alf? He looked up at her. You're frightened, aren't you? What are you frightened of? You tell me and it was almost a dare. I'm giving you a chance to speak first. Well, then, I'm not frightened. At least not until this very second, when Langstrat's eyes narrowed and began to bore into him. You are indeed frightened, she said sternly. You are frightened because we were photographed the other night by that reporter from the Clarion. Isn't that right? Bramel pointed his finger at her angrily. See, now that's exactly one of the things Young and I talked about. He called you. He had to have called you. She nodded unabashed. Yes, of course he called me. He withholds nothing from me. None of us withholds truth from all the others. You know that. Bramel knew he might as well open up. I'm concerned about the plan. We're, we're getting too big, too, too big to hide anymore. We're, we're risking exposure in too many places. I, I think we were careless to meet out in public like that. But it's all been taken care of. There's nothing to worry about. Oh no. Hogan's on our scent. I suppose you know he was asking Oliver some very delicate questions. Oliver can handle himself. So, how do we handle Hogan? The same way we handle anyone else. Are you aware that he talked to Oliver about problems he's having with his daughter? You should find that interesting. What kind of problems? She's run away from home. And yet she still had the desire to be in my class today. I like the sound of that. So, how do we use it? She smiled her cunning smile. All in good time, Alf. We can't rush things. Bramel got up and began to pace. With Hogan, I'm not so sure. He may not be the pushover that Harmel was. Maybe having Kruger arrested was the wrong thing to do. But you got access to the film. 
You had it destroyed. He turned to face her. And what did that get us? Before that, they weren't asking any questions. Now they are. Come on, I know what I'd think if I got my camera back and the film was ruined. Bogan and Kruger just aren't that gullible. Langstrat spoke soothingly, putting her arms around him like the tendrils of a vine. Ah, but they are vulnerable. First to you and ultimately to me. Uh, just like everybody, he muttered. He should have expected her reaction. She grew very cold and frightening and looked right into his eyes. And that, she said, is another topic you discussed with Oliver today. He tells you everything? The masters would tell me, even if he didn't. Vermel tried to turn his eyes away from her. He couldn't stand whatever it was that made such beauty so immensely hideous. Look at me, she insisted, and Bromel obeyed. If you are not happy with our relationship, I can always have it terminated. He looked down and stuttered a bit. It's... it's okay. What? I mean, I'm happy with our relationship. Truly happy. He felt desperate to appease her, to get her to let go of him. I... I just don't want things to get out of control. She gave him a slow, vampirish kiss. You're the one who needs more control. Haven't I always taught you that? She was cutting him to pieces, and he knew it. But she had him. He belonged to her. He still had a concern he couldn't shake. But how many adversaries can we continue to remove? It seems like every time we get rid of one, bingo, another pops up in his place. Harmel went out, in came Hogan. She completed the thought for him. You took care of Farrell, and in came Henry Bush. It can't go on. The odds are against us. Bush is as good as gone. Isn't there a confidence vote this Friday? The congregation's getting good and upset, but... Yes. You know he removed Lou Stanley from the church for adultery. Ah, yes. That should help the congregation decide. A lot of them agreed with that move. She backed away in order to gaze at him better, freezing his blood with her eyes. Are you afraid of Henry Bush? Listen, he still has a lot of support in the church. More than I thought he did. You are afraid of him. Somebody's on his side. I, I don't know who. And what if he finds out about the plan? He will never find out anything. If she had fangs, they would have been showing. He will be destroyed as a minister long before then. You will see to that, won't you? I'm working on it. Do not bow to this Henry Bush. He bows to you, and you bow to me. I'm working on it, I said. She relaxed and smiled. Next Tuesday, then. Uh, we'll celebrate Bush's Friday demise. You can tell me all about it. What about Hogan? Hogan is a limp and weakened fool. Don't worry about him. Is not your responsibility. Before Bromel knew it, he was standing outside her back door. Langstrat watched him through her window until he drove off, taking the usual alley route where he would not be seen. She opened the drapes to let some light in, extinguished the candle on the coffee table, then took a folder from her desk drawer. Soon she had arranged in neat piles the life histories, personality profiles, and current photographs of Marshall, Kate, and Sandy Hogan. When her eyes fell on the photograph of Sandy, they glinted maliciously. Hovering invisibly over Langstrat's shoulder was a huge black hand adorned with jeweled rings and bracelets of gold. A deep and seductive voice spoke thoughts to her mind. Tuesday afternoon at the Clarion resembled a battlefield after everyone is either dead or retreated. The place was deathly quiet. George, the typesetter, usually took the day after publishing off to recover from the wild deadline race. Tom, the paste-up man, was out covering a local story. 
As for Edie, the secretary reporter ad girl, she had resigned and walked off the job last night. Marshall had not known that she once was happily married, but gradually became unhappily married and finally got a little thing going with a trucker that resulted in a very recent blow-up at home, with pieces of marriage flying everywhere and spouses fleeing abruptly in opposite directions. Now she was gone, and Marshall could feel the sudden void. Bernice and he sat alone in the glass-enclosed office at the back of the little newsroom ad room front office. From his second-hand ten-dollar desk, Marshall could look through the glass and survey the three desks, two typewriters, two wastebaskets, two telephones, and one coffee maker. Everything looked cluttered and busy, with papers and copy lying everywhere, but absolutely nothing was happening. I don't suppose you know where everything is, he asked Bernice. Bernice was sitting up on the work table adjacent to Marshall's desk, her back against the wall, stirring a personalized mug of hot chocolate. Oh, we'll find it all, she answered. I know where she kept the books, and I'm sure Rolodex has all the addresses and phone numbers. What about the cord to the coffee maker? Why do you think I'm drinking hot chocolate? Nuts. I wish somebody would have told me. I don't think anybody really knew. We'd better get an ad in for a new secretary this week. Edie carried more than her weight around here. I guess it was a bad blow-up. She's leaving town for good before her husband's black eyes heal up and he can see to find her. Affairs. Nothing good ever comes of them. So, have you heard the latest about Alf Bramell? Marshall looked up at her. She perched on the work table like some coy bird, trying to look more interested in her hot chocolate than in the spicy news. Under the circumstances, he said, I'm dying to hear it. I had lunch with Sarah, his secretary, today. Guess he's gone for several hours every Tuesday afternoon and never says where. But Sarah knows. Guess our friend Alf has a special girlfriend. Yeah, Julene Langstrat, psychology prof out at the college. That ruined it for Bernice. How did you know? The blonde woman you saw that night, remember? The day after one of my reporters gets busted for taking the wrong pictures at the carnival, Langstrat kicks me out of her class. Add to that Oliver Young's ears getting all red when he told me he didn't know her. You're brilliant, Hogan. Just a good guesser. She and Bramell do have something going. He calls it therapy. But I think he enjoys it, if you get my drift. So what's Young's connection to either of them? Bernice didn't hear his question. Too bad Bramell isn't already married. I could have done more with it. Hey, reset your frequency, will you? We've got a little club here, and all three of these people are members. Sorry. What we're really after is whatever it is they don't want us to know. Especially if, and I mean if, it's worth trumping up a false arrest to cover up. And destroying my film. I wonder if any of those fingerprints on the film would tell us something. Not much. They're not on file. Marshall twisted in his chair to face her more directly. All right. Who do you know? Bernice was smug. I have an uncle who's very close to Justin Parker's office. The county prosecutor? Sure. He does just about anything for me. Hey, don't bring them into this. Not yet. Bernice raised her hands as if he were pointing a gun at her and assured him. Not yet. Not yet. But I'm not saying they won't come in handy. Don't think I haven't thought of that. So, tell me this. Did Bramell ever apologize? After you bowed to him the way you did, are you kidding? No official signed apology from him in his office? Is that what he told you? Marshall had to sneer. Ah, both Bramell and Young told me all kinds of things. How they hardly knew each other, how they were never anywhere near the carnival. Boy, I just wish we had those pictures. Bernice was offended. Hey, you can believe me, Hogan. You really can. Marshall looked into space for a second or two, musing. Bramell and Langstrat. <laughs> Therapy. 
I guess that makes sense now. Come on, let's get all the pieces out on the table. What pieces, Marshall thought. How do you lay out vague feelings, strange experiences, vibes? He finally said, Uh, this Bramel and Langstrat, they're both into the same kind of thing. I can tell. What kind of thing? Marshall felt cornered. How about whammies? Bernice looked puzzled. Oh, come on, Kruger, don't make me have to explain it. She said, you'll have to explain that to me. Oh, boy, here we go, Marshall thought. Well, now it's going to sound crazy, but when I talk to each of them, and you ought to try it sometime, each of them had this weird, goony-eyed thing they did, kind of like they were hypnotizing me or something. Bernice started to crack up. Yeah, go ahead, laugh. What are you saying? That they're all into some kind of Svengali trip? I don't know how to label it yet, but yeah. Bramel's not nearly as good at it as Langstrat. He smiles too much. Young might be into it too, but he uses words. Lots of words. Bernice studied his face for just the slightest moment and then said, I think you need a good stiff drink. Would a hot chocolate do? Sure. Get me one, please. Bernice returned with another personalized mug, Edie's, full of hot chocolate. Hope it's strong enough, she said, and hopped back onto the table. So, why do those three try to look unconnected? Marshall mused. And what about the other two unknowns, Pudgy and the Ghost? You've never seen them before? Never. They could have been out-of-towners. Marshall sighed. That's a dead end. Maybe not yet. Bramel does go to that little white church, Ashton Community, and I heard somebody just got kicked out of there for shacking up or something. Bernice, that's gossip. What would you say, then, to my talking to a friend on the Whitmore faculty who might be able to tell me something about this mysterious professor lady? Marshall looked doubtful. Please don't make any more problems for me. I have enough as it is. Sandy? Back to the really tough subjects. Uh, we haven't heard a thing yet, but we're still calling around, checking with relatives and friends. We're sure she'll come home sooner or later. Isn't she in Langstrat's class? Marshall answered with some bitterness. She's been in several of Langstrat's classes. Then he paused. Don't you think we might be blurring the line between unbiased journalism and personal vengeance? Bernice shrugged. I'll only find out what's really there, and it'll be news or it won't be. In the meantime, I, I thought perhaps you'd appreciate a little background. Marshall couldn't shake off the memory of his encounter with the fiery Julian Langstrat, and he hurt more deeply every time he recalled the professor's ideas coming at him through the mouth of his own daughter. If it's a stone, turn it over, he said finally. On my time or the clarions? Just turn it over, he said and started pounding his typewriter. Chapter 9 That evening, Marshall and Kate sat three places at the dinner table. It was an act of faith, trusting that Sandy would be there just as she always had been. They had called everyone they knew, but no one had seen Sandy anywhere. The police hadn't turned up anything. They had called the college to check whether or not Sandy had been to her classes that day, but... So far, none of her professors or teaching assistants could be reached for a definite answer. Marshall sat at the table, staring at Sandy's empty chair. Kate sat across from him, silent, waiting for the rice to steam. Marshall, she said, don't torture yourself. I blew it. I'm a washout. Oh, stop it. And the problem is, now that I know I blew it, there isn't much chance of a retake. 
Kate reached across the table and took his hand. There certainly is. She'll come back. She's old enough to be reasonable and take care of herself. I mean, just look at how much she took with her. She can't be planning on being gone indefinitely. Just then the doorbell rang. They both jumped a little. Yeah, said Marshall. Go ahead, be the mailman or a Girl Scout selling cookies or Jehovah's Witness. Well, Sandy wouldn't ring the doorbell anyway. Kate got up to answer the door, but Marshall hurried ahead of her. They both reached the door at about the same time, and Marshall opened it. Neither of them expected a young man, blonde and neat, college material. He carried no leaflets or religious propaganda and seemed shy. Uh, Mr. Hogan, he asked. Yeah, said Marshall. Who are you? The young man was quiet but assertive enough to do business. My name is Sean Ormsby. I'm a junior at Whitmore and a friend of your daughter Sandy. Kate started to say, Well, please come in. But Marshall interrupted with, Do you know where she is? Sean paused and then answered carefully, uh, Yes, yes, I do. Well, said Marshall, May I come in? he asked politely. Kate nodded graciously, stepping aside and almost pushing Marshall aside. Yes, please do. They showed him into the living room and let him have a seat. Kate held Marshall's hand just long enough to get him into a chair and silently remind him to control himself. Thank you very much for coming, Kate said. We've been very concerned. Marshall's voice was controlled as he said, What have you got? Sean was visibly uncomfortable. I, I met her on campus yesterday. She went to school yesterday, Marshall blurted, startled. Let him talk, Marshall, Kate reminded him. Well, said Sean, yes, yes, she did. But I met her in Jones Plaza, an outdoor eating area. She was by herself and so visibly upset that... Well, I, I just felt I had to get involved. Marshall was sitting on pins and needles. What do you mean, visibly upset? Is she okay? Oh, oh yes, she's perfectly all right. That is, she hasn't come to any harm. But I'm here on her behalf. This time both parents were listening without interrupting, so Sean continued. We talked for quite a while, and she told me her side of the story. She really does want to come home. I should tell you that first. But, Marshall prompted, Well, Mr. Hogan, that's the first thing I tried to persuade her to do. But if you can accept this, she feels afraid to come back. And I think a little ashamed. Because of me? Sean was walking on some very thin ice. Can you... Are you able to accept that? Marshall was ready to be tough on himself. Yeah, I can accept that all right. I've been asking for it for years. I had it coming. Sean looked relieved. Well, that's what I'm trying in my own weak, limited way to accomplish. I'm no professional. My major's geology. But I just like to see this family together again. Kate said humbly, We would too. Yeah, said Marshall, we, we really want to work on it. Listen, Sean, you get to know me, and you realize I came out of a pretty bent mold, and I'm really tough to straighten out. No, you didn't, Kate protested. Yeah, yeah, I did. But I'm learning all the time. I want to keep on learning. He leaned forward in his chair. Say, I take it Sandy sent you here to see us. Sean looked out the window. She's out in the car right now. Kate was on her feet immediately. Marshall grabbed her hand and settled her back into her seat. Hey, he said, who's being over-anxious now? He turned to Sean. How is she? Is she still afraid? Does she think I'm going to jump on her? Sean nodded meekly. Well said Marshall, feeling emotions he didn't really want anyone to see. Listen, uh, tell her I won't 
jump on her. I, I won't yell. I won't accuse. I, I won't get sly or nasty. I just, well, I, I. He loves her, Kate said for him. He really does. Do you, sir? Sean asked. Marshall nodded. Tell me, said Sean. Say it. Marshall looked right in his eyes. I love her, Sean. She's my kid, my daughter. I love her and I want her back. Sean smiled and rose from his seat. I'll bring her in. That evening there were four place settings at the table. The Friday edition of the Clarion was on the streets, and the usual post-publication lull around the office gave Bernice the chance she needed to do some hoofing. She had been waiting eagerly for a chance to get over to Whitmore College to talk to some people. A few phone calls had landed her an important lunch appointment. The North Campus Cafeteria was a new addition, a modern red brick structure with floor-to-ceiling blue-tinted windows and carefully kept flower gardens. One could eat inside at a small two- or four-person table or sit on the patio in the sunshine. The format was buffet, and the food wasn't bad. Bernice stepped onto the patio carrying a tray with coffee and a light salad. Alongside her was Ruth Williams, a cheerful middle-aged professor in economics carrying a taco salad. They chose a secluded table in the semi-shade. For the first half of their meal, they indulged in small talk and general catching up. But Williams knew Bernice pretty well by now. Bernice, she said at last, I can tell you have something on your mind. Bernice was able to be honest with her friend. Ruth, it's something unprofessional and distasteful. Do you mean to say you've uncovered something new? Oh, no, not about Pat. No, that subject's been dormant for quite some time. You can be sure it will reawaken if anything new comes up, though. Bernice looked at Williams for a long moment. You don't think I'll ever find anything, do you? Bernice, you know that I support you in your efforts 100%, but with that support, I must add my sincere doubts that your efforts will ever uncover anything. It was just so futile, so tragic. Bernice shrugged. Well, that's why I'm trying to focus my efforts only where they'll do some good. Which brings me to the uncomfortable subject for the day. Did you know I was arrested in jail Sunday night? Williams was, of course, incredulous. Jailed? Whatever for? Soliciting an undercover cop for an act of prostitution. That brought the right response from Williams. Bernice went on to tell her as much of the indignities as she could remember. I can't believe it, Williams kept saying. That's disgusting. I can't believe it. Well, anyway, Bernice said, bringing in the punchline, I feel I have good cause to question Mr. Brumell's motives. Mind you, I only have theory and speculation, but I want to chase these things to their end to, to see if anything really lies behind them. Well, I can understand that. And what could I possibly know that would help you? Have you ever met Professor Julian Langstrat over in the psychology department? Oh, once or twice. We shared a table at a faculty luncheon. Bernice caught a glint of distaste in William's expression. Hmm, something wrong with her? Well, to each his own, said William, stirring her salad absent-mindedly with her fork. But I found her very difficult to relate to. It was next to impossible to start any coherent conversation. How does she carry herself? Is she forceful, retiring, assertive, obnoxious? Aloof, for one thing, and I guess mysterious. Although I use that word for lack of one better... I get the impression that people are nothing but a bore to her. Her academic interests are very esoteric and metaphysical, and she seems to prefer them to bland reality. What kind of company does she keep? I wouldn't know. I'd almost be surprised to find her consorting with anyone at all. So you've never seen her in the company of Alf Brumell? Oh, and this must be the ultimate goal of your questions. 
No, never at all. But I guess you don't see her much anyway. She's not very social, so no. But listen, I really try to mind my own business, if you catch my meaning. I would definitely like to help you in any way I can to satisfy yourself concerning Pat's death, but what you're after this time is unprofessional and distasteful. Yes, you certainly were right on that score. But accompanied with my own advice to disengage yourself from this thing, let me, as a friend, refer you to someone who might know more. Have your pencil ready? His name is Albert Darr, and he's in the psychology department. From what I've heard, mostly from him, he rubs shoulders with Langstrat every day. Doesn't like her at all, and loves to gossip. <laughs> I'll even go so far as to call him for you. Albert Darr, a baby-faced young professor with stylish clothes and a certain penchant for ladies, just happened to be in his office grading papers. He had time to talk, especially to the lovely reporter from the Clarion. Well, hello, hello, he said as Bernice came in the door. Well, hello, hello yourself, she responded. Bernice Kruger, the friend of Ruth Williams. Uh, he looked to and fro for an empty chair and finally moved a pile of reference books. But <laughs> have a seat. Pardon the mess. He sat down on another pile of books and papers that might have had a chair under it. What can I do for you? Well, this isn't really an official visit, Professor Dar. Albert. Thank you, Albert. I'm actually here on a personal matter, but if my theories are right, it could be important in a newsworthy sense. She paused to indicate a new paragraph and a difficult question. Now, Ruth tells me you know Julian Langstrat. Dar suddenly smiled broadly, leaned back in his piled-up chair, and rested his hands behind his neck. This was going to be an enjoyable subject for him, it seemed. Ah, he said gleefully. So you dare to infringe on sacred ground. Dar looked around the room in mock suspicion, searching for imaginary eavesdroppers, then leaned forward and said in a lord voice, Listen, there are certain things no one is supposed to know, not even myself. Then he brightened up again and said, But our dear professor has had many an occasion to hurt and slight me, and therefore I feel indebted to her, not in the least. I'm dying to answer your questions. Evidently, Bernice could just dive right in. This guy didn't seem to need formalities. Okay, to begin with, she said, readying her pen and pad, I'm really trying to find out about Alf Brumel, the chief of police. I've been informed that he and Langstrat see a lot of each other. Can you verify that? Oh, definitely. So, they do have something going. What do you mean, something? You fill in the blank. If you mean a romantic fling, he smiled and shook his head. Oh, dear. I don't know if you'll like this answer, but... No, I don't think anything like that's going on. But he does see her quite regularly. Oh, yes. But a lot of people do. She gives consultations in her off hours. Tell me now, doesn't Bramel see her on a weekly basis? With ebbing spirit, Bernice answered... Yes, every Tuesday, on the dot. Well, there, you see. He goes to her for regular weekly sessions. But why won't he tell anybody? He's very secretive about it. He leaned forward and lowered his voice. Everything Langstrat does is a deep, dark secret. The inner circle, Bernice. No one is even supposed to know about these so-called consultations. No one but the privileged, the elite, the powerful, the many special patrons that go to her. That's the way she is. But what's she up to? Mind you now, he said with a mischievous glint in his eye. This is privileged information, and I might also caution you that it is not entirely reliable. I know very little of this from direct observation. Most of it I've just managed to pick up around the department here. Fortunately, Professor Langstrat has made enough enemies that few of the staff feel any commitment or loyalty to her. 
He repositioned himself into an eye-to-eye -eye posture. Bernice, Professor Langstrat is, how should I say it, not a ground-level person. Her areas of study go beyond anything the rest of us have had any desire to tamper with. The source, the universal mind, the ascended planes. I'm afraid I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, none of us know what she's talking about either. Some of us are very concerned. We don't know if she's very brilliant and making some real breakthroughs or if she's somewhat deranged. Well, what is all this stuff, this source and this mind? All right. Uh, as nearly as we can tell, she derives it from the Eastern religions, the old mystic cults and writings, things I know nothing about and don't want to know anything about. As far as I'm concerned, her studies in these areas have caused her to lose all contact with reality. As a matter of fact, I may even be mocked and maligned among my peers for saying this, but I don't see Langstrat's advances in these areas as anything other than foolish neo-pagan witchcraft. I think she's desperately confused. Bernice now recalled to mind Marshall's strange descriptions of Langstrat. I've heard she does strange things to people. Foolishness. Sheer foolishness. I think she believes she can read my mind, control me, put spells on me, whatever. I simply dismiss it and try very hard to be elsewhere. But does any of it have credence? Absolutely not. The only people she can control or affect are the poor dupes in the inner circle who are stupid and gullible enough to... The inner circle? You used that term before. He held up his hand to caution her. No facts, no facts. I coined that title myself. All I have is a two here and a two there, which makes a very persuasive four. I've heard her admit that she counsels these people who come to her, and I've noticed that some of them are quite important. But how could a counselor with such warped ideas possibly straighten out anyone else? <laughs> then again... Yes... I would expect her to claim a special advantage in such a situation. Who knows? Maybe she holds seances and mind-reading sessions. Maybe she cooks slug tails and newt's eyes and serves them with breaded spider legs to evoke some answer from the supernatural. Oh, but now I'm getting facetious. But you do see this as a possibility. Well, not nearly as bizarre as I've described, but yes, something along those lines, in keeping with her occult interests. And these people in the inner circle see her regularly? As far as I know, I really have no idea how it's set up or why people even go. What on earth could they be getting out of it? Can you give me some for instances? Well, he thought for a moment. Of course, we've already mentioned and verified you're Mr. Brumell. Oh, and you might know of Ted Harmel. Bernice just about dropped her pen. Ted? Yes, the former editor of the Clarion. I worked for him before he left and Hogan bought the paper. Uh, the way I understand it, Mr. Harmel didn't just leave. No, he fled, but who else? Mrs. Pinkston, a trustee on the Board of Regents. Ah, so it's not just men. No, certainly not. Bernice kept writing. Go on, go on. Oh, dear, who else? Uh, I think Dwight Brandon. Who's Dwight Brandon? Dar looked at her condescendingly. He only owns the property the college is built on. Oh. She wrote the name down with a bold-lettered explanation. Oh, and then there's Eugene Baylor. He's General Treasurer, a very influential man on the Board of Regents, I understand. It seems he's been needled just a little about what it is he and the professor do in their sessions together, but he remains self-righteous and steadfast in his convictions. Hmm. Ah, and there's also that reverend fellow, that, uh... Oliver Young? 
How did you know? Bernice only smiled. A lucky guess. Carry on. Chapter 10 On Friday evening, Hank couldn't get the upcoming business meeting off his mind, which was probably to his advantage, considering the young lady sitting across from him in his little office corner of the house. He had asked Mary to stick closely around and act very loving and wifely. This young lady, Carmen was the only name she gave, was quite a caseload. The way she dressed and carried herself, Hank made sure that it was Mary who answered her knock at the door and let her in. But as far as Hank could tell, Carmen wasn't trying to put on a facade. She seemed real enough, just sincerely overdone. And as for her reasons for wanting counseling, I think, she began, I think I'm just very lonely and that's why I keep hearing voices. Immediately she examined their faces for their reaction. But after their recent experiences, nothing sounded too far out to Hank and Mary. Hank asked, What kind of voices? What kind of things do they say? She thought for a moment, searching the ceiling with big, overly innocent blue eyes. What I'm experiencing is legitimate, she said. I'm not crazy. No problem there, Hank said. But tell us about these voices. When do they talk to you? When I'm alone, especially. Like last night, I was lying in bed and... She related the words the voice spoke to her, and it could have been a perfect script for an obscene phone call. Mary didn't know what to say. This was becoming heavy. To Hank, it sounded kind of familiar, and though he felt very cautious about Carmen and her motives, he still remained open to the possibility that she was encountering some of the same demonic forces he'd been dealing with. Carmen, he asked, do these voices ever say who they are? She thought for a moment. I think one of them was Spanish or Italian. He had an accent, and his name was... A mono or a monzo or something like that. He always spoke very soothingly and always said he wanted to make love to me. Just then the phone rang. Mary quickly got up to answer it. Hurry back, said Hank. She hurried away, that was for sure. Hank was watching her go when he felt Carmen touching his hand. You don't think I'm crazy, do you? She asked with pleading eyes. Uh... Hank withdrew his hand to scratch a non-existent itch. <laughs> no, Carmen, I'm not... I, I mean, I don't. But I do want to know where these voices came from. When did you first start hearing them? When I came to Ashton. My husband left me and I came here to start over, but... I get so lonely. You first started hearing them when you came to Ashton. I think it was because I was lonely... And I still am lonely. What was it they said at first? How did they introduce themselves? I was alone and lonely. I'd, I'd just moved here, and I, I thought I heard Jim's voice. You know, my husband. Go on. I really thought it was him. I didn't even think about how he could talk to me without being there. But I talked back, and he told me how much he missed me, and how he thought it would be better this way, and he spent the rest of the night with me. She began to shed some tears. It was beautiful. Hank didn't know what to make of this. Incredible, was all he could say. She looked at him with those big pleading eyes again, and said through her tears, I knew you'd believe me. I've heard about you. They say you're a very compassionate man and very understanding. Depends on who you listen to, Hank thought. But then her hand was touching his again. Time to call a recess, Hank thought. Um, he said, trying to be comforting, sincere, and nonjudgmental. Uh, listen, I, I think it's been a fruitful hour. Oh, yes. Would you like to come again next week sometime? Oh, I'd love to, she exclaimed, as if Hank had asked her for a date. I've so much more to tell you. Well, okay, I think next Friday will be fine for me if it's fine for you. Oh, it was, it was, and Hank stood up to give her the hint that the session was over for now. 
They hadn't covered much ground, but as far as Hank was concerned, boy, was it enough. Now, let's both take some time to think about these things. After a week, they may be a little clearer to us. They might make more sense. Where, oh, where was Mary? Ah, she came back into the room. Oh, leaving so soon? It was wonderful, Carmen sighed, but at least she had let go of Hank's hand. Getting Carmen out the door was easier than Hank had expected. Good old Mary, what a lifesaver. Hank closed the door and leaned against it. Phew, was all he could say. Hank, Mary said in a very hushed voice, I don't think I like this. She's, <laughs> she's a real hot one, she is. What do you think of what she said? Uh, I'll uh, wait and see. Who was that on the phone? Just wait till you hear this. It was some lady from the Clarion wanting to know if it was Alf Bramell we disfellowshipped from the church. Hank suddenly looked like an inflatable toy that had sprung a leak. A little disappointed, Bernice walked into Marshall's office. Marshall was at his desk going over some new advertising copy for Tuesday's edition. So what'd they say? he asked her without looking up. Nope, it isn't Brumel, and I guess it wasn't a very tactful question. I talked to the pastor's wife, and by her tone of voice, I can infer that the whole subject is very touchy. Yeah, I've heard talk at the barber shop. Some guy was saying they're going to vote the pastor out tonight. Ah, so they do have troubles. But totally unrelated to ours. And I'm glad it's gone far enough. Marshall looked again at the list of names Bernice had gotten from Albert Dar. How am I supposed to get any work done around here with this kind of stuff hanging around unresolved? Bertie, you're getting to be a lot of trouble, you know that? She took it as a compliment. And have you looked over that flyer of elective courses Langstrat is teaching? Marshall picked it up from his desk and could only shake his head incredulously. What in blazes is all this stuff? Introduction to God and goddess consciousness and the craft, the divinity of man, witch, warlock, the, the sacred medicine wheel, how do spells and rituals work? <laughs> you got to be kidding. Read on, boss. Pathways to your inner light. Meet your own spiritual guides. Discover the light within. Harmonize your mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual levels of being through hypnosis and meditation. Marshall read a little further and then exclaimed, What? How to enjoy the present by experiencing past and future lives? I like that one near the bottom there. In the beginning was the goddess. Langstrat, perhaps? Why hasn't anyone heard all this before? For some reason, it was never advertised in the school paper or in the public list of classes. Albert Dar gave me the flyer himself and said it was a somewhat exclusive pass-around item among the interested students. And my little Sandy is sitting in this woman's class. And in a way, so are all those people on the list. Marshall set down the flyer and picked up the list. He shook his head again. It was all he could think of to do. Bernice added, I guess I don't mind it too much if a bunch of dupes want to be taken in by this Langstrat, but they're all too important. Just look at that. Two of the college regents, the owner of the college land, the county comptroller, the district judge. And young... Respected, revered, influential community involved Oliver Young. Marshall let some memory tapes play in his head. It fits. It makes sense now. All that vague, noncommittal stuff he was handing me in his office. Young's got a religion all his own. He's no hard shell Baptist, I'll tell you that. Religion I don't care about. Lies and cover-ups I do. Well, he most certainly denied knowing Langstrat. I asked him directly right to his face, and he told me he didn't know her. Somebody's lying, Bernice sing-songed. 
but I just wish we had some more corroboration. Yeah, we've only just met Dar. What about Ted Harmel? How well did you know him? Well enough, I suppose. You heard why he left. Marshall sneered just a bit. Harmel said there was some kind of scandal. But who can you believe these days? Ted denied it. Oh, everybody's saying everything and everybody's denying everything. Well, call him anyway. I have the number. He's living up near Windsor now. I think he's trying to be a hermit. Marshall looked at all the advertising copies still on his desk, awaiting his time and attention. How am I going to get any of this stuff done around here? Hey, it's no biggie. If I could do some independent hoofing, the least you can do is give Ted a call. Do it tomorrow. Saturday, your day off. Reporter to reporter, newsman to newsman. You might hit it off with him. Marshall sighed. Uh, let's have the number. <laughs> Mary finished the dinner dishes, put up the towel, and made her way through the little house to the back bedroom. There in the dark, Hank knelt beside the bed in prayer. She knelt down beside him, took his hand, and together they placed themselves in the hands of the Lord. God's will would be done this night, and they would accept it, whatever it was. Alf Brumel had a key to the church and was already there, switching on the lights and turning up the thermostat. He wasn't feeling well at all. They just better vote right this time, he kept thinking. Outside, even though it was still a half hour before the meeting, cars began to arrive, more than were usually there on Sundays. Sam Turner, Brumel's chief cohort, drove up in his big Cadillac and helped his wife Helen from the car. He was a rancher of sorts, not a land baron, but he acted like one. Tonight he was grim and determined, as was his wife. In another car came John Coleman and his wife Patricia, a quiet couple who came to Ashton Community after leaving a large church elsewhere in town. They really liked Hank and made no effort to hide it. They knew well that Alf Brumel would not be happy to see them there. Others arrived and quickly coagulated into little clusters of similar sentiment, speaking in quick syllables and hushed tones and keeping their eyes to themselves, except for a few rubbernecking nose counters trying to foresee the final tally. Several dark shadows kept a wary eye on everything from their perch atop the church roof, their stations around the building, or their appointed posts in the sanctuary. Lucius, more nervous than ever, paced and hovered about. Baal Rafar, still wanting a very low profile, had entrusted this task to him, and for this night at least Lucius was back in his old glory. What worried Lucius the most were the other spirits standing around, the enemies of the cause, the host of heaven. They were held at bay by Lucius's forces, to be sure, but there were some new ones he had never seen before. Nearby, but not too near, Signa and his two warriors kept watch. Upon Tal's orders, they allowed demons access to the building, but monitored the demons' activities and kept an eye out for Rafar. So far, their very presence, as well as the presence of so many other warriors, had had a taming effect on the demonic hosts. There had been no incidents, and for now that was all Tal wanted. When Lucius saw the Colemans come in the front door, he was agitated. In the past, they had never been very strong against the defeats and discouragements Lucius had ordered, and their marriage had just about dissolved. Then they aligned themselves with praying Bush, hearing his words and becoming stronger all the time. Before long, they and others like them would be a real threat. But their arrival didn't cause Lucius as much agitation as the huge, blond-haired messenger of God who accompanied them. Lucius knew for sure he'd never seen this one before. As the Colemans found a seat, Lucius swooped down and accosted this new intruder. "'I've not seen you before,' he said gruffly, and all the other spirits focused their attention on him and the stranger. "'From where do you come?' The stranger, Kaiman of Europe, said nothing. He only riveted his eyes on those of Lucius and stood firm. "'I'll have your name,' Lucius demanded. The stranger said not a word. Lucius smiled slyly and nodded. "'You are deaf, yes, and dumb. 
and as mindless as you are silent. The other demons guffawed. They loved this kind of game. Tell me, are you a good fighter? Silence. Lucius drew a scimitar that flashed blood red and droned metallically. On cue, all the other demons did the same. The clatter and ring of burnished blades filled the room as crimson crescents of reflected light danced about the walls. The other messengers of God were barred from intervening by an armed ring of demons as Lucius continued to toy with this one single newcomer. Lucius peered at his solid, unmoving opponent with a burning hatred that made his yellow eyes bulge and his sulfurous breath chug out through widely flared nostrils. He toyed with his sword, waved it in small circles in the stranger's face, watched for the stranger to make the slightest move. The stranger only watched him, not moving at all. With an intense cry, Lucius swept his sword across the front of the stranger, slashing his garment. Cheers and laughter came from the crowd of demons. Lucius, poised for a fight, held his sword with both hands, crouched, his wings flared. Before him stood a statue with a slashed tunic. Fight, you listless spirit, Lucius challenged. The stranger did not respond, and Lucius cut his face. Another cheer from the demons. Shall I remove an ear or two? Shall I cut out your tongue if you have one? Lucius taunted. I think it's time we got started, said Alf Bramel from the pulpit. The people in the room stopped their hushed conversations and the place began to quiet down. Lucius leered at the stranger and motioned with his sword. Go stand with the other cowards. The newcomer stepped back then took his place with the other messengers of God behind the demonic barricade. Eleven angels had managed to get into the church without raising too much ire from the demons. Triscal and Creone had already entered with Hank and Mary. They had often been seen with the pastor and his wife, so they were not paid much attention other than the usual threatening expressions and postures. Gilo was there, as big and threatening as ever, but apparently no demons were the slightest bit interested in asking him any questions. A newcomer, a burly Polynesian, made his way over to Kaiman and tended the wound in Kaiman's face while Kaiman repaired the slash in his tunic. Moda, called here from Polynesia, came the introduction. Kaiman of Europe, welcome to our numbers. Can you continue? Mota asked. I will continue, Kaiman answered, skillfully reweaving his tunic with his fingers. Where is Tal? Not here yet. A demon of fever tried to stop the Colemans. No doubt Tal has encountered an attack on Duster. I don't know how he'll ward it off without making himself visible. He'll do it, Kaiman looked about. I don't see the Baal Prince anywhere. We may never. And may he never see Tal. Brumel brought the meeting to order, standing behind the pulpit and looking out over the nearly fifty people who had gathered. From this vantage point, even he couldn't help but try to guess the final tally. Some of the people were definitely going to give Hank the axe. Some were definitely not going to. And then there was that frustrating and unpredictable group he couldn't be sure about. I want to thank you all for coming tonight, he said. This is a painful matter for us to decide. I'd always hoped that this night would never come, but we all want God's will to be done, and we want what will be best for his people. So let us open with a word of prayer and commit the rest of the evening to his care and guidance. With that, Bramel began a very pious prayer, appealing to the Lord for grace and mercy and words to bring a tear to the driest eye. In the front corner of the sanctuary, Gilo sulked, wishing an angel could spit on a human. Triscal asked Kaiman, Getting any strength? Kaiman answered, Why? Is somebody else going to pray? Bramel finished his prayer. The roomful muttered a few amens, and then he went on with his introduction to the proceedings. The purpose of this meeting is to openly discuss our feelings regarding Pastor Hank, to put an end once and for all to all the backbiting and murmuring that's been going on. 
and to end our meeting with a final vote of confidence. I would hope that we would all have the mind of the Lord in these matters. If you have something you wish to say to the group, we would ask that you limit your time to three minutes. I'll be letting you know when your time is up, so keep that in mind. Bromel looked at Hank and Mary. I think it would be good to let the pastor have the first say. Afterwards, he'll leave us alone so we can talk freely. Mary squeezed Hank's hand as he got up. He went to the pulpit and stood behind it, gripping its sides. For the longest time, he couldn't say a word, but only looked into every eye of every face. He suddenly realized how much he truly loved these people, all of them. He could see the hardness in some of the faces, but he couldn't help seeing past that to the pain and bondage these people were under. Deluded, led astray by sin, by greed, by bitterness and rebellion. In many other faces he could read the pain they were feeling for him. He could tell that some were silently praying for God's mercy and intervention. Hank let a quick prayer course through his thoughts as he began. I have always counted it a privilege to stand behind this sacred desk, to preach the word and speak the truth. He surveyed their faces again for just a moment and then continued. And even tonight I feel I cannot stray from God's commission to me and the purpose for which I have ever stood before you. I am not here to defend myself or my ministry. Jesus is my advocate, and I rest the course of my life on his grace, guidance, and mercy. So tonight, since I am standing behind this pulpit once again, let me share with you what I have received from God. Hank opened his Bible and read from Second Timothy chapter 4. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, and will turn away their ears from the truth, and will turn aside to myths. But you, be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Hank closed his Bible, looked about the room, and spoke firmly. Let each of us apply God's word where it may apply. Tonight I will speak only for myself. I have my call from God. I just read it. Some of you I know have really gotten the impression that Hank Bush is obsessed with the gospel, that it's all he ever thinks about. Well, that's true. Sometimes I even wonder why I remain in such a difficult position, such an uphill effort. But for me, God's call on my life is an inescapable commission. And as Paul said, Woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. I understand that sometimes the truth of God's word can become a divider, an irritation, a, a stone of stumbling. But that's only because it remains unchanged, uncompromising, and steadfast. And what better reason could there be to build our lives on such an immovable foundation? To violate the word of God is only to destroy ourselves, our joy, our peace, our happiness. I want to be fair with you, and so I'll be truthful in letting you know exactly what you may expect from me. I intend to love all of you no matter what. I intend to shepherd and feed you for as long as you'll have me. I will not discredit, compromise, or turn my back on what I believe the Word of God teaches. And that means that there may be times when you'll feel my shepherd's crook around your neck. Not to judge or malign you, but to help you move in the right direction, to protect you, to heal you. I intend to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, for that is my calling. I have a burden for this town. Sometimes I feel that burden so strongly I have to ask myself why. But it's still there, and I can't turn my back on it or 
try to deny it. Until the Lord tells me otherwise, I intend to remain in Ashton to answer that burden. If that's the kind of pastor you want, then you can let me know tonight. If you do not want that kind of pastor, well, I really need to know that, too. I love all of you. I want the very best God has to give you. And I guess that's all I have to say. Hank stepped down from the platform, took Mary's hand, and the two of them walked down the aisle to the door. Hank tried to catch the eyes of as many people as he could. Some gave looks of love and encouragement. Some looked away. Creone and Triscall left with Hank and Mary. Lucius watched with mocking disdain. Gilo muttered to his fellows, While the cat's away, the mice will play. Where is Tal? Kaiman asked again. Bermel stood before the group. We'll now hear statements from the congregation. Just raise your hand to be recognized. Yeah, Sam, why don't you go first? Sam Turner stood and walked to the front of the sanctuary. Thanks, Alf, he said. Well, I've no doubt you all know me and my wife, Helen. We've been citizens of this community for over 30 years, and we've supported this church through thick and through thin. Now, I don't have a lot to say tonight. You all know what kind of man I am. I believe in loving one's neighbor and living a good life. I've tried to do right and be a good example of what a Christian ought to be. And I'm angry tonight. I'm angry for my friend, Lou Stanley. You may notice Lou isn't here tonight, and I'm sure I know why. Used to be he could show his face in this church and be a part of it. And we all loved him, and he loved us. And I think we all still do. But this Bush fellow, who thinks he's God's gift to this earth, thought he had a right to judge Lou and kick him out of the church. Now, friends, let me tell you one thing. Nobody kicks Lou Stanley out of anything if Lou doesn't feel like it. And the very fact that Lou went along with this whole smear on his character only shows the goodness of his heart. He could have sued Bush by now, or he could have settled a matter like I've seen him settle other matters. He's not afraid of anything. But I just think Lou's so ashamed of the horrible things that have been said about him, and so hurt by what he thinks we must think of him, that he decided he'd better just stay away. Now we have this self-righteous, Bible-pounding, gossip-monger to blame for these troubles. Well, forgive me if I sound a bit harsh. But listen, I can remember when this church was like a family. How long now since it's been that way? Look what's happened. Here we are, having a big bicker meeting, and why? Because we let Hank Bush come in here and stir us all up. Ashton used to be a peaceful town. This church used to be a peaceful church. And I say we do what's necessary to get it that way again. Turner took his seat as a few nearby nodded their silent encouragement and approval. John Coleman was recognized next. A shy person, he was very nervous about speaking in front of everyone, but concerned enough to do it anyway. Well, he said nervously, handling his Bible and looking at the floor a lot, I don't usually say much, and I'm scared to death to be standing up here, but... I think Hank Bush is a real man of God, a good pastor, and I'd really hate to see him go. The church Pat and I came from, well, it just wasn't meeting our needs, and we were getting hungry. Hungry for the word, for the presence of God. We, we thought we'd found those things here, and we were really looking forward to being involved and growing in the Lord under Hank's ministry. And, and I know a lot of other folks feel that way, too. As far as this stuff about Lou is concerned, that was not just Hank's doing. All of us were involved in that decision, including me. And I know Hank's not trying to hurt anybody. As John sat down, Patricia patted his arm and said, You did fine. John was not sure. Bromel addressed the group. I think it might be a good idea for us to hear what the church secretary, Gordon Mayer, has to say. Gordon Mayer went to the front with some of the church records and minutes in his hand. He was a tense man with a tight expression and gruff voice. 
I have two items I'd like to address before this group, he said. First of all, from the business side, you all need to be aware that the offerings have been decreasing over the past several months. But our bills have been staying steady, if not going up. In other words, we're running out of money, and I personally have no doubts why. There are differences among us we really need to get resolved, and withholding your giving is not the way to do it. If you have a gripe against the pastor, then do whatever you have to do tonight. But let's not bring the whole church down over this one man. Secondly, for whatever it's worth, let me tell you that the original pulpit committee was considering another man for the job. I was on that committee. I can assure you that they had no intention of recommending Bush for the office. I'm convinced the whole thing was a fluke, a grave mistake. We voted in the wrong man. Now we're paying for it. So, let me close with this. Sure, we've made a mistake, but I have faith in the group here, but I think we can turn the whole thing around and start doing things right for change. I say, let's do it. And so the evening went for the better part of two hours, as both sides took turns in crucifying and praising Hank Bush. Nerves got raw, bottoms got numb, backs got sticky, and the opposing views became more and more vehement in their convictions. After two hours, a common sentiment began to mutter its way around the room. Come on, let's have the vote. Brumel had taken his jacket off, loosened his tie, and rolled up his sleeves. He was gathering a pile of small squares of paper, the ballots. Okay, this will be by secret ballot, he said, handing the slips of paper to two quickly appointed ushers who passed them out. Let's just keep it simple. If you want to keep the pastor, say yes. If you want to find someone else, say no. Mota nudged Kaiman. Will Hank have enough votes? Kaiman only shook his head. We're not sure. You mean he could lose? Let us hope someone is praying. Where, oh, where is Tal? Writing a simple yes or no didn't take long. So almost immediately, the ushers were passing the offering plates among the people. Gylo stood still in his corner, glaring at as many demons as would look at him. Some of the smaller, harassing spirits flitted about the sanctuary, trying to see what people were marking on their ballots and grinning, scowling, cheering, or cursing accordingly. Gylo could envision three or four of their wiry little necks in his fists. Some day soon, little demons. Some day soon. Brumel took charge again. All right, in the interest of fairness, let's have representatives from the two different uh, uh, viewpoints come up and do the counting. After a bit of nervous chuckling, John Coleman was selected by the yeas and Gordon Mayer by the nays to count the ballots. The two men took the offering plates full of ballots to a back pew. A flock of flapping, hissing demons converged on the scene, wanting to see the outcome. Gylo stepped out, too. It was only fair, he thought. Lucius swooped down from the ceiling in an instant and hissed, Get back in your corner. I wish to see the outcome. Oh, don't you now, Lucius sneered. And what if I decide to cut you open as I did your friend? Something about the way Gylo answered, Try it. May have caused Lucius to reconsider. Gylo's approach sent the little demons fluttering away like a flock of chickens. He bent over the two men to have a look. Gordon Mayer was counting first, silently, then handing the ballots to John Coleman. But he stealthily hid a few yay ballots in his palm. Gylo checked to see how closely the demons were watching, then made a stealthy move himself, touching the back of Mayer's hand. A demon saw it and struck Gylo's hand with bared talons. Gylo jerked his hand away and came infinitely close to tearing the demon to shreds, but he caught himself and honored Tal's orders. What is your name? Gylo wanted to know. Cheating, the demon answered. Cheating. Gylo rehearsed as he went back to his corner. Cheating. But Gylo's move had succeeded in foiling Mayer's effort. The ballots dropped out of Mayer's hand, and John Coleman saw them. You dropped something there, he said very sweetly. 
Mayer couldn't say anything. He just handed the ballots over. The count was finished, but Mayer wanted to count again. They counted the ballots again. The count came out the same. A tie. The two reported the result to Brumel, who told the congregation, which moaned quietly. Alf Brumel could feel his hands getting very damp. He tried drying them on his handkerchief. Well, listen, he said. There may not be much chance that any of you will reconsider, but I'm sure none of us wants to prolong this thing past tonight. I tell you what, why don't we take a short break and give some of you a chance to get up, stretch, use the restroom. Then we'll regather and vote again. As Bromel spoke, the two demons posted around the church saw something very unsettling. Just about a block up the street were two old women hobbling toward the church, one walked with the assistance of a cane and a helping hand from her friend. She did not look well at all, but her jaw was set and her eyes bright and determined. Her cane clacked out a syncopated rhythm with her footsteps. Her friend, in better health and stronger, kept up with her, holding her arm to support her and talking gently to her. "'The one with the cane is Duster,' said one demon. "'What went wrong?' the other wondered. I thought she'd been taken care of. Well, she's ill, all right, but she's come anyway. And who is the old woman with her? Edith Duster has many friends. We should have known. The two ladies made their way up the church steps, each step a major task in itself. First one foot, then the other, then the cane placed on the next step until they were finally up to the front door. There, look at that now cackled the stronger one. I knew you could do it. The Lord's gotten you this far. He'll take care of you the rest of the way. What Edith Duster deeds is a stroke, murmured a sickness demon, drawing his sword. Perhaps it was simply luck or incredible coincidence, but just as the demon lunged forward with great speed to slash at the arteries in Edith Duster's brain, the other woman moved to open the door and stepped right in the way, the tip of the demon's sword struck the woman in the shoulder, which could have been concrete. The sword stopped short. Sickness did not, but catapulted over the two women and fluttered like a fractured kite into the churchyard as Edith Duster moved inside. Sickness gathered himself up off the ground and screamed, The host of heaven! The other demon guard stared at him blankly. Bromel saw Edith Duster come in alone. He cursed silently. This would be the vote to break the tie, but she would most certainly vote for Bush. The people were gathering again. The messengers of God were elated. Looks like Tal succeeded, said Mota. Kaiman was concerned, however. With such a heavy cover of the enemy, he most certainly had to show himself. Gilo chuckled. Oh, I'm sure our captain was very discreet. A few of the demons were in fact wondering what had happened to Edith Duster's companion between the front door and the sanctuary. Sickness continued insisting it had been a heavenly warrior. But where was she now? Tal, captain of the host, joined Signa and the other sentries at their concealed position. You had me fooled, captain, said Signa. You just might attempt it yourself sometime, Tal replied. On the platform, Bromel mentally groped for a trump card. He could just see the burning eyes of Langstrat if this vote went the wrong way. Well, he said, why don't we come to order now and get ready for another vote? The people settled in and quieted down. The yay side was more than ready. Now that we've prayed and talked about it, maybe some of us will feel differently about the future of the church here. I, uh, hmm. Come on, Alf, say something, but don't make a fool of yourself. I uh, guess I could say a few words. I haven't really shared my feelings. You know, Hank Bush is a little young. A middle-aged plumber on the yay side piped up. Hey, now, if you're going to put in some negative input, we've got to have equal time for some positive. The A's all murmured in agreement while the nays sat in cold silence. 
Uh, no, listen, Bromel stammered, his face bright red. I had no intention of trying to sway the vote. I was just... Let's have the vote, someone said. Yes, vote, and quick, Moda whispered. Just then the door opened. Oh, no, thought Bromel. Who's coming in this time? The silence fell like a shroud of death over the whole group. Lou Stanley had just come in. He grimly nodded greeting to them all and took a seat in a back pew. He looked old. Gordon Mayer piped up. Let's have the vote. The ushers passed out the ballots, while Bromel tried to plan a good escape route in case he had to throw up. His nerves were just about shot. He caught Lou Stanley's attention. Lou looked at him and seemed to laugh nervously. Make sure Lou back there gets ballot, Bromel told one of the ushers. The usher made sure. Kaiman whispered to Gilo, I think we're ready for any tricks Lucius might have. Any tiebreakers, you mean? Gilo answered. We may be in for a long night, said Mota. The ballots were collected, and Lucius kept his demons tightly around each offering plate and his eyes on every heavenly warrior. Mayer and Coleman counted again as the tension in the air tightened. The demons watched. The angels watched. The people watched. Mayer and Coleman kept a close eye on each other, silently mouthing as they counted. Mayer finished counting, waiting for Coleman to finish. Coleman finished, looked at Mayer, and asked him if he wanted to count again. They counted again. Then Mayer took his pen, wrote the result on a slip of paper, and carried it up to Brumel. Mayer and Coleman took their seats as Brumel unfolded the paper. Visibly shaken, Brumel took a few moments to put on his relaxed, businesslike public image. Well... He began, trying to control the tone of his voice. All right, then. <clears throat> the pastor has been retained. One side of the room loosened up, tittered, and smiled. The other side gathered up coats and belongings to leave. Alf, what was the vote? Someone wanted to know. Uh, it doesn't say. Twenty-eight to twenty-six. Gordon Mayer said accusingly, looking back toward Lou Stanley. But Lou Stanley had left. Chapter 11 Tal, Signa, and the other sentries could see the explosion from where they stood. With cries and wails of rage, demons scattered everywhere, erupting through the roof and sides of the church like shrapnel, and fanning out in all directions over the town. Their cries became a loud, echoing drone of savage fury that rang over the whole town like a thousand melancholy factory whistles, sirens, and horns. They will wreak havoc tonight, said Tao. Mota, Kaiman, and Gilo were there to report. By two votes, said Mota. Tal smiled and said, Very well, then. But Lou Stanley, Kaiman exclaimed, was that really Lou Stanley? Tal caught the implication. Yes, that was Mr. Stanley. I've been standing right here ever since I delivered Edith Duster. I see the spirit has been working, Gilo chuckled. Let's get Edith home safely and get a guard around her. Everyone to your posts. There will be angry spirits over the town tonight. That night the police were busy. Fights broke out in the local taverns, slogans were spray-painted on the courthouse, some cars were stolen and joy-ridden through the lawn and flowers in the park. Late into the night, Julene Langstrat hovered in an inescapable trance, halfway between a tormented life on earth and the licking, searing flames of hell. She lay on her bed, tumbled to the floor, clawed her way up the wall to stand on her feet, staggered about the room, and fell to the floor again. Threatening voices, monsters, flames, and blood exploded and pounded with unimaginable force in her head. She thought her skull would burst. She could feel claws tearing at her throat, creatures squirming and biting inside her, chains around her arms and legs. She could hear the voices of spirits, see their eyes and fangs, smell their sulfurous breath. The masters were angry, 
failed, 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 pounded in her brain and paraded before her eyes. Bramil has failed. You have failed. He will die. You will die. Did she really hold a knife in her hand, or was this too a vision from the higher planes? She could feel a yearning, a terribly strong impulse to be free of the torment, to break loose from the bodily shell, the prison of flesh that bound her. Join us, join us, join us, said the voices. She felt the edge of the blade and blood trickle down her finger. The telephone rang. Time froze. The bedroom registered on her retinas. The telephone rang. She was in her bedroom. There was blood on the floor. The telephone rang. The knife fell from her hands. She could hear voices, angry voices. The telephone rang. She was on her knees on the floor of her bedroom. She had cut her finger. The phone was still ringing. She called out, Hello, but it still rang. I won't fail you. She said to her visitors, Leave me. I won't fail you. The telephone rang. Alf Bramell sat in his home listening to the phone ringing on the other end. Juline must not be home. He hung up, relieved, if only for the moment. She would not be happy about the boat. Another delay, still another delay in the plan. He knew he could not avoid her, that she would find out that he would be confronted and berated by the others. He flopped down on his bed and contemplated resigning. Escape. Suicide. Saturday morning. The sun was out and lawnmowers called to each other across fences, hedges, and cul-de-sacs. Kids were playing, hoses were spraying dirty cars. Marshall sat in the kitchen at the table filled with advertising copy and a list of new and old accounts. The clarion still lacked a secretary. The front door opened and in came Kate. I need a hand. Yes, the inevitable unloading of groceries. Sandy, Marshall hollered out the back door. Let's get going. Over the years, the family had developed a pretty good system of grocery separating, handling, and stashing. Marshall, said Kate, passing vegetables from a sack to him at the refrigerator, are you still working on that copy? It's Saturday. Almost finished. I hate to have stuff stack up on me. How's Joe and the gang? Kate stopped a bunch of celery in mid-transfer and said, You know what? Joe's gone. He sold the store and moved away, and I didn't even hear about it. Brother, things happen fast around here. So where'd he move? I don't know. Nobody would tell me. As a matter of fact, I don't think I like that new owner. What's this cleaner here? Oh, put that under the sink. It went under the sink. I asked that guy about Joe and Angelina and why they sold the store and why they moved and where they moved, and he wouldn't tell me anything. Just said he didn't know. That's the owner of the store? What's his name? I don't know. He wouldn't tell me that either. Well, does he talk? Does he know English? Enough to ring up your groceries and take your money, and that's about it. Now, could we get all this stuff off the table? Marshall started gathering up all his papers before the oncoming invasion of cans and produce. Kate continued, I guess I'll get used to it, but for a while I thought I'd gone into the wrong store. I didn't recognize anybody. They might even have all new people working there. Sandy spoke for the first time. Something weird's going on in this town. Marshall asked, Oh, yeah? Sandy didn't elaborate. Marshall tried to draw it out of her. Well, what do you think it is? Oh, nothing really. It's just a feeling I get. People around here are starting to act weird. I think we're being invaded by aliens. Marshall let it go. The groceries were all put away. Sandy went back to her studies, and Kate got ready to work in the garden. Marshall had a phone call to make. Talk about weird aliens invading the town jarred his memory, and also his reporter's nose. Maybe Langstrap wasn't an alien, but she was certainly weird. 
He sat on the couch in the living room and took the slip of paper with Ted Harmel's phone number from his wallet. A sunny Saturday morning would be a strange time to find someone home and indoors, but Marshall figured he'd try. The phone on the other end rang several times, and then a man's voice answered. Hello? Hello, Ted Harmel? Yes, who's this? This is Marshall Hogan, the new Clarion editor. Oh, uh-huh. Harmel waited for Marshall to go on. Well, uh, anyway, you know Bernice Kruger, right? I have her working for me. Oh, she's still there, eh? Has she found out anything about her sister? Mm, I don't know much about that. She's never told me. Oh, so, how's the paper doing? They talked for a few minutes about the clarion, the office, circulation, whatever may have happened to the cord to the coffee maker. Armel seemed particularly concerned to hear that Edie had left. Her marriage broke up, Marshall told him. Hey, it was a complete surprise to me. I came in too late to know what was going on. Hmm. Yeah. Armel was doing some thinking on the other end. Keep it flowing, Hogan. Yeah, well, um, I've got a daughter who's a freshman at the college. Is that right? Yeah, doing her prerequisites, jumping through the hoop. She likes it. Well, more power to her. Harmel was certainly being patient. You know, uh, Sandy has a psychology professor I thought was an interesting gal. Langstrat. Bingo. Yeah, yeah. A lot of unusual ideas. I bet. Do you know anything about her? Harmel paused, sighed, and then asked, Well, what is it you uh, want to know? Where's she coming from, anyway? Sandy's bringing home some weird ideas. Harmel had trouble coming up with an answer. It's um, uh, Eastern mysticism, ancient religious craft. She's just into, you know, meditation, higher consciousness, uh, uh, the oneness of the universe. I don't know if any of that makes sense to you. Not much. But she seems to spread it around a lot, doesn't she? What do you mean? You know, she meets with people on a regular basis. Alf Bromel and uh, uh, who else? Uh, Pinkston. Dolores Pinkston? Right, on the Board of Regents. Uh, Dwight Brandon, Eugene Baylor. Harmel cut in abruptly. What is it you want to know? Well, I understand you were pretty close to the situation. No, that's wrong. Didn't you have sessions with her yourself? There was a long pause. Who told you that? Oh, we just found out. Another long pause. Armel sighed through his nose. Listen, he asked. What else do you know? Not much. It just smells like there might be a story in it. You know what that's like. Armel was struggling, fuming, groping for words. Yes, I know what it's like, but you're wrong this time. You're really wrong. Another pause, another struggle. Oh, brother, I wish you hadn't called me. Hey, listen, we're both newspaper men. No, you're the newspaper man. I'm out. I'm sure you know all about me. I know your name, your number, and that you used to own the clarion. All right, let's leave it at that. I still have respect for the vocation. I, I don't want to see you ruined. Marshall tried not to lose the big fish. Say, don't leave me in the dark. I'm not trying to leave you in the dark. There are some things I just can't talk about. Sure, I understand. No problem. No, you don't understand. Now listen to me. I don't know what you found out, but whatever it is, bury it. 
Do something else. Cover the Kiwanis tree planting. Anything innocuous. But just keep your nose clean. What are you talking about? And quit pumping me for information. What I'm giving you is all you're going to get. And you'd better make good use of it. I'm telling you, forget Langstrap. Forget anything you may have heard about her. Now, I know you're a reporter, and so I know you're going to go out and do just the opposite of what I'm telling you, but let me give you fair warning. Don't. Hogan didn't answer. Hogan, you hear me? How can I possibly leave it alone now? You have a wife, a daughter. Think of them. Think of yourself. Otherwise, you'll be out on your ear like everybody else. What do you mean, everybody else? I don't know anything. I don't know Langstrat. I don't know you. I don't live there anymore, period. Ted, are you in trouble? Leave it alone. He hung up. Marshall slammed the receiver down and let his mind race as he sat there. Leave it alone, Harmel said. Leave it alone. In a pig's eye. Edith Duster, wise old matron of the church, former missionary to China, a widow of some thirty years, lived in the Willow Terrace Apartments, a small retirement complex not far from the church. She was in her eighties, subsisted meagerly on social security and a minister's pension from her denomination, and loved to have company, especially since it was difficult for her to get out and around these days. Hank and Mary sat at her little dinette near the large window overlooking the building's courtyard. Grandma Duster poured tea from a very old, very charming teapot into equally charming teacups. She was dressed nicely, almost formally, as always when she received guests. No, she said as she sat down at last, the morning tea table properly set, the pastries in place. I don't believe God's purposes are ever thwarted for long. He has his own ways of working his people through difficulties. Hank agreed, but weakly. I imagine so. Mary held his hand. Grandma was firm. I know so, Henry Bush. Your being here is not a mistake. I strongly disagree with that notion. If you were not supposed to be here, the Lord would not have accomplished the things he has through your ministry. Mary volunteered some information. He feels a bit down about the boat. Grandma smiled lovingly and looked into Hank's eyes. I think the Lord is forcing a revival upon that church. But it's like the turning of the tide. Before the tide can come back in, it first has to stop all its going out. Give the church time to turn around. Expect opposition. Even expect to lose a few people. But the direction will change after the lull. Just give it time. But I do know one thing. There was nothing that could keep me away from that meeting last night. I was dreadfully sick. Satan's attack, I suppose. But it was the Lord who got me out. Right about the time of the meeting, I, I could just feel his arms bearing me up. And I got my coat on and got down there. And just in time, too. I don't know if I'd even go that far to get groceries. <laughs> it was the Lord, I know it. I'm just sorry I only had one vote. So, who do you suppose the other vote came from, Hank asked. Mary quickly added, It couldn't have been Lou Stanley. Grandma smiled. Oh, now don't say that. You never know what the Lord might do. But you are curious, aren't you? I'm really curious, said Hank, and now he smiled too. Well, you might find out, and maybe you never will. But it's all in the Lord's hands, and so are you. Let me warm up your tea. That church can't possibly survive if half the congregation removes its support, 
and I can imagine them supporting a pastor they don't want. Oh, but I have had dreams of angels lately. Grandma was very matter-of-fact about such things. I don't usually, but I've seen angels before, and always when there was great headway to be made for the kingdom of God. I just have a feeling in my spirit that something is really stirring here. Haven't you felt that way? Hank and Mary looked at each other to see which of them should speak first. Then Hank told Grandma all about the battle of the other night and the burden he had felt lately for the town. Mary slipped in her remembrances whenever they came to her. Grandma listened with great fascination, responding at key moments with, Oh, dear. Well, praise the Lord. And, well. Yes, she said finally. Yes, that makes a lot of sense to me. You know, I had an experience just the other night, standing right by that window. She pointed to the front window overlooking the courtyard. I was getting the place straightened up, getting ready for bed, and I walked by that window and looked out at the rooftops and the street light. And all of a sudden, I got really dizzy. I had to sit down or I'd fall down. And I never get dizzy. The only time that ever happened before was in China. My husband and I were visiting a woman's home there, and she was a medium, a, a spiritist, and I knew she hated us, and I think she was trying to put a curse on us. But just outside her door, I had the same dizzy sensation, and I'll never forget it. What I felt the other night was just like that time in China. What did you do? Mary asked. Oh, I prayed. I just said, Demon be gone in the name of Jesus. And it went away, just like that. Hank asked, So you think it was a demon? Oh, yes. God is moving and Satan doesn't like it. I do think there are evil spirits out there. But don't you feel like there are more than usual? I mean, I've been a Christian all my life, and I've never come up against anything that felt like this. Her face grew pensive. This kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. We need to pray, and we need to get other people praying. That's just what the angels keep telling me. Mary was intrigued. The angels in your dreams? Grandma nodded. What did they look like? Oh, people, but different from anybody else. They're big, very handsome, bright clothes, big swords at their sides, very large, bright wings. One of them last night reminded me of my son. He was tall, blonde. He looked Scandinavian. She looked at Hank. He was telling me to pray for you, and you were in the dream, too. I could see you up behind that pulpit preaching, and he was standing there behind you with his wings stretched out over you like a big canopy. And he looked back at me and said, Pray for this man. I never knew you were praying for me, said Hank. Well, it's time somebody else was praying, too. I believe the tide is turning, Hank, and now you need true believers, true visionaries who can stand with you to pray for this town. We need to pray that the Lord will gather them in. It was so natural then to join hands in praise to the Lord and thanksgiving for the first real encouragement to come along in quite some time. Hank prayed a prayer of thanks and could hardly get through it as his emotions welled up inside him. Mary was grateful not only for the encouragement, but for Hank's revived spirits. Then Edith Duster, who'd fought in spiritual wars before, who'd won victories on foreign soils, tightly grasped the hands of this young ministering couple and prayed. Lord God, she said, and the warmth of the Holy Spirit flowed through them. 
I build now a hedge around this young couple, and I bind the spirits in Jesus' name. Satan, whatever your plans for this town, I rebuke you in Jesus' name, and I bind you, and I cast you out. Clunk. Rayfar's eyes darted toward the sound that had interrupted his talking, and saw two swords fallen from their owner's hands. The two demons, formidable warriors, were nonplussed. They both stooped hurriedly to gather up their weapons, bowing, apologizing, begging for pardon. Swam! Rayfar's foot fell on one sword. His own huge sword clamped the other down. The two warriors, startled and terrified, backed away. Please pardon, my prince, said one. Yes, please pardon, said the other. This has never happened before. Silence, you two, Rayfar bellowed. The two warriors braced themselves for a terrible punishment. Their frightened yellow eyes peered out from behind black wings unfurled for protection, as if there was any protection from Baal Rayfar's wrath. But Rayfar did not lash out at them. Not yet. He seemed more interested in the fallen swords. He stared at them, his brow furrowed and his big yellow eyes narrowing. He walked slowly around the swords, strangely bothered in a way the warriors had never seen before. A low, gurgling growl came from deep in his throat as his nostrils belched forth yellow vapor. He slowly went down on one knee and picked up one sword in his hand. In his huge fist it looked like a toy. He looked at the sword, looked at the demon who had dropped it, then off into space, his gnarled face registering a burning hatred that slowly rose from deep within. Cal, he whispered. Then, like a slowly swelling volcano, he rose to his feet, the anger building until suddenly, with a roar that shook the room and terrified all those present, he exploded and hurled a sword through the basement wall, through the earth around Stuart Hall, through the air, through several other buildings in the college campus, and up into the sky, where it tumbled end over end in a long arc of several miles. His initial explosion released, he grabbed the sword's owner and with the order, Go after it, flung the demon like a spear along the same trajectory. He grabbed up the other sword and flung it at the other demon, who sidestepped just in time to save himself. Then that demon too went sailing after his sword. To some in the room, the word Tal meant nothing. But they could see by the faces and deflating postures of others that it had to mean something dreadful. Rayfar began to storm about the room, growling indiscernible phrases and waving his sword at invisible enemies. The others gave him time to vent himself before daring to ask any question. Lucius finally stepped forward and bowed low, much as he hated to do so. We are at your service, Bail Rayfar. Can you tell us, who is this Tal? Rayfar spun around in fury, his wings unfurling like a clap of thunder and his eyes like hot coals. Who is this Tal? He screamed, and every demon present fell on his face. Who is this Tal, this warrior, this captain of the hosts of heaven, this sneaking, conniving rival of rivals, who is this Tal? Complacency happened to be within grabbing distance. With a huge fist around Complacency's scrawny neck, Rayfar plucked him up like a frail weed and held him high. Yo! Rayfar growled with a cloud of sulfur and steam. Have failed because of this towel. Complacency could only tremble, speechless with terror. Hogan has become a hound, sniffing and barking after our scent. And I have had my fill of you and your whining excuses. 
The huge sword flashed in a wide crimson arc, cutting a gash in space which became a bottomless abyss into which all light seemed to drain like water. Complacency's eyes swelled in stark terror, and he screamed his last scream upon the earth. No, Bale, no! With a mighty thrust of his arm, Rayfar cast complacency headlong into the abyss. The small demon tumbled, fell, and kept falling, his screams becoming fainter until they vanished altogether. Rayfar wiped the rift in space shut with the flat of his blade, and the room was just as it was before. Just then the two warriors returned with their swords. He grabbed both of them by their wings and jerked them together in front of him. On your feet, all of you, he hollered at the others. They complied instantly. Now he held the two demons aloft as an exhibit. Who is this Tal? He is a strategist who can make warriors drop their swords. With that, he hurled the two into the group, causing several to go sprawling. They picked themselves up as quickly as they could. Who is this Tal? He is a subtle warrior who knows his limitations, who never enters a battle he cannot win, who knows all too well the power of the saints of God, a lesson you can all stand to learn. Rayfar held his sword in a fist that trembled with rage, waving it about to give extra force to his words. I do all too well to expect him. Michael would never have sent anyone less to pit against me. Now Hogan is revived, and it is clear why he was even brought to Ashton to begin with. Now Henry Bush is still retained, and the Ashton Community Church has not fallen, but stands as a bastion against us. Now the warriors are dropping their swords like clumsy fools, and all because of this Tal. This is Tal's manner. His strength is not in his own sword, but in the saints of God. Somewhere, somebody is praying. Those words brought a chill over the group. Rayfar kept pacing and thinking and growling. Yes, yes, Bush and Hogan were hand-picked. Tal's plan must revolve around them. If they fall, Tal's plan falls. There isn't much time. Rayfar selected a slimy-looking demon and asked, Have you laid a trap for Bush? Oh, yes, Bale Rayfar, said the demon, and he couldn't help laughing with delight at his own cleverness. Be sure it is subtle. Remember... No frontal assault will work. Leave it to me. And what has been done to destroy Marshal Hogan? Strife stepped forward. We seek to destroy his family. He derives a great amount of strength from his wife. If that support were ripped away... Do it any way you can. Yes, my prince. And let us not neglect some other avenues. Hogan could be lethal and Kruger the same, but they could be manipulated to compromise each other. Rayfar appointed some demons to look into that possibility. And what about Hogan's daughter? Deception stepped forward. She is already within our hands. Chapter 12 The leaves were green, that fresh, new-growth kind of green they wear in the early months of summer. From their small table on the red brick plaza below, Sandy and Sean could look up and see the glowing leaves, backlit by the sun. 
and watch the birds flit about in the branches between their regular scavenging for breadcrumbs and french fries. This spot on campus was Sandy's favorite. It was so peaceful here, almost a world away from the strife, questions, and disputes at home. Sean enjoyed watching the brown sparrows cheeping and scrambling for every breadcrumb he tossed onto the bricks. I love the way the universe all fits together, he said. The tree grew here to give us shade. We sit here and eat and give food to the birds that live in the tree. <laughs> it all works together. Sandy was fascinated by the concept. On the surface, it seemed very simple, almost storybookish. But part of her was so thirsty for this kind of peace. What happens when the universe doesn't fit together? she asked. Sean smiled. The universe always fits together. The problem is only when people don't realize it. So how do you explain the problems I'm having with my folks? None of your minds are tuned in right. It's just like an FM station on your radio. If the signal is fuzzy and the voices hiss and sputter, don't blame the broadcasting station. Adjust your radio. Sandy, the universe is perfect. It is unified, harmonious. The peace, the unity, the wholeness are really there, and all of us are a part of the universe. We're made of the same stuff, so there's no reason why we shouldn't just fit into the whole scheme of things. If we don't, we just took a wrong turn somewhere. We're out of touch with true reality. Boy, I guess so, Sandy muttered. But that's what gets me. My folks and I are supposed to be Christians and loving each other and close to God and everything, but all we ever do is argue about who's right and who's wrong. Sean laughed and nodded his head. Yeah, yeah, I know all about that. I've been there, too. Okay, so how did you solve it? I could only solve it for myself. I can change other people's minds, only my own. <laughs> it's a little hard to explain. But if you're in tune with the universe, a few little quirks in it that aren't in tune won't bother you much. That kind of thing is only an illusion of the mind anyway. Once you stop listening to the lies your mind's been telling you, you'll see very clearly that God is big enough for everybody and in everybody. Nobody can put him in a jar and keep him all to themselves according to their own whims and ideas. I just wish I could find him for real. Sean looked at her comfortingly and touched her hand. Hey, he's no trouble to find. We're all a part of him. What do you mean? Well, it's like I said. The whole universe all fits together. It's made of the same essence, the same spirit, the same energy, right? Sandy shrugged and nodded. Well, whatever our individual concept of God might be, we all know that there is something there. A force, a principle, an energy that holds everything together. If that force is part of the universe, then it must be a part of us. Sandy wasn't grasping this. This is pretty foreign to me. I'm from the old Judeo-Christian school of thought, you know. So all you've ever learned is religion, right? She thought for a moment, then conceded. Right. Well, you see, the problem with religion, any religion, is that it's basically a limited perspective, only a partial view of the whole truth. Now you sound like Langstrat. Oh, she is right on, I think. When you think about it long enough, it makes a lot of sense. It's just like that classic old story about the blind men who encountered the elephant. Yeah, yeah, I heard her tell that story, too. Well, see, each man's perspective of the elephant was limited to the part that he touched. So, since they all touched different parts, they couldn't agree on what an elephant was really like. They got in a fight over it just like religionists throughout history have done. And all they needed to realize was that the elephant was only one elephant. It wasn't the elephant's fault that they couldn't agree with each other. They weren't tuned into each other and to the whole elephant. So we're all just like blind men, 
Sean gave a strong affirmative nod. We're just like a bunch of bugs crawling around on the ground, never looking up. If an ant could talk, you could ask him if he knew what a tree was, and if he'd never come out of the grass and actually climbed a tree, he'd probably argue with you that the tree didn't exist. But who's wrong? Who's really blind? We're just like that. We've allowed ourselves to be fooled by our own limited perceptions. Are you into Plato at all? Sandy laughed a little and shook her head. I studied that last quarter, and I don't think I got that either. Hey, he was into the same enlightenment. He'd figured there had to be a higher reality, an ideal, a perfect existence of which all we see is a copy. It's kind of like what we see with our limited senses is so limited, so imperfect, so so broken up into pieces, we can't perceive the way the universe really is. All perfect, running smoothly, everything fitting together, all the same essence. You could even say that reality as we know it is just an illusion, a trick of our ego, our mind, our selfish desires. <sighs> this all sounds very far out to me. Oh, but it's great once you really get into it. It answers a lot of questions and solves a lot of problems. Yeah, if you ever can get into it. Sean leaned forward. You don't get into it, Sandy. It's already in you. Think about that for a minute. I don't feel anything in me. And why not? Guess. She twisted an invisible radio dial with her fingers. I'm not tuned in? Sean laughed with delight. Right, right. Listen, the universe doesn't change, but we can. If we're not lined up with it, not tuned in, we're the ones who are blind, who are living in an illusion. Say, if your life is messed up, it's really a matter of how you look at things. Sandy scoffed. Come on now, you're not going to tell me that it's all in my head. Sean put up hands of caution. Hey, don't knock it until you try it. He looked again at the sunshine, the green trees, the busy birds. Just listen for a moment. Listen to what? The breeze, the birds. Watch those leaves waving in the wind up there. For a moment they were silent. Sean spoke quietly, almost in a whisper. Now be honest. Haven't you ever felt a sort of kinship with the trees and with the birds, with just about everything? Wouldn't you miss them if they weren't there? Have you ever talked to a house plant? Sandy nodded. Sean had a point there. Now don't resist that. Because what you're experiencing there is just a glimpse of the real universe. You're feeling the oneness of everything. Everything is fitted together, interwoven, interlocked. Now you felt that before, haven't you? She nodded. So that's what I'm trying to show you. The truth is already within you. You're a part of it. You're a part of God. You just never knew it. You wouldn't let yourself know it. Sandy could hear the birds clearly now, and the wind seemed almost melodic as it shifted in pitch and intensity through the branches of the trees. The sun was warm, benevolent. Suddenly she felt so strongly that she had been in this place before, had known these trees and these birds before. They were trying to reach out to her, to talk to her. Then she noticed that for the first time in many months she felt peace inside. Her heart was at rest. It wasn't an all-pervading peace, and she didn't know if it would last. But she could feel it, and she knew she wanted more. I think maybe I'm tuning in a little bit, she said. Sean smiled and squeezed her hand encouragingly. Meanwhile, with very gentle, very subtle combing motions of his talons, deception stood behind Sandy, stroking her red hair and speaking sweet words of comfort to her mind. Tal and his troops gathered once again in the little church, and the mood was better this time. They had tasted the first promises of battle, 
a victory, even though a small one had been won the night before. Most of all, there were more of them. The original twenty-three had grown to forty-seven, as more mighty warriors had gathered, called in by the prayers of the remnant, said Tal with a note of anticipation as he looked over a preliminary list presented to him. Cyan, a red-haired, freckled fighter from the British Isles, explained the progress of the search. They're out there, Cap. There's plenty of them. But these are the ones we'll be bringing in for sure. Tal read the names. John and Patricia Coleman. Cyan explained. They were here last night and spoke up for the preacher. Now they're all the more for him. And they dropped to their knees easy as dropping a hat. We got them working. Andy and June Forsyth. Lost sheep, you could say. Left the United Christian here in Ashton out of sheer hunger. We'll bring him to church tomorrow. They have a son, Ron, who's searching for the Lord. A bit wayward now, but reaching his fill of his ways. And plenty more, I see, said Tal with a smile. He handed the list to Gilo. Assign some of our newcomers to this list. Gather these people in. I want them praying. Gilo took the list and conferred with several new warriors. And what about relatives, friends elsewhere? Tal asked Cyan. Plenty of them are redeemed and ready for prayer. Shall I send emissaries to burden them? Tal shook his head. I can't let any warriors be gone for long. Instead, have messengers carry word to the watch-carers over these people's towns and cities, and let the watch-carers see that these people are burdened with prayer for their loved ones here. Done. Cyan set right to work, assigning messengers who immediately vanished to their missions. Gilo had sent his warriors also and was excited to see the campaign in motion. I like the feel of this, Captain. It is a good beginning, Tal said. And what of Rafar? Do you suppose he knows of your presence here? The two of us know each other all too well. Then he will be expecting a fight. And soon. Which is why we won't fight. Not yet. Not until the prayer cover is sufficient, and we know why Rafar is here. He's not a prince of small towns, but of empires, and he would never be here for any task below his pride. What we've seen is far less than the enemy has planned. How's Mr. Hogan? I hear a little complacency has been banished for failure, and the Baal is in a rage. Tal chuckled. <laughs> Hogan has come to life like a dormant seed. Nathan, Armoth. They were there immediately. You have more warriors now. Take as many as you need to surround Marshal Hogan. Greater numbers may intimidate where swords cannot. Gilo was visibly indignant and looked longingly at his sheathed sword. Tal cautioned. Not yet, brave Gilo. Not yet. Right after Marshall's call to Harmel, Bernice's phone nearly jumped off the wall. Marshall didn't ask her. He told her, Be at the office tonight at seven. We've got work to do. Now, at 7.10, the rest of the clarion office was deserted and dark. Marshall and Bernice were in the back room, digging old issues of the clarion out of the archives. Ted Harmel had been quite fastidious, most of the past issues were neatly kept in huge binders. So, when did Harmel get run out of town? Marshall asked as he flipped through several old pages of a back issue. About a year ago, Bernice answered, bringing more binders up to the big work table. The paper operated on a skeleton crew for several months before you bought it. Edie, Tom, myself, and some of the college journalism majors kept it going. Some of the issues were okay. Some of them were a lot like a college paper. Like this one here? Bernice looked at the old issue from the previous August. I'd appreciate it if you wouldn't look too closely. Marshall flipped the pages backward. I want to see the issues up to the time Harmel left. Okay. Ted left in late July. Here's June, May, April. Just what are you looking for? The reason why he got run out. 
You know the story, of course. Bramel says he molested some girl. Yes, Bramel says a lot of things. Well, did he or didn't he? The girl said he did. She was about twelve, I guess, a daughter of one of the college regents. Which one? Bernice probed her brain, finally forcing the memory out. Jared. Adam Jared. I think he's still there. Is he on that list you got from Dar? No, but perhaps he should be. Ted knew Jared pretty well. The two of them used to go fishing together. He did know the daughter, had frequent access to her, and that helped the case against him. So why wasn't he prosecuted? I don't think it ever went that far. He was arraigned before the district judge. Baker? Yes, the one on the list. The case went into the judge's chambers, and apparently they struck some kind of deal. Ted was gone just a few days after that. Marshall gave the work table an angry slap. Boy, I wish I hadn't let that guy get away. You didn't tell me I'd be putting my fist through a beehive. I didn't know that much about it. Marshall kept scanning the pages in front of him. Bernice was going through the previous month. You say this all blew up in July? Mid to late July. The paper's pretty quiet about it. Oh, sure. Ted wasn't going to print anything against himself, obviously. Besides, he didn't have to. His reputation was shot to pieces anyway. Our circulation dropped critically. Several weeks went by without any paychecks. Uh-oh. What's this? The two of them zeroed in on a letter to the editor in a Friday issue from early July. Marshall scanned, muttered as he read, I must express my indignation at the unfair treatment this Board of Regents has received from the local press. The recent articles published in the Ashton Clarion amount to nothing less than blatant malfeasance of journalism, and we hope our local editor will be professional enough to check his facts from now on before printing any more groundless innuendos. Yes, Bernice brightened with recollection. This was a letter from Eugene Baylor. And then she slapped her hands to either side of her face and exclaimed, Oh! Those articles! Bernice started flipping hurriedly through the June binder. Yes, here's one. The headline read, Strawn Calls for Audit. Marshall read the lead. Despite continuing opposition from the Whitmore College Board of Regents, College Dean Eldon Strawn today called for an audit of all Whitmore College accounts and investments, still voicing his concern over recent allegations of mishandling of funds. Bernice's eyes rolled up and scanned the heavens as she said, Oh boy, this may be more than just a beehive. Marshall read a little further. Strawn has asserted that there's more than adequate evidence to justify such an audit, even though it would be costly and premature, as the Board of Regents still maintains. Bernice explained. You see, I never paid that much attention when all this was going on. Ted was an aggressive sort. He'd gotten on the bad side of people before, and this just sounded like another mundane political thing. I was just a reporter on the innocuous human interest staff. What did I care about all this? So, said Marshall, the college dean got himself in hot water with the regents. Sounds like a real feud. Ted was a good friend of Eldon Strawn. He took sides and the regents didn't like it. Here's another one just the week after. Marshall read, Regent Maul Strawn. Whitmore College Regent Eugene Baylor, the college's general treasurer, today accused Dean Eldon Strawn of malicious political hatcheting, asserting that Strawn is using deplorable and unethical methods to further his own dynasty within the college administration. Huh. Not exactly a harmless little tiff between friends. Oh, I understand it got bitter, really bitter. And Ted probably stuck his nose out a little too far. He started catching the crossfire. 
hence Eugene Baylor's angry letter. Along with political pressure, I'm sure, Strawn and Ted had many meetings, and Ted was finding out a lot. Maybe too much. But you have no details. Bernice only threw up her hands and shook her head. We have these articles and Ted's phone number in the list. Yeah, Marshall mused. The list. A lot of college regents on it. Plus the chief of police and the district judge who cooked Ted's goose. So what became a strong? Fired. Bernice flipped through some more old clarions. A loose page fluttered out and dropped to the floor. Marshall picked it up. Something on the page caught his eye, and he perused it until Bernice found what she was looking for, an article from late June. Yes, here's the write-up, she said. Strawn fired. Citing conflicts of interest and professional incompetency as their reasons, the Whitmore College Board of Regents today unanimously called for Dean Eldon Strawn's resignation. Not a very long article, Marshall commented. Ted put it in because he had to, but it's obvious he held back any damaging details. He firmly believed Strawn's cause was just. Marshall kept flipping through the pages. Ah, what's this one here? Whitmore could be millions in arrears, says Strawn. Marshall read that one carefully. Wait a minute here. He's saying the college could be in big trouble, but he isn't saying how he knows. It kept coming out in bits and pieces. We just never got all of them before Strawn and Ted were silenced. But millions? You're talking real money here. But you see all the connections. Yeah. The regents, the judge, the police chief, Young, the comptroller, and who knows who else, all connected to Langstrat and very quiet about it. And don't forget Ted Harmel. Yeah, he's quiet about it, too. I mean, real quiet. The guy scared out of his socks. But he wasn't a very loyal member of the group if he sided with Strawn against the regents. So they rubbed him out, so to speak, along with Strawn. Maybe. So far, we have just a theory, and it's foggy. But we do have a theory, and my being in jail fits the pattern. Too nicely just yet, Marshall thought aloud. We need to realize what we're saying here. We're talking political corruption, abuse of process, racketeering, who knows what else. We'd better be really sure of ourselves. What was that page there that dropped? Huh? The one you picked up. Oh, it was out of order. It's dated clear back in January. Bernice reached for the proper binder on the archive shelf. I don't want the archives all mixed up after... Hey, what'd you fold it all up for? Marshall shrugged a little, gave her a very gentle look, and unfolded the page. There's an article about your sister, he said. She took the page from him and looked at the news story. The headline read, Kruger Death Ruled Suicide. She put the page down quickly. I uh, figured you wouldn't want to be reminded, he said. I've seen it before, she said abruptly. I have a copy at home. I read the article just now. I know. She pulled out another binder, opening it on the work table. Marshall, she said, you may as well know everything about it. It might come up again. The case is not resolved in my mind and it's been a very difficult battle for me. Marshall only sighed and said, You started this. Remember that now. Bernice kept her lips tight and her body straight. She was trying to be a detached machine. She pointed to the first story dated mid-January. Brutal death on campus. Marshall read silently. He wasn't prepared for the horrible details. The story isn't entirely accurate, Bernice commented in a very guarded tone of voice. They didn't find Pat in her own dorm room. She was down the hall in an unoccupied room. I guess some of the girls used that room to study by themselves if it got too noisy on the floor. 
No one knew where she was until someone spotted the blood running out under a door. Her voice cracked, and she shut her mouth tightly. Patricia Elizabeth Kruger, age 19, had been found in a dorm room, naked and very dead, her throat slashed. There was no sign of a struggle. The entire college was in a state of shock. There were no witnesses. Bernice flipped to another page and another headline. No clues to Kruger death. Marshall read it quickly, feeling more and more like he was invading a very sensitive area where he had no business to be. The article stated that no witnesses had come forth. No one had heard or seen anything. There was no clue to who the assailant might be. And you read the last one, Bernice said. They finally ruled it was a suicide. They decided that my sister had stripped herself and cut her own throat. Marshall was incredulous. And that was that? That was that. Marshall closed the binder quietly. He had never seen Bernice looking so vulnerable. The feisty little reporter who could hold her own in a jail cell full of hookers had one part of her still laid bare and wounded beyond healing. He put his hands gently on her shoulders. I'm sorry, he said. It's why I came here, you know. She wiped her eyes with her fingers, reaching for a nearby tissue to wipe her nose. I, I just couldn't leave it at that. I knew Pat. I knew her better than anyone. She just wasn't the type to do such a thing. She was happy, well-adjusted. She liked college. She sounded just fine in her letters. Why, why don't we just pack it up for the night? Bernice didn't acknowledge his suggestion. I checked the dorm layout, the room where she died, the roster for the names of every girl living in that building. I talked to all of them. I checked the police reports, the coroner's report. I went through all of Pat's personal effects. I tried to track down Pat's roommate, but she'd left. I still can't remember her name. I only met her once when I was here for a visit. I finally decided just to stick around, get a job, wait and see. I had some newspaper background. The job here was easy enough to land. Marshall put his arm around her shoulders. Well, listen, I'll help you out any way I can. You don't have to carry this whole thing by yourself. She relaxed a bit, leaning into him just enough to acknowledge his embracing arm. I don't want to bother you. You're not bothering me. Listen, as soon as you're ready, we can go over it, recheck everything. There might still be some lead somewhere. Bernice shook her two fists and whimpered. If I could just be more objective about it. Marshall gave her a gentle, comforting chuckle and a friendly squeeze. <laughs> well, maybe I can handle that end of it. You're doing a good job, Bernie. Just hang in there. She was a nice kid, Marshall thought, and as far as he could remember, this was the first time he'd ever touched her. Chapter 13 For obvious reasons, the congregation of Ashton Community Church was much smaller and fragmented this Sunday morning, but Hank had to admit that the whole atmosphere was more peaceful. As he stood behind the old pulpit to open the service, he could see the smiling faces of his supporters peppered throughout the small crowd. Yes, there were the Colemans sitting in their usual spot. Grandma Duster was there, too, in much better health, praise the Lord. And there were the Coopers, the Harrises, and Ben Squires, the mailman. Alf Bramell hadn't made it, but Gordon Mayer and his wife were there, and so were Sam and Helen Turner. Some of the not-so-actives were there for their usual once-a-month drop-in, and Hank gave them special glances and smiles to let them know they were noticed. As Mary banged out, Hall hailed the power of Jesus' name on the piano, and Hank led the singing. Another couple came in the back door and took a seat near the rear, as new folks usually did. Hank didn't recognize them at all. Cyan remained near the back door, watching Andy and June Forsyth take their seats. 
Then he looked up toward the platform and gave Creone and Triscoll a friendly salute. They smiled and saluted back. A few demons had come in with the humans, and they were not happy to see this new heavenly stranger even lurking about, let alone bringing new people into the church. But Cyan backed none threateningly out the door. Hank couldn't explain why he felt as joyful as he did this morning. Maybe it was having Grandma Duster there and the Colemans and the new couple. And then there was that other new fellow, the big blonde guy sitting in the back. He had to be a football lineman or something. Hank kept remembering what Grandma had said to him. We need to pray that the Lord will gather them in. He got to the sermon and opened his Bible to Isaiah 55. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord, and he will have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there without watering the earth, and making it bare and sprout, and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire, and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. For you will go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth into shouts of joy before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Hank loved that passage, and he couldn't help smiling as he began to explain it. Some people simply stared at him, listening out of obligation. But others even leaned forward in their seats, hanging on every word. The new couple sitting in the back kept nodding their heads with very intent expressions. The big blonde man smiled, nodded his head, even shouted out an amen. The words kept coming to Hank's heart and mind. It had to be the Lord's anointing. He stopped by the pulpit from time to time to look at his notes, but most of the time he was all over the platform, feeling like he was somewhere between heaven and earth, speaking forth the word of God. The few little demons lurking about could only cower and sneer. Some did manage to stop the ears of the people they owned, but the onslaught this morning was particularly severe and painful. To them, Hank's preaching had all the soothing effect of a buzzsaw. On top of the church, Signa and his warriors refused to bend or back down. Lucius dropped by with a sizable flock of demons just in time for the service, but Signa would not step aside. You know better than to tamper with me, Lucius threatened. Signa was sickeningly polite. I'm sorry, we cannot allow any more demons into the church this morning. Lucius must have had more important things for his demons to do that morning than try to hack their way through a wall of obstinate angels. He delivered a few choice insults, and then the whole bunch roared off into the air, bound for some other mischief. When the service ended, some people made a beeline for the door. Others made a beeline for Hank. Pastor, my name is Andy Forsyth, and this is my wife, June. Hello, hello, Hank said, and he could feel a wide smile stretching his face. That was great, Andy said, shaking his head in amazement and still shaking Hank's hand. It was, <laughs> boy, it was really great. They made small talk for a few minutes, finding out about each other. Andy owned and ran the lumber yard just on the outskirts of town. June was a legal secretary. They had a son, Ron, who was in trouble with drugs and needed the Lord. Well, said Andy, we haven't been saved too long ourselves. We used to go to the Ashton United Christian. His voice trailed off. June was less inhibited. We were starving there. We couldn't wait to get out. Andy cut back in. Yeah, that's right. We heard about this church. Well, actually, we heard about you. 
We heard you were in a bit of trouble for being such a stickler with the Word of God. And we just thought to ourselves, we ought to check that guy out. Now I'm glad we did. Pastor, he continued, I want you to know there are a lot of hungry people out there. We have some friends who love the Lord and have no place to go. It's been really strange the last few years. One by one, the churches around here have kind of died. Oh, they're still there, all right, and they have the people and the bucks, but uh, you know what I mean. Hank wasn't sure that he did. What do you mean? Andy shook his head. Satan's really playing games with this town, I guess. Ashton never used to be this way with so much weird stuff going on. Hey, you may have trouble believing this, but we have friends who have dropped out of three, no, four of the local churches. June exchanged glances with Andy as she went through a mental list of names. Greg and Eva Smith, the Bartons, the Jennings, Clint Neal. Yeah, right, right, said Andy. Like I said, there are a lot of hungry people out there, sheep without a shepherd. The churches around here just don't cut it. They don't preach the gospel. Just then, Mary walked up, all smiles. Hank happily introduced her. Then Mary said, Hank, I'd like you to meet... And she turned toward the empty room. Whoever was supposed to be there wasn't. Well, he's gone. Who was it? Hank asked. Oh, you remember that big guy sitting in the back? The big blonde guy? Yes, I got a chance to talk to him. He told me to tell you that, Mary deepened her voice to mimic him, the Lord is with you, keep praying and keep listening. Well, that was nice. Did you get his name? Uh, no, I don't think he ever told me. Andy asked, who was this? Oh, said Hank, you know, that big guy in the back. He was sitting right next to you. Andy looked at June, and her eyes got wide. Andy started smiling. Then he started laughing, and then he started clapping his hands and practically dancing. Praise the Lord, he exclaimed. And Hank hadn't seen such enthusiasm in a long time. Praise the Lord, there was nobody there. Pastor, we didn't see a soul. Mary's mouth dropped open, and she covered it with her fingers. Oliver Young was a real showman. He could work an audience right down to each tear or titter and time it so well that they became just so many puppets on a string. He would stand behind the pulpit with incredible dignity and poise, and his words were so well chosen that whatever he was saying had to be right. The vast congregation certainly seemed to think so. They had packed the place out. Many of them were professionals, doctors, teachers, lawyers, self-proclaimed philosophers and poets. A very large segment was from or connected in some way with the college. They took fastidious notes on Young's message as if it were a lecture. Marshall had heard a lot of this little song and dance before. So, on this particular Sunday, he mulled over the questions he couldn't wait to spring on Young after the service was over. Young continued, Did not God say, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness? What had remained in the darkness of tradition and ignorance we find now revealed within ourselves. We discover, no, rather we rediscover the knowledge we have always had as a race. We are inherently divine in our very essence and have within ourselves the capacity for good, the potential to become, as it were, gods, made in the exact likeness of Father God, the ultimate source of all that is. Marshall took a quick and furtive glance sideways. There was Kate and there was Sandy taking notes like mad, and next to her sat Sean Ormsby. Sandy and Sean had hit it off pretty well, and he had a definite positive influence on her life. Today, for example, he had made a deal with Sandy. He would go to church with her if she would go with her folks. Well, it worked. Marshall had to admit, even though a little reluctantly, that Sean could communicate with Sandy in ways Marshall never could. There had been several occasions when Sean had served quite well as a liaison or interpreter between Sandy and Marshall, and opened lines of communication neither of them thought could ever materialize. Things were getting peaceful around the house at last. 
Sean seemed a gentle sort with a real gift for refereeing. So what do I do now, Marshall wondered. For the first time in who knows how long, my whole family is sitting together in church, and that's nothing but a miracle, a real miracle. But we sure picked one heck of a church to be sitting together in. And as for that preacher up there, it would be so comfortable and so nice to let everything be. But he was a reporter, and this young had something to hide. Nuts. Talk about conflict of interests. So while Pastor Oliver Young was up there trying to get across his ideas on the infinite divine potential within seemingly finite man, Marshall had his own nagging issues to think about. The service ended punctually at noon, and the carillon in the tower automatically clicked on and began to play a very traditional, very Christian-sounding accompaniment to all the handshaking, visiting, and filing out. Marshall and his family entered the flow of traffic that oozed toward the foyer. Oliver Young was standing by the front door in his usual spot, greeting all his parishioners, shaking hands, coochie-cooing the babies, being pastorly. Soon Marshall, Kate, Sandy, and Sean had their turn with him. "'Well, Marshall, good to see you,' Young gushed, shaking Marshall's hand. "'Have you met Sandy?' Marshall asked and formally introduced Young to his daughter. Young was very warm. "'Sandy, I'm very glad to see you.' Sandy at least acted glad to be there. "'And Sean!' Young exclaimed. "'Sean Ormsby!' The two of them shook hands. "'Oh, so you two know each other?' Marshall asked. "'Oh, I've known Sean since he was just a little shaver. "'Sean, don't make yourself so scarce, all right?' "'All right,' Sean answered with a shy smile. "'The others moved on, but Marshall lagged behind "'and came up close on the other side to speak to Young some more. "'He waited until Young had finished greeting one little group of people "'and then interjected into the pause.' Hey, I just thought you'd like to know that things are going better now with Sandy and me. Young smiled, shook a few hands, then said sideways to Marshall, Wonderful, that's really wonderful, Marshall. He offered his hand to someone else. Nice seeing you here today. In another space between exiting greetees, Marshall interjected, Yeah, she really enjoyed your sermon this morning. She said it was very challenging. Well, thank you for saying so. Yes, Mr. Beaumont, how are you? You know, it even seemed to be along the same lines as what Sandy's getting in school in Julene Langstrat's classes. Young didn't answer that, but directed all his attention to a young couple with a baby. Oh, my, she's getting so big. Marshall continued. You're going to have to meet Professor Langstrat sometime. There's a very interesting parallel between what she teaches and what you preach. There was no response from Young. I understand, as a matter of fact, that Langstrat's pretty deeply involved in occultism and Eastern mysticism. Well, Young finally responded, I wouldn't know anything about that, Marshall. And you definitely don't know this Professor Langstrat? No, I told you that. Haven't you attended several private sessions with her on a regular basis? And not only you, but also Alf Bramell, Ted Harmel, Dolores Pinkston, Eugene Baylor, and even Judge Baker? Young turned just a little red, paused, then grimaced with embarrassed recollection. Oh, for goodness sake, he laughed. Where in the world has my mind been? You know, all this time I've been thinking of someone else. So you do know her. Well, yes, of course, many of us do. Young turned aside to greet some more people. When those people had gone, Marshall was still standing there. Marshall pressed. So, what about these private sessions? Does she really have a clientele, including community leaders, elected officials, regents at the college? Young looked directly at Marshall, and his eyes were a little cold. Marshal, just what is your specific concern here? Just doing my job. Whatever this is, it seems to be something the people of Ashton should know about, especially because it involves so many of the influential people who are shaping this town.
Well, if you are concerned about it, I'm not the person to talk to. You should go and ask Professor Langstrat herself. Oh, I intend to. I just wanted to give you the chance to give me some honest answers, something I feel you're not quite doing. Young's voice got a bit strained. Marshal, if I seem to be elusive, it is because what you are trying to pry into is protected by professional ethics. It is privileged information. I was simply hoping you would figure that out without my having to tell you. Kate was calling from the sidewalk. Marshal, we're all waiting for you. Marshal stepped away from the conversation, and it was just as well. It could only have gotten hotter from that point, and it was getting him nowhere anyway. Young was cool, very tough, and very slippery. A few states away, in a deep, secluded, and steep-sided valley rimmed by high mountains and carpeted with thick green ground cover and moss-tufted rock, a small but well-constructed cluster of buildings nestled like a lonely outpost in the center of the valley floor, accessible only by one rough and meandering gravel road. That little cluster of buildings, once a dismal and dilapidated old ranch, had been expanded into a complex of stone and brick buildings which now housed a small dormitory, an office complex, a dining hall, a maintenance building, a clinic, and several private dwellings. There were no signs, however, no labels anywhere, nothing to indicate where or what anything was. Drawing a charcoal streak across the sky, a sinister black object flew over the mountaintops and began to drop into the valley, piercing through the paper-thin layers of mist that hung in the air. Cloaked by oppressive spiritual darkness and silent as a black cloud, Baal Rephar, the prince of Babylon, floated along. He stayed close to the contour of the mountainside, maneuvering on a course that weaved this way and that among the dead snags and rocky crags. The canopy of darkness followed him like a cast shadow, like a tiny circle of night upon the landscape. A faint streak of red and yellow vapor trailed from his nostrils and hung in the air behind him like a long, slowly settling ribbon. Below, the ranch looked like a huge hive of hideous black insects, Several layers of ruthless warriors hovered almost stationary in a vast dome of defense over the complex, swords drawn, yellow eyes peering across the valley. Deep within this shell, demons of all shapes, sizes, and strengths darted about in a boiling mass of activity. As Rayfar dropped closer, he noted a concentration of black spirits around a large, multi-storied stone house on the fringe of the cluster. The strong man is there, he thought so he banked gently to one side, changing his course for that building. The outer sentinel saw him approaching and gave an eerie, siren-like wail. Immediately, the defenders radiated outward from Rafar's flight path, opening a channel through the defense layers. Rafar swooped skillfully through the channel as demons on all sides saluted him with upheld swords, their glowing eyes like thousands of painted yellow stars on black velvet. He ignored them and passed quickly through. The channel closed again behind him like a living gate. He floated slowly down through the roof of the house, through the attic, past rafters, wall, plaster, through an upstairs bedroom, through a thick beam-supported floor, and down into a spacious living room below. The evil in the room was thick and confining, the darkness like black liquid that swirled about with any motion of the limbs. The room was crowded. Baal Rephar, the prince of Babylon, the demon announced from somewhere, and monstrous demons all around the perimeter of the room bowed in respect. Rephar folded his wings in regal cape-like fashion and stood with an intimidating air of royalty and might, his jewels flashing impressively. His big yellow eyes studied carefully the orderly ranks of demons lined up all around him. A horrible gathering. These were spirits from the principality levels, princes themselves of their own nations, peoples, tribes. Some were from Africa, some were from the Orient, several were from Europe. All were invincible. Rafar noted their tremendous size and formidable appearance. They all matched him for size and ferocity, 
and he doubted he would ever venture to challenge any of them. To receive a bow from them was a great honor, a compliment indeed. Hail, Rayfor, said a gargling voice from the end of the room. The strong man. It was forbidden to speak his name. He was one of the few majesties intimate with Lucifer himself, a vicious global tyrant responsible over the centuries for resisting the plans of the living God and establishing Lucifer's kingdom on the earth. Rafar and his kind controlled nations, those such as the strong man controlled Rafar and his kind. The strong man rose from his place, and his huge form filled that part of the room. The evil that emanated from him could be felt everywhere, almost like an extension of his body. He was grotesque, hulking, his black hide hanging like sacks and curtains from his limbs and torso, his face a macabre landscape of bony prominences and deep-folded furrows. His jewels flashed brilliantly from his neck chest, arms, his big black wings draped his body like a royal robe and trailed along the floor. Rafar bowed low in homage, feeling the strong man's presence from clear across the room. Hail, my lord! The strong man never wasted words. Shall we be detained again? The errors of Prince Lucius are being corrected. The new resistance is failing, my lord. Soon the town will be ready. And what of the host of heaven? Limited. The strong man did not like Rayfar's answer. Rayfar could feel that distinctly. He spoke slowly. We have received reports of a strong captain of the host being sent to Ashton. I believe you know him. I have reason to believe Tal has been sent, but I have anticipated him. The big velvet-draped eyes burned with fury. Is it not this Tal who vanquished you at the fall of Babylon? Rafar knew he must answer, and quickly. It is this Tal. Then the delays have cost us our advantage. You have now been matched strength for strength. My lord, you will see what your servant can do. Bold words, Rafar, but your strengths can only succeed with immediacy. The strengths of our enemies grow with time. All will be ready. And what of the man of God and the newspaper man? Does my lord even give them his attention? Your lord wishes you to give them yours. They are powerless, my lord, and will soon be removed. But only if Tal is removed, the strong man said derisively. Let me see it happen before you bother me in boasting about it. Until then we remain confined here. Rafar, I will not wait long, nor shall you need to. The strong man only smirked. You have your orders. Begone! Rafar bowed low, and with an unfurling of his wings, he quietly rose through the house until he was outside. Then, with a furious burst of rage, he swooped upward, sending unexpecting demons tumbling out of the way. He picked up speed, his wings rushing in a blinding blur, and the defenders could barely get a channel open before he burst through it, trailing a hot stream of sulfurous breath. They closed up the channel again, giving each other curious looks as they watched him soar away. Rafar roared like a rocket up the side of the mountains and then out over the craggy peaks and back toward the little town of Ashton. In his rage, he cared not who saw him. He cared not about stealth or even decorum. Let the whole world see him and let it tremble. He was Rafar, the prince of Babylon. Let all the world bow before him or be decimated under the edge of his sword. Tal. The very name was bitterness itself on his tongue. The lords of Lucifer would never let him forget that defeat so long ago. Never until the day when Rafar redeemed his honor. 
and indeed he would. Rafar could see his sword gutting Tau and scattering him in shreds and pieces across the sky. He could feel the impact in his arms. He could hear the ripping sound of it. It was only a matter of time. Among the jagged rocks on one mountain summit, a silver-haired man came out of hiding to watch Rafar quickly shrink into the distance, etching a long black trail across the sky until he vanished over the horizon. The man took one more look at the demon-swarmed cluster of buildings in the valley, looked again toward the horizon, then vanished down the other side of the mountain in a flash of light and a flurry of wings. Chapter 14 well, thought Marshall, sooner or later I have to get around to it. On Thursday afternoon, when things were quiet, he closed himself in his office and made some phone calls, trying to track down Professor Julian Langstrat. He called the college, got the number of the psychology department, and went through two receptionists in two different offices before he finally found out that Langstrat was not in today and had an unlisted home number. Then Marshall thought of the very cooperative Albert Darr and gave his office a ring. Professor Darr was teaching, but would return his call if he would leave a message. Marshall left a message. Two hours later, Albert Darr returned Marshall's call, and he did have the unlisted number for Julian Langstrat's apartment. Marshall called the number. It was busy. The living room of Julian Langstrat's apartment was dimly lit by one small lamp on the mantel. The room was quiet, warm, and comfortable. The shades were drawn to block out distractions, bright light, and any other disturbances. The phone was off the hook. Julian Langstrat sat in her chair, speaking quietly to her counselee who sat opposite her. "'You hear only the sound of my voice,' she said." then repeated the sentence several times, quietly and clearly. You hear only the sound of my voice. This went on for several minutes until her subject was in a deep hypnotic trance. You are descending, descending deep within yourself. Langstrat watched the face of her subject carefully. She then extended her hands, palms out, fingers spread, and began to move her hands up and down just inches away from the subject's body, as if feeling for something. Release your true self. Let it go. It is infinite, at unity with all existence. Yes, I can feel it. Can you read my energy returning to you? The subject murmured. Yes. You are free from your body now. Your body is an illusion. You feel the bounds of your body dissolving away. Langstrat leaned in close, still using her hands. You are free now. Yes. Yes, I am free. I can feel your life force expanding. Yes, I can feel it. That's enough. You may stop there. Langstrat was intent, closely observing everything. Go back. Go back. Yes, I can feel you receding. In a moment you will feel me slipping from you. Don't be alarmed. I'm still here. In the next several minutes she brought her subject slowly back out of the trance, step by step, suggestion by suggestion. Finally she said, All right, when I count to three you will awake. One, two, three. Sandy Hogan opened her eyes, rolled them about dizzily, then took a deep breath, coming fully around. Wow, she responded. The three of them laughed together. Wasn't that something? asked Sean, sitting next to Langstrat. Wow, was all Sandy could say. This was a real first for Sandy. It had been Sean's idea, and though she hesitated at first, now she was very glad that she had gone along with it. The apartment shades were opened, and Sandy and Sean prepared to go back to their afternoon classes. "'Well, thank you for coming,' said the professor at the door. "'Thank you,' Sandy piped. "'And thank you for bringing her,' Langstrat told Sean. Then she said to the two of them, 
Now remember, I wouldn't advise speaking to anyone about this. It's a very personal and intimate experience that we should all respect. Yeah, right, right, said Sandy. Sean drove her back to campus. It was Friday again, and Hank sat at home in his little corner office looking anxiously at the clock. Mary was usually very reliable. She had said that she would be back before Carmen got there for her afternoon counseling appointment. Hank had no idea if there were any spies watching the house, but he could never be sure. All he needed was for someone to figure out that Carmen was dropping in to see him while Mary went grocery shopping. Hank's fearful side could envision all kinds of plots his enemies might be forming against him, such as sending some strange and seductive woman to compromise and ruin him. Well, he knew one thing. If Carmen didn't show a genuine responsiveness to the counseling and begin to apply real solutions to a real problem, that would be the end of it as far as he was concerned. Uh oh there was the doorbell. He sneaked a look out the window. Carmen's red Fiat was parked out front. Yes, she was standing at the door in broad daylight in full view of ten or fifteen houses. The way she was dressed today made Hank figure he'd better let her in quickly if only to get her out of sight. Where, oh, where was Mary? Mary was not sure she liked the new owners of what used to be Joe's Market. Oh, it wasn't their service or the way they ran the store or whether or not they were friendly. They were okay in most of those departments, and Mary also figured it would take time for them to know everyone, and vice versa. What bothered Mary was how obviously secretive they became any time she asked them whatever became of Joe Carlucci and his family. As far as Mary could find out, Joe, Angelina, and their children left Ashton abruptly and didn't tell anyone, and so far no one could be found who even knew where they went. Oh, well, she hurried out of the store and toward her car, a young box boy pushing a cart of groceries along behind her. She opened the trunk and watched the boy load the groceries in. And then she felt it. Suddenly, without any apparent reason, an unexplainable tinge of emotion, an odd mixture of fear and depression. She felt cold, nervous, a little shaky, and could think of nothing but getting out of that place and hurrying home. Triscoll had been accompanying her, guarding her, and he felt it too. With a metallic ring and a flash of light, his sword was instantly in his hand. Too late. From somewhere behind him came a stunning blow on the back of his neck. He toppled forward. His wings shot out to steady him, but an incredible weight came down on his back like a pile driver and pinned him down. He could see their feet like the clawed feet of hideous reptiles and the red flicker of their blades. He could hear their sulfurous hissing. He looked up. At least a dozen demonic warriors surrounded him. They were towering, fierce, with glowing yellow eyes and dripping fangs, and they were sneering and gargling with laughter. Triscoll looked to see if Mary was all right. He knew her safety would soon be threatened if he didn't act. But what could he do? What was that? He suddenly felt an intense wave of evil rolling over him. Pick him up, said a voice like thunder. A vice-like hand curled around his neck and jerked him up as if he were a toy. Now he was looking at all these spirits eye to eye. They were newcomers to Ashton. He had never seen such size, strength, and brazenness. Their bodies were covered with thick iron-like scales. Their arms rippled with power. Their faces were mocking. Their sulfurous breath choked him. They turned him around and held him tightly, and he found himself face to face with a vision of sheer horror. Flanked by no less than ten more huge demonic warriors, a gargantuan spirit stood with an S-curved sword in his monstrous black hand. Rafar. The thought coursed through Triscoll's mind like a death sentence. Every inch of his being tightened with the anticipation of blows, defeat, unbearable pain. The big fanged mouth broke into a mocking and hideous grin. Amber saliva dripped from the fangs, and sulfur chugged forth in rancid clouds as the giant warlord chuckled mockingly. Are you so surprised? Rafar asked. You should feel privileged. You, little angel, are the first to look upon me. 
And how are you today? Hank asked as he showed Carmen to a comfortable chair in his office area. She sank into the chair with a coo and a sigh, and Hank began to wonder where he left his tape recorder. He knew he was innocent of wrongdoing here, but some proof would be nice. I'm much better, she answered, and her voice was pleasant and even. You know, maybe you can tell me why, but I haven't heard any voices talking to me all week. Oh, hmm, yeah, said Hank, finally getting his counselor's thoughts in gear. Uh, that was what we were talking about, wasn't it? Triscoll looked toward Mary. She was thanking the box boy and closing her trunk. Rayfar watched Triscoll amused. Oh, I see. You are here to protect her. From what? Did you expect to swat mere flies? Triscoll had no answer. Rayfar's tone became cruel and cutting. No, you are mistaken, little angel. It is a much greater power with whom you have to do. Rayfar tapped the ground with his sword, and Triscoll immediately felt the iron hands of two demons clamping his arms from behind. He looked toward Mary. She was looking for the key to the car door. She was getting into the car. Another demon stretched out his sword and pierced the hood of the car. Mary tried to start the engine. Nothing happened. Rayfar looked toward the nearby laundromat that faced the parking lot. A young, greasy-looking character stood in front of it, leaning against a post. Triscoll could tell the man was possessed by one of Rayfar's henchmen, as a matter of fact, several of them. At Rayfar's nod, the demons went into action, and the man started walking toward Mary's car. Mary checked her lights. No, she had not left them on. She turned the key on and turned on the radio. It played. The horn honked. What on earth was the matter? She saw the young character coming her way from the direction of the laundromat. Oh, great. As Triscoll watched helplessly, the demons guided the man up to the car window. Hey, cutie, he said. Having some trouble here? Mary looked out at him. He was skinny, dirty, and dressed in black leather and chrome chains. She called through the windows. Uh, no thanks, I'm all right. He only smirked, eyeing her up and down as he asked. Why don't you open up and let me see what I can do? Hank didn't feel right about any of this. Where was Mary? At least Carmen was making a little more sense this time. She seemed to be dealing with her problems intelligently and with a genuine desire to change things. Maybe it would be different this time, but Hank wasn't counting on it. So, he asked, what do you suppose became of those amorous voices in the night? I don't listen to them anymore, she answered. There's one thing you helped me to realize just by talking about it. Those voices aren't real. I've only been fooling myself. Hank was very gentle when he agreed. Yes, I think you're right. She heaved a deep sigh and looked at him with those big blue eyes. <sighs> I was trying to cope with my loneliness, that's all. I think that was it. Pastor, you're just so strong. I wish I could be that way. Well, the Bible says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Uh-huh. Where's your wife? Getting groceries. She should be back any minute. Well, Carmen leaned forward and smiled ever so sweetly. I'm really drawing strength from your company. I want you to know that. Mary could feel her heart pounding. What would this guy do next? The man leaned against the window, and his breath fogged the glass as he said, Say, sweetheart, why don't you tell me your name? Rayfar grabbed Triscoll by the hair and jerked his head around. Triscoll thought his head would snap off. Rayfar breathed sulfur right into Triscoll's face as he said, And now, little angel, I will have words with you. The tip of the long sword came up to Triscoll's throat. Where is your captain? Triscoll did not answer. Rayfar yanked his head around and let him look toward Mary. The man tried the latch on Mary's door. She was terrified. She groped for every lock button in the car, pushing each one down only seconds before the man could grab the outside latch.
He tried all the doors, a leering smile on his face. Mary tried the horn again. A demon had already taken care of that. It didn't work. Rafar twisted Triskal's head back again, and the cold blade pressed against Triskal's face. I will ask you again, where is your captain? Carmen was still telling Hank how much good this counseling was doing her, how he reminded her of her former husband, and how she was looking for a man with his qualities. Hank had to put a lid on this stuff. Well, he finally cut in. Do you have any other people in your life that you feel are significant as far as strength, support, friendship, those kinds of things? She looked at him just a little mournfully. Sort of. I have friends who hang out at the tavern, but nothing ever lasts. She let her thoughts brew for a moment, then asked, Do you think I'm attractive? The man in black leather leaned close to Mary's window, threatened her with horrible obscenities, then started banging on the glass with a large metal buckle. Rafar nodded to a warrior whose hand passed through Mary's window and grasped the lock button, ready to pull it up at Rafar's order. The demons and the young man were drooling and ready. His hand was on the latch. Rafar made sure Triskal could see it all and then asked, Your answer? Triskal finally spoke, moaning, The break! Rafar held him tighter, leaning closer. I didn't hear you. Triskal repeated it. The break! Mary had a flash. The car was parked on an incline. It wasn't much, but it might be enough to get the car moving. She released the parking brake and the car started to roll. The creep wasn't expecting that. He banged on the window, tried to get around in front of the car to stop it, but it began to roll at a steady clip, and he soon realized that his efforts to stop it were becoming a little too obvious to other shoppers. A husky contractor standing by his big four-wheeler finally saw what was going on and hollered, Hey, creep! What are you doing? Rafar watched it happen, his rising anger coursing through his big iron fist, making it tighten more and more around Triskal. Triskal thought his neck would crack at any moment. But then Rafar seemed to give in. Desist, he ordered the demons. They backed off. The man gave up the chase and tried to saunter nonchalantly away. The big contractor started after him, and he fled. The car kept rolling. There was an exit from the parking lot that emptied onto a back street with a fairly good grade. Mary steered for it, hoping no other cars or pedestrians would get in her way. Triscoll saw that she would make it. So did Rafar. The cold steel of his blade pressed against Triscoll's throat. Well done, little angel. You have spared your charge until a more opportune time. I will leave you with only a message for today. Pay careful attention. With that, Rafar released Triskal into the hands of his henchmen. One huge, warty demon pounded his iron fist into Triskal's torso and sent him spinning into the air where another demon intercepted him with a swat of his sword, carving a deep gash in his back. Triskal fluttered and tumbled down in a daze, into the clutches of two more demons who pummeled his limp body with iron fists and tore at him with talon feet. For several horrible minutes the demons made violent sport with him as Rafar coldly watched. Finally the great Baal gave a growled command, and the warriors let Triskal go. He flopped to the ground, and Rafar's big taloned foot stomped down on his neck. The huge sword swung down and waved in small circles before Triskal's eyes as the demon master spoke. You will tell your captain that Rafar, the prince of Babylon, is looking for him. The big foot pressed harder. You will tell him. Suddenly Triskal was alone, a limp, ragged wreck. He struggled to his feet again. All he could think of now was Mary. Hank gently took hold of Carmen's hand, lifted it off his own, and placed it courteously in her lap. He held it there for just a moment and looked into her eyes with compassion and yet firmness. He let go of it and then leaned back in his chair to a safe distance. 
Carmen, he said with a soft and understanding voice, I'm very flattered that you're so impressed with my masculine qualities. And really, I have no doubts that a woman of your particular qualities will will have no trouble finding a good man with whom to build a lasting and meaningful relationship. But listen, I don't mean to sound abrupt, but I have to emphasize one thing right here and now. I am not that man. I'm here as a minister and counselor, and we have to keep this relationship strictly limited to that of a counselor and his client. Carmen seemed very disturbed and very offended. What are you saying to me? I'm saying that we really can't continue these appointments. They're causing emotional conflicts for you. I think you'll be better off going to someone else. Hank couldn't explain why, but even as he said that, he felt like he had just won some kind of battle. From the icy look in Carmen's eyes, he figured she had lost. Mary was crying, wiping the tears from her face with her sleeve and praying a mile a minute. Father God, dear Jesus, save me, save me. The hill was beginning to flatten out. The car slowed down fifteen, ten, five miles an hour. She looked behind and saw no one following, but she was too scared by now to be comforted. She just wanted to get home. Then up the street behind her and about ten feet above the ground, Triscoll flew his clothes flashing with white-hot light and his wings rushing. His flight path was wobbly and the rhythm of his wings out of sync, but he was determined nevertheless. His face was etched with deep concern for her welfare. He spread his tattered, fluttering wings like a large canopy and let them break him to a stop as he settled down onto the roof of the car. By now it was barely rolling, and Mary just kept crying and wailing, jerking her body in futile attempts to urge the car onward. Triscoll reached down through the roof and gently placed his hand on Mary's shoulder. Shh! Be calm. It's all right now. You're safe. She looked behind her again and began to quiet down a little. Triscoll spoke to her heart. The Lord has saved you. He won't let you go. You're all right. The car was almost to a complete stop now. Mary pulled it over to the side of the street and parked it while she still had the momentum to do so. She pulled on the parking brake and sat there for several minutes just to compose herself. That's it, said Triscoll, comforting her in her spirit. Rest in the Lord. He's here. Triscoll slid off the roof of the car and reached his arm down through the hood, probing around. He found whatever it was he was looking for. Mary, he said, why don't you try again? Mary sat in the car thinking to herself that the stupid thing would never start and what horrible timing it had to die and leave her in such a fix. Come on, Triscoll prodded. Take a step of faith. Trust God. You never know what he might do. Mary decided to take one more stab at starting the car even though she had little faith that anything would happen. She twisted the key. The engine cranked over, then sputtered, then started. She gave it several powerful revs just to make sure it stayed awake. Then, still in a very great hurry to get home to Hank's protecting arms, she pulled out into the street and hot-rodded for home with Triscoll riding on the roof. Hank was very relieved to hear the slam of the car door outside. Oh, that must be Mary. Carmen got up. I guess I'd better go. Now that Mary was here, Hank added, Oh, listen, you don't have to. You can stay for a while. No, no, I'll just leave. Maybe I ought to go out the back, even. No, don't be silly. Here, I'll see you to the door. I need to help Mary with those groceries anyway. But Mary had forgotten about the groceries and only wanted to get inside the house. Triscoll ran beside her. He was battered and limping, his clothing was torn, and he could still feel the fiery wound in his back. Hank opened the door. Hi, hon. Boy, I was getting worried about you. Then he saw her tear-filled eyes. Hey, what? Carmen screamed. It was a sudden, heart-piercing scream that halted every thought and stifled any words. Hank spun around, not knowing what to expect. No! 
Carmen shrieked, her arms guarding her face. Are you mad? Get away from me, you hear? Get away! As Hank and Mary both looked on in horror, Carmen backed into the room, waving her arms as if trying to shield herself from some invisible attacker. She stumbled around the room, she tumbled over the furniture, she cursed and spewed horrible obscenities. She was terrified and enraged at the same time, her eyes wide and glassy, her face contorted. Creone tried to grab Triscoll and hold him back. Triscoll had glorified and was a shimmering white. His tattered wings filled the room and glimmered like a thousand rainbows. He held a gleaming sword in his hand, and the sword flashed and sang in blinding arcs as he engaged in a frenzied battle with lust, a hideous demon with a black-scaled slippery body like a lizard and a red tongue that lashed about his face like the tail of a snake. Lust was first defending himself, then lashing back with his glowing red sword, the crescent blade cutting crimson arcs through the air. The swords clashed with explosions of fire and light. Let me be, I tell you! Lust screamed, his wings propelling him like a trapped hornet about the room. Let him be, shouted Creone, trying to hold Triscoll back while staying out of the path of that infinitely sharp blade. Do you hear my order? Let him be! At last Triscoll withdrew, but held his sword steady and kept it raised in front of him, the light from the blade illuminating his raging face, his burning eyes. Carmen calmed down, rubbed her eyes, and looked about the room with a frightened expression. Hank and Mary went to her immediately and tried to comfort her. "'What's wrong, Carmen?' Mary asked, wide-eyed and concerned. "'It's just me, Mary. Did I do something?' I didn't mean to scare you. No, no, moaned Carmen. It wasn't you. It was somebody else. Who? What? Lust backed off, his sword still held high. Creone told him, We will give place to you no longer today. Be gone, and don't come here again. Lust folded his wings and circled carefully around the two heavenly warriors and over to the door. I was leaving anyway, the demon hissed. I was leaving anyway, said Carmen, composing herself. There's, there's bad energy in this place. Goodbye. She bolted out the door. Mary tried to call after her, but Hank touched Mary's arm and let her know that silence would be best for now. Creone held Triscoll until the light around him faded and he replaced his sword. Triscoll was shaking. Triscoll, Creone scolded. You know Tal's orders. I was with Hank the whole time. He did just fine. There was no need. Then Creone saw Triscoll's many injuries and the deep wound in his back. Triscoll, what happened? I, I could not let myself be assailed by still another. Triscoll gasped. Creone, we are more than matched. Mary finally remembered that she was about to cry. She picked up where she had left off. Mary, what in the world is going on here? Hank asked, putting his arms around her. Just close the door, honey, she cried. Just close the door and hold me, please. Chapter 15 Kate grabbed the kitchen towel and hurriedly wiped her hands so she could pick up the phone. Hello? Hi there. It was Marshall. Kate knew what was coming. It had been happening a lot the last two weeks. Marshall, I am cooking dinner, and I am cooking enough for all four of us. Yeah, well... Marshall had the tone of voice he always used when he was about to weasel out of something. Marshall? Then Kate turned her back toward the living room where Sandy and Sean were studying and talking, but mostly talking. She didn't want them to see the distress in her face. She lowered her voice. I want you to come home for dinner. You've been out late all this week. You've been so busy and so preoccupied, I hardly have a husband anymore. Kate, Marshall broke in. It won't be as bad as you thought. I'm just calling to say I'll be a little late. Not that I won't be there. How late? Oh, brother. 
Marshall wasn't sure at all. How about an hour? Kate couldn't think of what to say. She only sighed in disgust and anger. Marshall tried to appease her. Listen, I'll get there as soon as I can. Kate decided to say it over the phone. She might never get the chance any other time. Marshall, I'm concerned about Sandy. What's wrong with her now? Oh, she could just punch him for that tone of voice. Marshall, if you'd just be around here once in a while, you'd know. She's... I don't know. She just isn't the same old Sandy anymore. I'm afraid of what Sean is doing to her. What Sean is doing to her? <laughs> I can't talk about it over the phone. Now Marshall sighed. All right, all right. We'll talk about it. When, Marshall? Oh, tonight when I get home. We can't talk right in front of them. I mean... Oh, you know what I mean. Marshall was tiring of this conversation. Well, just get home, Marshall, please. All right, all right. Marshall hung up the phone with hardly a loving gentleness. For a split second, he regretted the act and thought about how it must have made Kate feel. But he forced his thoughts onward to the next very pressing project, interviewing Professor Julene Langstrat. Friday evening. She should be home now. He dialed the number, and this time it rang. And rang. And rang one more time. Click. Hello. Hello, this is Marshall Hogan, editor of the Ashton Clarion. Am I speaking with Professor Julene Langstrat? Yes, you are. What can I do for you, Mr. Hogan? My daughter Sandy has been in some of your classes. She seemed pleased to hear that. Oh, very good. At any rate, I was wondering if we might set up a date for an interview. Well, you'd have to speak with one of my teacher assistants. They're the ones responsible for checking the progress and problems of the students. The classes are at large, you understand. Oh, well, no, that's not exactly what I had in mind. I was thinking I'd like to interview you. Pertaining to your daughter? I'm afraid I don't know her. I wouldn't be able to tell you much. Well, we could talk a little about the class, of course, but I was also curious about the other interests you're pursuing there on the campus, the elective classes you've been teaching at night. Oh, she said with a down note at the end that didn't sound promising. Well, that was part of an experimental college idea we were trying. If you wish to check that out, the registrar might have some old flyers available. But I should inform you that I am very uncomfortable with the idea of granting any interview to the press, and I really cannot do so. So you're not willing to discuss the very influential people you have among your circle of friends? I don't understand the question. And it sounded like she didn't appreciate it either. Alf Brumell, Chief of Police, Reverend Oliver Young, Dolores Pinkston, Dwight Brandon, Eugene Baylor, Judge John Baker. I have no comment, she said sharply, and I really have some other things that are very pressing. Is there anything else I can help you with? Well, Marshall thought he'd go ahead and try for it. I guess the only other thing I could ask you about is why you ejected me from your class. Now she was getting indignant. I don't know what you're talking about. Your class on Monday afternoon, two weeks ago, the psychology of self, I think it was. I'm the big guy you told to leave. She began to laugh incredulously. I haven't the slightest idea what you're talking about. You must have the wrong person. You don't remember telling me to wait outside? I am convinced you have me mixed up with someone else. Well, do you have long blonde hair? She said simply, Good night, Mr. Hogan, and hung up. Marshall stood there a moment, then asked himself, Come on, Hogan, what did you expect? He dropped the receiver into the cradle and went out into the front office, where a question from Bernice grabbed his attention. So, I'd like to know how you're finally going to corner Langstrat, she quipped, flipping through some papers at her desk. Marshall felt like his face must be awfully red. Boy, your face is sure red, Bernice confirmed. 
talking to too many temperamental women in one night, he explained. Langstrat was one of them. Boy, I thought Harmel was bad. Bernice turned around, excited. You got Langstrat on the phone? For all of thirty-two seconds, she had absolutely nothing to say to me, and she didn't remember kicking me out of her class. Bernice made a screwy face. Isn't it funny how no one seems to remember having any encounters with us? Marshall, we must be invisible. How about very undesirable and very inconvenient? Well, Bernice said, going back to her paperwork, Professor Langstrat probably has been very busy, too busy to talk to nosy reporters. A wad of paper bounced off her head. She turned around and saw Marshall looking over some lists. He looked like he couldn't possibly have tossed that little projectile. He said, Boy, I wonder if I could contact Harmel again. But he won't talk either. The same wad of paper bounced off his ear. He looked at Bernice, and she was dead serious, all business. Well, it's obvious he knew too much. It's my guess that both he and former Dean Strawn are running good and scared. Yeah. Marshall had a memory come to the surface. Harmel talked that way, warning me. He said something like, I'd be out on my ear like everybody else. So who's everybody else? Yeah. Who else do we know who could have been removed? Bernice looked over some of her notes. Well, you know, now that I look over this list, none of these people have really been in their position for a very long time. The wad of paper ricocheted off her head and skittered across her desk. So who did they replace? Marshall asked. Bernice solemnly picked up the wad of paper as she said, We can check that out. In the meantime, the most obvious thing to do is to call Strawn and see what... She hurled the wad at Marshall. He has to say... Marshall grabbed the wad in mid-flight and quickly crumpled another one to add to his arsenal, sending them both back in Bernice's direction. Bernice began to prepare an adequate counterattack. All right, Marshall said, starting to crack up with laughter. I'll give him a ring. He was suddenly in the middle of a blizzard of paper wads. But I think we better get out of here. My wife's waiting. Bernice was not finished with the war yet, so they finished it and then had to clean up before they could leave. Rafar paced up and down the dark basement room, chugging out hot breath that became a layer of cloud obscuring him from the shoulders up. He pounded his fists together. He tore invisible enemies in his outstretched talons. He cursed and fumed. Lucius stood with the other warriors, waiting for Rafar to calm down and give the reason for calling this meeting. Lucius rather enjoyed the little scene before him. Obviously, Rafar, the great braggart, had been cut down to size in his meeting with the strong man. Lucius could hardly keep a hideous smirk off his face. Wouldn't the little angel tell you where you could find this, uh, uh, what was that name again? Lucius asked, knowing full well Tal's name. Tal! Rafar roared, and Lucius could detect Rafar's humiliation at the very sound of the name. The little angel, the helpless little angel, told you nothing. Rafar's immediate response was a monstrous black fist clamped instantly around Lucius's throat. Do you mock me, little imp? Lucius had learned the right tone of groveling to please this tyrant. Oh, be not offended, great one. I only seek your pleasure. Then seek this tower. Rafar growled. He released Lucius and turned to all the other demons present. All of you, seek this towel. I want him in my hands to shred him at my pleasure. This battle could be settled easily between the two of us. Find him. Bring me word. Lucius tried to hide his words behind a whimpering tone, but they were especially selected for another purpose. Indeed we shall, great one, but surely this town must be a formidable foe to have routed you at the fall of Babylon. Whatever will you do, should we find him? Will you dare to assail him again? Rafar grinned, his fangs shining. You will see what your Baal can do. And may we not see what this Tal can do? 
Rafar drew close to Lucius and stared him down with fiery yellow orbs. When I have vanquished this Tal and hurled his little pieces across the skies as my victory banner, I will most certainly give you your chance to better me. I will relish every moment of it. Rafar turned away, and for an instant the whole room was filled with his black wings before he shot upward through the building and into the sky. For hours afterwards, as angels all over Ashton watched from their hiding places, the Baal flew slowly over the town like a sinister vulture, his sword visible and challenging. Up, down, back and forth he flew, weaving in among the downtown buildings, then soaring high above the town in graceful arcs. Down below, through the window of an obscure store basement, Cyan watched as Rafar passed overhead again. He turned to his captain, who sat nearby on some appliance crates with Gylo, Triscal, and Mota. Triscal, with the help of others, was getting himself patched up and back together again. I don't understand, said Cyan. What's he think he's doing? Tal looked up from Triscal's wounds and said matter-of-factly, He's trying to draw me out. Mota added, He wants the captain. Apparently he has offered great honors to whatever demon can find Captain Tal and report his whereabouts. Gylo said gruffly, The devils are crawling all over the church with no other aim. It was the first place they looked. Tal anticipated Cyan's next question and answered it. Signa and the others are still there at the church. We've tried to keep our guard there looking as it usually does. Cyan watched Rafar circle over the far side of the town and come back for another pass. Ought have trouble being taunted by such as him. Tal spoke the truth without shame. If I were to meet him now, I would most certainly lose, and he knows it. Our prayer cover is insufficient, while he has all the backing he needs. They could all hear the rushing of Rafar's huge leathery wings and see his shadow fall over the building for an instant as he passed overhead. We will all have to be very, very careful. Hank was walking through the town again, up and down the streets and storefronts, driven by the Lord and praying with every step he took. He had a feeling that God had some particular purpose for this little jaunt, but he couldn't begin to guess what it was. Creone and Triscal walked on either side of him. They had gotten some extra reserves to stay at the house and watch over Mary. They were wary and alert, and Triscal, still recovering from his recent encounter with Rafar, felt especially edgy when he considered where they were leading Hank. Hank took a turn he had never taken before, down a street he had never looked at before, and finally stopped outside a business establishment he had only heard bad stories about but could never find. He stood outside the door, staring, amazed at the number of kids going in and out like bees. Finally, he stepped inside. Creone and Triscal tried their very best to look meek and unthreatening as they followed him. The cave was aptly named. The power it took to run the rows upon rows of flickering, beeping video games was made up for by the total absence of any other lights except a little blue globe here and there in the black ceiling with an occasional watt meandering through it. There was more sound than light. Heavy metal rock music pounded from speakers all around the room and clashed painfully with the myriads of electronic sounds tumbling out of the machines. One lone proprietor sat behind his little cash register in the corner, reading a girly magazine whenever he wasn't making change for the game players. Hank had never seen so many quarters in one place. Here were kids of all ages with few other places to go, congregating after school and all through the weekends to hang out, hang on, play games, pair up, wander off, do drugs, do sex, do whatever. Hank knew this place was a hellhole. It wasn't the machines or the decor or the dimness. It was just the pungent spiritual stench of demons having their heyday. He felt sick to his stomach. Creone and Triscal could see hundreds of narrowing yellow eyes peering at them from the corners and dark hiding places of the room. Already they had heard several metallic rings as blades were drawn and made ready. Do I look harmless enough? 
Triscoll quietly asked. They do not think you are harmless anymore, Crione said dryly. The two looked around at all the eyes looking back at them. They smiled in a truce-like way, raising their empty hands to show no intent of hostility. The demons made no reply, but several blades could be seen glowing in the dark. So, where is Seth? Triscoll asked. On his way, I'm sure. Triscoll tensed. Crioni followed his look to see a surly demon approaching them. The demon's hand was on his sword. He hadn't drawn it, but plenty of other swords were drawn behind him. The black spirit looked the two angels up and down and hissed. You are not welcome here. What is your business? Crioni answered quickly and politely. We are watching over the man of God. The demon took one look at Hank and lost the better portion of his cockiness. Bush, he exclaimed nervously, while those behind him backed away. What is he doing here? That's nothing we wish to discuss, said Triscoll. The demon only sneered. Are you Triscoll? I am. The demon laughed, coughing up puffs of red and yellow. You enjoy a fight, don't you? Several demons joined him in laughter. Triscoll had no intention of answering. The demon had no time to demand an answer. Suddenly all the mocking spirits grew tense and agitated. Their eyes darted about, and then like a flock of timid birds they backed away and huddled in the dark corners. At the same time, Crioni and Triscoll could feel a new strength coursing through them. They looked down at Hank. He was praying. Dear Lord, he said silently, help us to reach these kids. Help us to touch their lives. Hank was praying at a very good time, considering the commotion just coming in the back door. As demons slinked away from the entrance, three of their comrades came into the building, wailing, hissing, and drooling their arms and wings over their heads. They were chased and prodded along by a very tall and quite unshakable angelic warrior. Well, said Triscoll, Seth has brought us Ron Forsyth, and then some. I was afraid of that, said Crioni. Triscoll was referring to a young man barely visible under the three demons, a very confused and disoriented victim of their destructive influence. They clung to him like leeches, causing him to stagger to and fro as they fought to avoid the goading tip of the big warrior's sword. Seth had them under very tight control, however, and he herded them right toward Hank Bush. "'Hey, Ron!' said some guys at a bombardier game. "'Hey!' was all Ron answered, giving them a slow, heavy wave of his hand. He did not seem very happy. Hank heard the name and saw Ron Forsyth coming and for a moment he didn't know whether to remain where he was or get out of harm's way. Ron was a tall, spindly youth with long, unkempt hair, dirty T-shirt and jeans, and eyes that seemed to be looking into some other universe. He staggered toward Frank, looking over his shoulder as if a flock of birds was chasing him, and then forward as if he were one step from a cliff. Hank, watching him approach, decided to remain right where he was. If the Lord wanted the two of them to meet, well, it was about to happen. Then Ron stopped short and leaned against a road racing game. This man standing in front of him looked familiar. The demons clinging to Ron were shaking and whimpering, shooting glances toward Seth behind them and Crioni and Triscoll in front of them. As for the other demons in the room, they were itching for a fight. Their yellow eyes shifted about and their red blades clattered, but something held them back. That praying man. Hi there, Hank said to the young man. I'm Hank Bush. Ron's glassy eyes widened. He stared at Hank and said with slurred speech, I've seen you around. You're that preacher my folks keep talking about. Hank was sure enough now to guess. Ron? Ron Forsyth? Ron looked around and fidgeted as if he'd been caught doing something illegal. Yeah. Hank stretched out his hand. Well, God bless you, Ron. I'm glad to meet you. The three demons snarled at that, but the three warriors shifted their weight forward just a little and kept them under control. Divination, 
said Tristal, identifying one of the demons. Divination clung to Ron with needle-sharp talons and hissed. And what is your business with us? The lad, said Creone. You can't tell us what to do. Another demon squawked, its fists stubbornly clenched. Rebellion? Creone asked. The demon did not deny it. He belongs to us. The spirits in the room were getting braver, moving in closer. Let's get him out of here, said Creone. Hank touched Ron on the shoulder and said, Can we step outside where we can visit for a minute? Divination and Rebellion spoke together. What for? Ron protested. What for? Hank just led him gently. Come on. And they went out the back door. Triscoll remained in the doorway, his hand on his sword. Only the demons attached to Ron were allowed outside, constantly corralled by Seth and Creone. Ron sank onto a nearby bench like a rag doll in slow motion. Hank put his hand on Ron's shoulder and kept looking into those dazed eyes, wondering where to start. How are you feeling? Hank finally asked. The third demon enclosed Ron's head in his bulky, slimy arms. The boy's head drooped toward his chest, and he almost nodded off, oblivious to Hank's words. The tip of Seth's sword got the demon's attention. What? it screeched. Sorcery? The spirit laughed drunkenly. I'm more and more. He'll never give it up. Ron started to chuckle, feeling drugged and silly. But Hank could feel something in his spirit, the same horrible presence he had felt that one very frightening night. Evil spirits in such a young boy. Lord, what can I do? What can I say? The Lord answered, and Hank knew what he had to do. Ron, he said, whether Ron heard him or not, can I pray for you? Only Ron's eyes turned to look at Hank, and Ron actually pleaded, Yeah, pray for me, preacher. But the demons wanted no part of that. They all cried into Ron's brain with one voice, No, 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 you don't need that. Ron suddenly stirred, his head rocked back and forth, and he mumbled, No, no, don't pray. I don't like that. Now Hank wondered what Ron really wanted. Or was it even Ron who was speaking? I would like to pray for you, okay? Hank asked just to check. No, don't, Ron said and then pleaded. Please pray. Come on. Do it, Creone prompted. Pray. No, the demons cried. You can't make us leave him. Pray, said Creone. Hank knew he had better take charge of the situation and pray for this boy. He already had his hand on Ron, so he started praying very gently. Lord Jesus, I pray for Ron. Please touch him, Lord, and get through to his mind and set him free from these spirits that are hanging on to him. The spirits clung to Ron like spoiled brats and whined at Hank's prayer. Ron moaned and shook his head some more. He tried to get up. Then he sat down again and held Hank's arm. The Lord spoke to Hank again, and Hank had a name. Sorcery, let go of him in the name of Jesus. Ron squirmed on the bench and cried out as if struck with a knife. Hank thought Ron would squeeze his arm off. But sorcery obeyed. He whined and hollered and spit, but he obeyed, fluttering away into the nearby trees. Ron gave an anguished sigh and looked at Hank with eyes full of pain and desperation. Come on, come on, you're doing it. Hank was amazed. He took hold of Ron's hand just to assure him and kept looking into those eyes. They were clearer now. Hank could see an earnest, pleading soul looking back at him. What next? he asked the Lord. The Lord answered, and Hank had another name. Divination? Ron looked right at Hank, his eyes wild and his voice hoarse. No, not me, never. But Hank didn't stop. He looked right into Ron's eyes and said, 
divination in Jesus' name. Let go. No, Ron protested, but then said just as quickly, Go on, divination, get out. I don't want you with me anymore. Divination grudgingly obeyed. Thanks to this praying man, oppressing Ron Forsyth wasn't fun anymore. Ron relaxed again, sniffing back some tears. Seth poked the last little demon. How about you, Rebellion? Rebellion was having trouble making up his mind. Ron could feel it. Spirit, please go. I've had it with you. Hank prayed the same thing. Spirit, go. In the name of Jesus, leave Ron alone. Rebellion considered Ron's words, looked at Seth's sword, looked at the praying man, and finally let go. Ron twitched as if having a terrible cramp, but then he said, Yeah. Yeah, he's out. Seth shooed the three demons away, and they fluttered back into the cave where they would be welcome and unhampered. Hank hung on to Ron's hand and waited, watching and praying until he knew what else to do. This was all so incredible, so fascinating, so frightening, but so necessary. This must be the Lord's lesson number two in spiritual combat. Hank knew he was learning something he would have to know to win this battle. Ron was changing before Hank's very eyes, relaxing, breathing easier, his eyes returning to a normal down-to-earth gaze. Hank finally said a very soft, Amen and asked, Are you okay, Ron? Ron answered right away, Yeah, I feel better. Thanks. He looked at Hank and smiled a weak, almost apologetic smile. It's funny. No, it's neat. It, it was just today I was thinking I needed somebody to pray for me. I just couldn't go on with all the stuff I've been into. Hank knew what had happened. It was the Lord, I think, who set it up. Nobody's prayed for me before. I know your folks do all the time. Well, yeah, they do. And the rest of us at the church, too. We're all pulling for you. Ron took his first clear-eyed look at Hank. So you're my folks' pastor, huh? I thought you were older than that. Not too much older, Hank quipped. Are the other people at the church like you? Hank chuckled. We're all just people. We have our good points and our bad points. But we all have Jesus, and he gives us a special love for each other. They talked. They talked about school, the town, Ron's folks, drugs in general in particular, Hank's church, the Christians who were around, and Jesus. Ron began to notice that no matter what the subject or the issue, Hank had a way of bringing Jesus into it. Ron didn't mind. This wasn't like a phony sales pitch. Hank Bush really believed that Jesus was the answer to everything. So, after talking about everything else with Jesus brought into it, Ron let Hank talk about Jesus. Just Jesus. It wasn't dull. Hank could really get excited about him. Chapter 16 Nathan and Armoth flew high above the beautiful summer countryside following the speeding Buick. Things were definitely quieter out here, away from strife torn Ashton. Still, neither one felt entirely comfortable about the two passengers in the car below. Although the heavenly escorts weren't yet certain, they had a feeling that a covert plot on the part of Rayfar and his guerrillas might be underway. Marshall and his good-looking young reporter were too critical a combination for those devils to pass up. Former college dean Eldon Strawn lived on a quaint and unpretentious ten-acre farm an hour away from Ashton. He was not farming the place, just living there. And as Marshall and Bernice drove up the long gravel driveway, they could tell his interests extended no further than the immediate yard of the white farmhouse. The lawn was small and manicured, the fruit trees pruned and bearing, the flower beds soft with freshly turned and weeded soil. Some chickens meandered about, pecking and scratching. A collie greeted their approach with furious barking. Wow, a normal human being to interview for once, said Marshall. That's why he moved out of Ashton, said Bernice. 
Strawn stepped onto his porch as the collie ran and barked beside him. Hi there, he called to Marshall and Bernice as they got out of the car. Quiet now, now, lady, he called to the collie. Lady never obeyed such commands. Strawn was a healthy, white-haired fellow who got plenty of exercise on this place and showed it. He wore work clothes and still carried a pair of garden gloves in his hand. Marshall extended his hand for a good firm handshake. So did Bernice. They exchanged introductions, and then Strawn invited them around the barking lady and into the house. Doris, Strawn called. Mr. Hogan and Miss Kruger are here. Within minutes, Doris, a sweet and rotund little grandma type, had set the coffee table with tea, coffee, rolls, and goodies. And they were having a pleasant conversation about the farm, the countryside, the weather, the neighbor's wandering cow. They all knew it was obligatory, and besides, the Strawns were very pleasant people to talk and visit with. Finally, Eldon Strawn introduced the transitional sentence. Yes, I suppose things in Ashton aren't quite this nice. Bernice got out her notepad as Marshall said, Yeah, and I kind of hate to drag it all out here with us. Strawn smiled and said philosophically, You can run, but you can't hide. He looked out the window at the trees backed by endless blue sky and said, I have always wondered if just leaving it all was the right thing. But what else could I do? Marshall double-checked his notes. Let's see now. You told me on the phone when you left in late June, about a year ago, and Ralph Kuklinski took your place. And he's still there, I understand. Yes, yeah, still there. Was he in on any of this, this inner circle stuff? I don't know what else to call it. Strawn thought for a moment. I don't know for sure, but I wouldn't be surprised if he was. He really had to be one of the group to be put in as dean. So there really is some kind of in-group, so to speak. Absolutely. That became pretty obvious after a while. All the regions were becoming like peas in a pod, like clones of each other. They all acted the same, talked the same, except for you. Strawn laughed a little. <laughs> I guess I just didn't fit into the club very well. As a matter of fact, I became a definite outsider, even an enemy. And I think that's why they fired me. I suppose you're talking about that fracas over the college funds. Exactly. Strawn had to resift his memory. I never suspected anything until we started having some unexplained disbursement delays. Our bills were being paid late, our payrolls were behind. It wasn't even my job to be hounding after that sort of thing, but when I started getting some indirect complaints, you know, hearing others talking about it, I asked Baylor what the problem was. He never directly answered my questions, or at least I didn't like the sound of his answers. That's when I asked an independent accountant, a friend of a friend, to look into it and maybe do some quick scanning of what the accounting office was doing. I don't know how he ever got access to the information, but he was a clever character, and he found a way. Bernice was ready with a question. Can we have his name? Strawn answered with a shrug. Johnson. Ernie Johnson. How do we reach him? I, I'm afraid he's dead. That was a letdown. Marshall grabbed at a hope. Did he leave you any records, anything written down? Strawn only shook his head. If he did, those records were lost. Why do you think I've been sitting out here so silently? Listen, I even know Norm Mattley, the state attorney general, pretty well, and I, I thought of going to him and telling him what was going on. But let's face it, those big folks at the top don't give you the time of day unless you really have some substantial proof. It's tough to get the authorities to stick their necks out. They just won't do it. All right. So uh, what was it that Ernie Johnson found? He came back horrified. According to his findings, monies from grants and tuitions were being reinvested at an alarming rate. 
but apparently there were no dividends or returns of any kind from whatever the investments were, as if the money had been poured down a bottomless well somewhere. The figures had been juggled to cover it up, accounts payable had been staggered so that no other accounts could be dipped into to pay those due. It was just one colossal mess. A mess worth millions? At least. The college money had been leaking out in large amounts for years, with no clues as to where it was going. Somewhere out there was a money-hungry monster gobbling up all the college's assets. And that's when you called for the audit. And Eugene Baylor hit the ceiling. The whole thing went from professional to personal in an instant, and we became intense enemies. And that convinced me all the more that the college was in big trouble, and that Baylor had a lot to do with it. But, of course, there's nothing Baylor does that all the others don't know about. I'm sure they're all aware of the problem, and it's my feeling that their unanimous vote for my resignation was a common conspiracy. But to what end? asked Bernice. Why would they want to undermine the college's financial base? Strawn could only shake his head. I don't know what they're trying to do. But unless there's something else hidden somewhere to explain where these funds are going and how the losses are going to be made up, that college is most certainly headed for bankruptcy. Kuklinski must know that. As far as I know, he was in total agreement with the financial policies and with my resignation. Marshall flipped to some other notes. So, uh, just how does our kind Professor Langstrat figure into all this? Strawn had to chuckle. Ah, <laughs> oh, the dear Professor. He considered the question for a moment. She was always a definite influence and mentor, to be sure. But uh, I don't think she's the ultimate center of things. It seemed to me that she had a lot to do with controlling the group, while someone higher up had a lot to do with controlling her. I think, I think she's answering to someone, some unseen authority. But you've no idea who. Strawn shook his head. So what else do you know about her? Strawn searched his memory. A graduate of UCLA... She taught at other universities before she came to Whitmore. She's been on the faculty for at least six years. I do recall that she always had a strong interest in Eastern philosophy and occultism. She was once involved in some kind of neo-pagan religious group in California. But, you know, I never realized until maybe three years ago that she was openly declaring her beliefs to her classes— and I was rather surprised to find that her teachings had aroused a lot of interest. Her beliefs and practices were not only spreading among the students, but also among the faculty. Who on the faculty? Marshall asked. Strawn shook his head in disgust. It started years before I was aware of it, in the psychology department, among Langstrat's associates. Margaret Islander, you may know of her. I believe my friend Ruth Williams does, said Bernice. I think she was the first to be initiated into Langstrat's group, but she'd always had an interest in psychics like Edgar Cayce, so she was a natural. Anyone else? Marshall prodded. Strawn pulled out a hastily scrawled list and let Marshall have a look at it. I've gone over and over this in the months since I left. Here. Here's a list of most of the psychology department. He pointed out a few names. Trevor Corcoran is new on the staff this year. He even studied in India before he came here to teach. Juanita Janke replaced Kevin Ford. Well, as a matter of fact, a lot of people were replaced over the past few years. We had a lot of turnover. Marshall noted another portion of the list. So who are these people? The Humanities Department, and then the Philosophy Department, and uh, these down here are in the Biology and Pre-Med programs. A lot of them are new as well. We had a lot of turnover. That's the second time you've said that, Bernice observed. Strawn stared at her. 
What are you thinking? Bernice took the list from Marshall and placed it in front of Strawn again. Well, tell us now. How many of these people have come on staff during the last six years, during the time Langstrat's been there? Strawn took a second, more critical look at the list. Jones, Conrad, Witherspoon, Epps. An overwhelming percentage of the names were those of new faculty members who had replaced former members who had resigned or whose contracts had simply not been renewed. Well, isn't that odd? I would say that's odd, Bernice agreed. Strawn was visibly shaken. All the turnover. I was getting very concerned about it, but I never even considered. This would explain a lot of things. I knew there was some kind of common interest spreading among all these people. They all seemed to have a very unique and undefinable rapport with each other. Their own lingo, their own inside secrets, their own ideas of reality. It seemed no one person could do anything without everyone else knowing about it. I thought it was a fad, a sociological phase. He looked up from the list with a new awareness in his eyes. So, it was more than that. Our campus was invaded and our faculty displaced by a... a madness. For just a moment, Marshall had a flashback. A quick, fleeting memory of his daughter Sandy saying, People around here are starting to act weird. I think we're being invaded by aliens. That memory was immediately followed by Kate's voice over the phone. I'm concerned about Sandy. She just isn't the same old Sandy anymore. Marshall snapped out of it and began leafing through his materials. He finally found the old list Bernice had gotten from Albert Darr. All right, what about these classes Langstrat was teaching? Introduction to God and goddess consciousness and the craft? Uh, the sacred medicine wheel? Spells and rituals? Pathways to your inner light? Meet your own spiritual guides? Strawn nodded with recognition. It all began as part of an alternative education program. Merely a voluntary thing for any interested students paid for by special tuitions. I just thought it was a study of folklore, myths, traditions. But I guess they were taking this stuff pretty seriously. Eh, so it seems. And now we have a great percentage of the staff and the student body bewitched. Including the regents. Strawn did some fresh thinking. Get ready for this. I think the same kind of upheaval happened on the Board of Regents as well. There are twelve regent positions altogether, and five, I think, have been suddenly and abruptly replaced in the last year and a half. How else could the vote for my resignation be unanimous? I used to have some very loyal friends on that board. What are their names, and where have they gone? Bernice started writing the names down as Strawn recalled them, along with any other information he could provide about each person. Jake Abernathy had died, Morris James had gone bankrupt in a business and moved to another job, Fred Ainsworth, George Olson, and Rita Jacobson had all left Ashton with no word as to where they had gone. And that, said Strawn, takes care of just about everyone. There are none left but initiates into this strange mystical group. Including Kuklinski, the new dean, Bernice added. And Dwight Brandon, the owner of the land. And what about Ted Harmel? Marshall asked. Strawn tightened his lips, looked at the floor, and sighed. Yes, he did try to back out, but by then they'd already entrusted too much information to him. When they found they couldn't control him any more, he has myself and our friendship to blame for that. They arranged to defame him and chase him out of town with that ridiculous scandal. Hmm, said Bernice. A conflict of interest. Of course. He kept telling me it was a fascinating new science of the human mind, and he claimed he was only after a story. But he just kept getting more and more wrapped up in it. And they wooed him, I'm sure. 
I heard him say that they had promised him great success with his newspaper because he had aligned himself with them. Marshall had another flashback. He saw Bramell looking at him with those numbing gray eyes, saying sweetly, Marshall, we'd like to know that you'll be standing with us. Strawn was still talking. Marshall woke up and said, Oh, uh, excuse me, what was that again? Oh, said Strawn, I was just saying that Ted became torn between two loyalties. First and foremost, he was loyal to the truth and to his friends, and that included me. His other loyalty was to the Langstrat group and their philosophies and practices. I guess he thought that the truth was inviolable and the press would always be free. But, whatever the reason, he began to print stories about the financial problems, and that was definitely stepping over the line as far as the regents were concerned. Yes, Bernice recalled. Now I remember him saying they were trying to control him and dictate what he printed. He was really mad about it. Well, of course, said Strawn. But it came down to principles, regardless of what so-called science or metaphysical philosophies he may have been interested in, Ted was still a newspaper man and would not be intimidated. Strawn sighed and looked at the floor. So, I'm afraid he got caught in the crossfire of my battle with the college regents. Consequently, we both lost our positions, our good standing in the community, everything. I guess you could say I was well content to leave it all behind. It was impossible to fight it. Marshall disliked that kind of talk. Are they... Is this thing really that strong? Strawn was deadly serious. I don't think I ever realized how vast and strong it really was. And I guess I'm still finding out... Mr. Hogan, I have no idea what the final goal of these people is, but I'm beginning to see that nothing standing in their way can escape being stamped out, eliminated. Even as we sit here, I can look back over the years and not even considering our faculty turnover, I'm frightened to think of how many other people around Ashton have just dropped out of sight. Joe, the supermarket owner, Marshall thought. And what about Edie? Strawn was looking a little pale now and asked with obvious worry in his voice, Just what do you people intend to do with this information? Marshall had to be honest. I don't know yet. There are too many missing pieces, too many assumptions. I don't have anything I can print. You do remember what happened to Ted. You are keeping that in mind. Marshall didn't want to think about that. He wanted to find out something else. Ted wouldn't talk to me. He's scared. Scared of what? Of them. Of the system that destroyed him. He knows more about their weird goings-on than I do. He knows enough to be a lot more afraid than I am, and I believe his fears are justified. I do believe there's a genuine danger here. Well, does he ever talk to you? Sure, about anything besides what you're after. But the two of you are in touch. Yes, we fish, we hunt, we meet for lunch. He isn't far from here. Could you call him? You mean call him and put in a plug for you? That's exactly what I mean. Strawn answered cautiously. Hey, he may not want to talk, and I can't push him. But will you just call him? See if he'll talk to me one more time. I'll... I'll think about it. But that's all I can promise you. I'd appreciate even that. But, Mr. Hogan... Strawn reached over and grabbed Marshall's arm. He looked at both Marshall and Bernice and said very quietly, You people watch out for yourselves. You're not invincible. None of the rest of us were, and I believe it's possible to lose everything if you make just one wrong move or take just one wrong step. Please, please be sure at every moment you know exactly what you're doing. 
At the clarion, Tom, the paste-up man, was getting the usual ads, fillers, and completed galleys into the Tuesday edition when the bell over the front door jingled. He had better things to do than deal with callers, but with Hogan and Bernice out on their mysterious mission of intrigue, he was the only remaining fort holder downer. Boy, he wished Edie had stuck around. The paper got to be more of a shambles every day, and whatever wild goose chase Hogan and Bernice were on, it took their attention away from the many tasks piling up around the place. Hello, called a woman's sweet voice. Tom grabbed a shop cloth to wipe his hands and hollered back. Hold on, I'm coming. He scurried up the narrow passage to the front office and saw a very attractive and neatly dressed young woman standing at the counter. She smiled when she saw him. Ah, yes, thought Tom, if I were only young again. Hello there, he said, still wiping his hands on the shop cloth. What can I do for you? The young lady said, I read your ad for a secretary and general office manager. I've come to apply. It had to be an angel, Tom thought. Boy, if you can cut it, let me tell you there's sure a job to be had around here. Well, I'm ready to start, she said with a bright smile. Tom made sure his hand was clean enough and then extended it. Tom McBride, paste-up man and general warrior. She shook his hand firmly and said her name. Carmen. Pleased to meet you, Carmen. Uh, Carmen who? She laughed at her lapse of mind and said, Oh, Carmen Frazier, I get so used to just going by my first name. Tom swung the little gate open at the end of the counter, and Carmen followed him into the office area. Let me show you what the devil's going on here, he said. Chapter 17 In the faraway secluded valley, in the little cluster of unlabeled buildings hidden by rocky crags, a hurried transition was in full swing. In the office complex, sitting at desks and work tables, scurrying up and down the aisles, dashing in and out the doors, running up and down the stairways, over two hundred people of all ages, descriptions, and nationalities were typing letters, going through files, checking records, balancing accounts, chattering on telephones in different languages. Maintenance people in blue coveralls brought in large stacks of boxes and crates on hand trucks, and the office workers meticulously began to fill the boxes with the contents of the file cabinets, with any office paraphernalia not immediately needed, with other books and records. Outside, trucks were being loaded with the crates as more maintenance people driving little grounds tractors went about the complex, shutting down various hookups in utilities and boarding up any buildings no longer occupied. Nearby, on the porch of the big stone house at the edge of the grounds, a woman stood watching. She was tall and slender with long jet black hair. She wore black, loose-fitting clothes, and she clutched her shoulder bag close to her side with pale, trembling hands. She looked this way and that, evidently trying to relax herself. She took a few deep breaths. She reached into her bag and brought out a pair of dark sunglasses with which she covered her eyes. Then she stepped down from the porch and started across the plaza toward the office building. Her steps were firm and deliberate. Her eyes remained straight ahead. A few office personnel passed and saluted her, pressing their palms together in front of their chins and bowing slightly. She nodded at them and kept walking. The office staff saluted her in the same way as she entered, and she smiled at them, not speaking a word. Upon receiving her smile, they returned to their feverish work. The office manager, a well-dressed woman with tightly pinned hair, stepped up, gave a slight bow, and said, Good morning. What does the maidservant require? The maidservant smiled and said, I'd like to run off some copies. I can do it immediately. Thank you. I'd like to run them off myself. Certainly. I'll warm up the machine for you. The woman scurried toward a small room off to the side, and the maidservant followed. Several accountants and filing clerks, some Oriental, some East Indian, some European, bowed as she passed and then went back to their consultations with each other. The office manager had the copier ready in less than a minute. Thank you. You may go now, said the maidservant. Certainly. 
answered the woman. I am at your disposal if you have any problems or questions. Thank you. The manager left, and the maidservant closed the door behind her, shutting out the rest of the office and any intrusions. Then quickly, the maidservant reached into her bag and brought out a small book. She leafed through it, skimming over the handwritten pages until she found what she was looking for. Then, laying the book open and face down on the copier, she started pressing the buttons and copying page after page. Forty pages later, she turned off the machine, folded the copies neatly, and placed them in a compartment of her bag along with the little book. She left the office directly and went back to the big stone house. The house was majestic in its size and decor, with a large stone hearth and soaring, rough-beamed ceilings. The maidservant hurried up the thickly carpeted staircase to her bedroom and closed the door behind her. Placing the little book on her stately antique vanity, she opened a drawer and pulled out some brown wrapping paper and twine. The paper already had a name written on it, the addressee, Alexander M. Kasef. The return address included the name J. Langstrat. She quickly rewrapped the book as if it had never been opened, then bound the package with string. Elsewhere in the house, in a very large office, a middle-aged, roundly built man dressed in loose trousers and tunic sat Indian fashion on a large cushion. His eyes were closed, his breathing deep. The fine furnishings of a man of great prestige and power surrounded him. Souvenirs from around the world, such as swords, war clubs, African artifacts, religious relics, and several rather grotesque idols of the East. A battleship of a desk with built-in computer console, multi-line telephone, and an intercom. A long, deep-cushioned couch with matching hand-carved oak chairs and coffee table. Hunting trophies of bear, elk, moose, and lion. Without hearing a knock, the man spoke loftily. Come in, Susan. The big oak door opened silently, and the maidservant entered, carrying the brown paper package. Without opening his eyes, the man said, Put it on my desk. The maidservant did so, and the man began to stir from his motionless position, opening his eyes and stretching his arms as if awakening from sleep. So you finally found it, he said with a teasing smile. It was there all the time. With all the packing and rearranging, it got shoved over in the corner. The man rose from his cushion, stretched his legs, and walked a few laps around the office. I really don't know what it is, he said as if answering a question. I didn't wonder, said the maidservant. He smiled condescendingly and said, Oh, maybe not, but it felt like you did. He went up behind her and placed his hands on her shoulders, speaking in her ear. Sometimes I can read you so very well. And sometimes you drift away. You've been feeling so troubled lately. Why? Oh, all the moving, I guess, the upheaval. He put his arms around her waist and held her close as he said, Don't let it bother you. We're going to a far better place. I have a house all picked out. You'll love it. I grew up in that town, you know. No, no, not really. It won't be the same town at all, not as you remember it. It will be better. But you don't believe that, do you? As I said, I grew up in Ashton, and all you wanted was to get out of there. So you can understand why my feelings are confused. He twirled her around and laughed playfully as he looked into her eyes. Yes, I know. On the one hand, you have no desire at all for the town, and on the other hand, you sneak off to attend the carnival. She blushed a little and looked at the floor. I was searching for something from my past, something from which to envision my future. He held her hand and said, There is no past. You should have stayed with me. I hold the answers for you now. Yes, I can see that. I couldn't before. He laughed and went behind his desk. Well, good, good. We don't need any more meetings held in hiding places behind a noisy carnival. 
You should have seen how embarrassed our friends were to have to meet there. But why did you even have to come looking for me? Why did you have to drag them along? He sat at the desk and began handling a wicked-looking ceremonial knife with a golden handle and razor-sharp blade. Looking over the edge of the blade at her, he said, Because, dear maid servant, I do not trust you. I love you. I am one in essence with you, but... He held the knife up to the level of his eye and peered down the edge of the blade at her, his eyes as sharply cutting as the knife. I do not trust you. You are a woman given to many conflicting passions. I cannot harm the plan. I am only one person among myriads. He rose and came around to the side of the desk where other knives were stuck into the carved head of some pagan idol. You, dear Susan, share my life, my secrets, my purposes. I have to protect my interests. With that, he dropped the knife point first, and it thudded into the idol's head. She smiled in acquiescence and sidled up to him, giving him an alluring kiss. I am, and will always be yours, she said. He gave her a sly smile, and the cutting look never left his eyes as he answered, Yes, of course you are. High above the valley, amid the rocks and crevices of the mountain tops, two figures concealed themselves. One, the silver-haired man who had been here before, continually watched the activity below. He was stately and mighty, his piercing eyes full of wisdom. The other was Tao, the captain of the host. This is what you're looking for, said the silver-haired man. Rafar had business there only days ago. Tal peered down into the valley. The swarms of black demons were too numerous to even estimate. The strong man? he asked. Undoubtedly, with a cloud of guards and warriors all around him, we've been unable to penetrate it yet. And she's right in the middle of it. The spirit has been steadily opening her eyes and calling her. She is close to the strong man dangerously close. The prayers of the remnant have placed a blindness and stupor on the demonic hosts all around her. At present it will buy you time, but little more. Tal grimaced. My general, it will take more than a stupor for us to break through to her. We can barely hold the town of Ashton, much less take on the strong man directly. And you can only expect this build-up to worsen. Their numbers increase tenfold each day. Yes, they are preparing. That's for certain. But at the same time, her conflicts continue to grow. Soon she won't be able to conceal her true feelings and intentions from her lord down there. Tal, she has learned of the suicide. Tal looked directly at the general. I understand she and Patricia were very close. The general nodded. It shouldered her, which made her more receptive. But her time of safety is limited. Here's your next step. The Universal Consciousness Society is holding a special fundraising and promotional dinner in New York for its many cohorts and members in the United Nations. Kasef can't attend because of his present activities here. He will send Susan, however, to represent him. She'll be closely escorted, but this will be the one time she'll be out from under the strong man's demonic cover. The spirit knows she plans to get away and make contact with one remaining friend on the outside, who can in turn contact your newspaper man. She'll take that chance, Tal. You must arrange for her to succeed." Tal's first response was, Is there prayer cover in New York? You will have it. Tal looked at the swarms below. And they must not find out. No, they must not suspect anything has happened until you can get Susan out for good. They would destroy her if they knew. And who is the friend? His name is Kevin Weed, a former classmate and boyfriend. 
To work, then, I have some more prayer to gather in. Godspeed, dear Captain. Tal climbed behind some large rocks for concealment before he unfurled his wings. Then, with the silence and grace of a drifting cloud, he floated up over the mountaintop. Once he had cleared the summit and could no longer be seen by any of the swarms in the valley, his wings snapped into a rushing pattern and he shot forward like a bullet, trailing a brilliant arc of light across the sky and over the horizon. Marshall and Bernice drove through the forested countryside in the big brown Buick, talking about themselves, their pasts, their families, and anything else that came to mind. They were getting tired of only talking about business anyway and finding it enjoyable to share each other's company. I grew up Presbyterian, said Marshall. Now I don't know what I am. My folks were Episcopalian, said Bernice. I don't think I was ever anything. They dragged me along to church every Sunday and I couldn't wait to get out of there. I didn't mind it that much. I had a good Sunday school teacher. Yeah, maybe that's where I missed out. I never went to Sunday school. Oh, I think a kid needs to know something about God. What if God doesn't exist? See what I mean? You never went to Sunday school. The Buick came to a crossroads, and a sign indicated the way back to Ashton was to the left. Marshall turned left. Bernice answered one of Hogan's questions. No, nope, no parents alive anymore. Dad died in 76, and Mom died, uh, let's see, two years ago. That's too bad. And then I lost my only sibling, Patricia. Is that right? Boy, I'm sorry. It's a lonely world out there sometimes. Yeah, I suppose. And I wonder who there is to meet in Ashton. She only looked at him and said, I'm not hunting, Marshall. About a mile ahead of them was a wide spot in the road referred to as Baker, a little town indicated by the smallest possible dot on the map. It was one of those typical roadsides where truckers and four-wheeling hunters drop in for black coffee and cold eggs. Blink just once and you'd miss it. Above the Buick, whisking just over the tops of the trees, Nathan and Armoth kept a careful eye on the vehicle their wings rushing in an even pattern, and their bodies trailing two streaks of diamond-studded light. So this is where it all begins, said Nathan with a playful tone. And you have been chosen to strike the blow, responded Armoth. Nathan smiled. Child's play. Armoth teased him a little. I'm sure Tal could pick someone else who would like the honor. Nathan drew his sword, and it flashed like a lightning bolt. Oh, no, dear Armoth, I've waited long enough. I'll take it. Nathan banked away from Armoth, dropped down over the roadway as it wound through the tall trees, and began to keep pace with the car, flying lazily about thirty feet above it. He kept his eye on the little town of Baker now approaching, made a quick judgment as to the coasting distance the car could travel, and then at the right moment he hurled his sword like a fiery spear downward. The sword traveled a perfect trajectory and shot through the hood of the car. The engine died. Nuts, said Marshall, shifting quickly into neutral. What's wrong? Bernice asked. Something's broke. Marshall tried to restart the engine as the car continued to coast along. No response. Uh, probably electrical, he muttered. Better pull over at that station. Yeah, I know, I know. The Buick limped into the little filling station in Baker and rolled to a stop right at the front door. Marshall opened the hood. I'm going to excuse myself, said Bernice. Go for me, too, will you? Marshall said crossly, looking here and there around the engine compartment. Bernice went to the next little building, the Evergreen Tavern. Age and settling were slowly swallowing it from the bottom up and one end was badly sunken. The paint on the front door was peeling. The neon beer logo in the window still worked, though, and the jukebox inside was twanging some country hit. Bernice pushed the door open. The bottom scraped a worn arc across the linoleum and went inside, twisting her nose a little at the blue cigarette smoke that had replaced the air. 
Just a few men sat in the establishment, probably the first of the logging crews getting off work. They were talking loudly, swapping stories, cussing it up. Bernice looked directly toward the back of the room, trying to find the little men and women signs. Yes, there was restrooms. One of the men at a nearby table said, Hey, baby, how's it going? Bernice wasn't going to even look in his direction, but did just happen to give him a glance and an appropriately dirty look. A little too much local color in this place, she thought. She slowed her walk. Her eyes locked on him. He looked back at her with a boozy, lazy-eyed smile on his bearded face. Another man said, Looks like you got her attention, buddy. Bernice kept looking at him. She approached the table and took an even closer look. The hair was long and tangled, bound into a ponytail with a rubber band. The eyes were glassy and now heavily lined. But she knew this man. The man's friend said, Good evening, ma'am. Don't let him bother you. He's just having a good time, right, Weed? Weed? Bernice asked. Kevin Weed? Kevin Weed just looked up at her, enjoying the view and saying little. Finally, he said, Can I buy you a beer? Bernice came closer to him, made sure he could clearly see her face. Do you remember me? Bernice Kruger? Weed only looked puzzled. Do you remember Pat Kruger? A light slowly began to dawn in Weed's face. Pat Kruger. Who are you? I'm Bernice, Pat's sister. Do you remember me? We met a couple of times. You and Pat's roommate were going together. Weed brightened and smiled, and then he cursed and excused himself. Bernice Kruger, Pat's sister. He cursed again and excused himself again. What are you doing in this place? Just passing through, and I will take a small coke, thank you. Weed smiled and looked at his friends. Their eyes and mouths were getting wide, and they were starting to laugh. Weed said with a leer, I think it's time you boys found another table. They gathered up their hard hats and lunch boxes and laughed. Yeah, you got it, Weed. Dan, Weed hollered. A small coke for the lady here. Dan had to stare for a moment at the nice girl who had come into a place like his. He got the coke and brought it to her. So, what have you been doing? Weed asked her. Bernice had her pen and notebook out. She told him a little about what she had been doing and what she was doing now. Then she said, I haven't seen you since before Pat's death. Hey, I'm really sorry about that. Kevin, can you tell me anything about it? What do you know? Not much. No more than what I read in the papers. What about Pat's roommate? Do you hear from her anymore? Bernice noticed Weed's eyes widen and his mouth drop open the moment she mentioned the girl. Man, this world is getting smaller all the time, he said. You saw her? Bernice couldn't believe her good fortune. Well, yeah, sort of. When? Bernice insisted. But just for a little while. Where? When? Bernice was having a very difficult time holding herself back. I saw her at the carnival. In Ashton? Yeah, yeah, in Ashton. I just ran into her. She called my name, and I turned around. There she was. What did she say? Did she say where she's living now? Weed fidgeted a little. Man, I don't know. I don't really care. She dumped me, you know. Ran off with that other goon. She was even with him that night. What was her name again? Susan. Susan Jacobson. She's a real heartbreaker, she is. Do you have any idea? Did she give you any idea of where I might find her? I have to talk to her about Pat. She might know something. Man, I don't know. She didn't talk to me for very long at all. She was in a hurry, had to meet her new boyfriend or something. She wanted my phone number. That was about it. Bernice couldn't let go of her hope. Not yet. Are you sure she didn't give you some idea of where she's living now, or any way to get in touch with her? Weed shrugged drunkenly. 
Kevin, I've been trying to find her for ages. I've got to talk to her. Weed was bitter. Talk to her boyfriend, that fat little geezer with all the bucks. Oh, no. That wasn't really a legitimate hunch that ran through Bernice's mind. Or was it? Kevin, she said, what did Susan look like that night? He was staring off into space like a drunken and jilted lover. Foxy, he said. Long black hair, black dress, sexy shades. Bernice felt her stomach tighten into a knot as she said, And what about her boyfriend? Did you see him? Yeah, later. Susan acted like she didn't even know me when he came into the picture. Well, what did he look like? Like some wimp from Fat City. It had to have been his money, and that's why Susan latched on to him. Bernice picked up her pen in a shaking hand. What's your phone number? He gave it to her. Address? He mumbled that off, too. Now, you say she asked you for your phone number? Yeah, I don't know why. Maybe things aren't working out with Loverboy. Did you give it to her? Yeah, maybe I'm a sucker, but yeah, I did. So she just might be calling you. He shrugged. Kevin, Bernice gave him one of her cards. Listen carefully to me. Are you listening? He looked at her and said yes. If she calls, if you hear anything from her at all, please give her my name and number and tell her I want to talk to her. Get her number so I can call her. Will you do that? He took the card and nodded. Yeah, sure. She finished her coke and prepared to leave. He looked at her with his dull, glassy eyes. Hey, you doing anything tonight? If you hear from Susan, call me. We'll have plenty to talk about then. He looked at her card again. Yeah, sure. A few moments later, Bernice was back at the filling station just in time to see Marshall start the car up. The old and bent station owner was looking at the engine and shaking his head. Hey, that did it, Marshall shouted from behind the wheel. Heck, I didn't do a thing, said the old man. High above the filling station, Nathan soared skyward to join Armoth, his sword retrieved. Done, he said. And now we'll see how the captain and Gylo succeed in New York. The Buick started out again, and Nathan and Armoth followed behind and above it like two kites on strings. Chapter 18 Hank started the Sunday morning service with a good rousing song, one Mary performed on the piano particularly well. Both were in good spirits and feeling encouraged. In spite of the approaching sounds of battle, they sensed that God in his infinite wisdom was indeed working out a very mighty and effective plan for re-establishing his kingdom in the town of Ashton. Victories large and small were in the making, and Hank knew it had to be the hand of God. For one thing, this morning he would be ministering to an almost entirely new congregation. At least it sure felt that way. Many of the old dissenters had dropped out of the church and taken their embittering presence with them, and the whole mood and spirit of the place had risen several notches because of their absence. Sure, Alf Bramell, Gordon Mayer, and Sam Turner still hovered around, brooding together like some kind of hit squad, but none of them were in the service this morning, and a lot of new fresh faces were. The Forsyth's example had been followed by their numerous friends and acquaintances, some married couples, some singles, and some students. Grandma Duster was there, as strong and healthy as ever, and ready for a spiritual fight. John and Patty Coleman were back, and John couldn't keep from grinning in his joy and excitement. Of the rest, Hank had only met one. Next to Andy and June, looking a little sheepish, sat Ron Forsyth, along with his girlfriend, a short, very made-up sophomore. Hank had to choke down some very strong emotion when he saw the Forsyth Center, accompanied by their son. It was a miracle, a genuine act of grace by the living God. He would have shouted hallelujah right there, but he didn't want to scare the young fellow away. This could be one of those kid gloves cases. 
After the first song, Hank figured he might as well address the situation before him. Well, he said informally, I don't know whether to call all you people visitors or refugees or what. They all laughed and exchanged glances. Hank continued, Why don't we just take a moment here to introduce ourselves? I guess you probably know who I am. I'm Hank Bush, the pastor, and this flower sitting at the piano is my wife, Mary. Mary stood quickly, smiled meekly, then sat down again. Why don't we go around the room here and tell everybody who we are? And the first roll call of the remnant took place as the angels and demons watched. Creone and Triscoll stood at their posts right beside Hank and Mary, while Signa and his squad, now numbering ten, kept a hedge about the building. Again, Lucius had carried on a bitter argument with Signa, trying to gain admittance. But he knew better than to push the matter too far. Hank Bush was bad enough, but now he had a whole church full of praying saints. The heavenly warriors were enjoying their first real advantage. Lucius finally ordered his demons to remain outside and hear what they could. The only demons that had managed to enter had come in with their human hosts, and now they sat here and there in the congregation, brooding over this horrible development. Cyan stood near the back like a hen watching over her brood, and Seth stayed near the Forsyths and the group with them. There was power in this place today, and everyone could feel it grow as each new person stood and introduced himself. To Hank, it seemed just like the gathering of a special army. Ralph Metzer, sophomore at Whitmore. Judy Kemp, sophomore at Whitmore. Greg and Eva Smith, friends of the Forsyths. Bill and Betty Jones, we run the whatnot shop over on 8th Street. Mike Stewart, I live with the Joneses and I, I work out at the mill. Cal and Ginger Barton, we're still new in town. Cecil and Miriam Cooper, and we're sure glad to see you all here. Ben Squires, I'm the guy who brings you your mail if you live on the west side. Tom Harris, and this is my wife Mabel. Welcome to all of you, and praise the Lord. Clint Neal, I work at the filling station. Greg and Nancy Jenning, I teach. She's a writer. Andy Forsyth, and praise the Lord. June Forsyth, and amen to that. Ron stood to his feet, put his hands in his pockets, and looked at the floor a lot as he said, I'm, <clears throat> I'm Ron Forsyth, and uh, this here is Cynthia, and uh, I met the pastor at the cave, and uh, his voice cracked with emotion. I just want to thank you people for praying for me and for caring. He stood there for a moment, looking at the floor, while tears welled up in his eyes. June stood beside him and addressed the group on his behalf. Ron wants you all to know that he and Cynthia gave their hearts to Jesus last night. Everyone smiled with delight and murmured encouragement, and that loosened Ron up enough to say, Yeah, and we flushed all our drugs down the toilet. That brought down the house. With increased joy and fervor, the roll call continued. Outside, the demons listened with great alarm and hissed exclamations of foreboding. Rafar must know of this, one said. Lucius, his wings half unfurled just to keep his fussing ranks from pestering him, stood still and brooded. One little demon hovered about his head and cried out, What shall we do, Master Lucius? Shall we find Rafar? Back to whatever you are doing. He hissed back. Let me see to informing Baal Rafar myself. They gathered around him, wanting to hear his next order. Lately, it seemed he had spoken so very little. What are you all staring at? He shrieked. Go! Do mischief! Let me worry about these petty little saints! They flurried away in all directions, and Lucius stood in his place outside the church window. Tell Rafar indeed! But Rafar humbled himself enough to ask. Lucius would not be his lackey. In this part of New York City, things were tailored for the elite and discerning. The shops, boutiques, and restaurants were the exclusive kind, the hotels quite lavish. Carefully groomed flowering trees grew in round stucco planters along the sidewalks, and maintenance workers kept the streets and walks spotless. 
Among the hurried shoppers and browsers crowding the district were two very large men in tan tunics, strolling the sidewalk and looking here and there. The Gibson Hotel, Tal read on the front of an old, distinguished stone building that towered thirty stories above them. I see no activity, said Gilo. It's early yet. They'll be along. Let's be quick about this. The two of them slipped through the big front doors and into the hotel lobby. People passed on all sides of them, and sometimes right through them, but that, of course, was of no consequence. Within moments, they had checked the schedule at the desk for the hotel's banquet facilities and verified that the Grand Ballroom was reserved that night for the Universal Consciousness Society. The General's information was right, Tal commented with pleasure. They hurried down a long, thickly carpeted hallway, past a barber shop, a beauty salon, a shoeshine nook, and a gift shop, and at length came to two huge oak doors with lavishly wrought brass handles. They passed through and found themselves in the grand ballroom, now filled with dining tables adorned with crystal place settings and white linen tablecloths. One lone, long-stemmed rose in a bud vase stood on every table. The hotel caterers were hurriedly making final preparations, setting out the artfully folded napkins and wine glasses. Tal checked the place cards at the head table. One towards the end said, Kasif, Omni Corporation. They went through a nearby exit door and looked right and left. Down the hall to the left and toward the back of the hotel was the ladies' lounge. They went in, past a few women primping at the mirrors, and found what they were after, the very last stall designated for use by the handicapped. It was built against the rear wall of the hotel, just below a window large enough for a limber human to crawl through. Tal reached up, broke the lock, and tested the window to make sure it would open and close easily. Gilo passed quickly through the wall into the alley, where he found a large dumpster and, with incredible ease, moved it several feet so that it was situated below the window. He then arranged some crates and garbage cans in a very handy stair-step fashion against the dumpster. Tal joined him, and the two went up the alley to the street. Down one block was a phone booth. Tal picked up the receiver and made sure everything was functioning. Here they come. Gilo warned, and they leaped through the wall of a department store and peered out a window, just as a long black limousine, and then another, and then another, began an ominous parade down the street toward the hotel. Inside the limousine sat dignitaries and other VIPs from many different nations and races, and within and on top were demons, large, black, warty, and fierce, their yellow eyes darting warily in every direction. Tal and Gilo watched with fascination. In the sky overhead, other demons began flocking to the hotel like swallows, their black-winged outlines silhouetted against the reddening sky. A significant gathering, Captain, said Gilo. Tal nodded and continued watching. Amid the limousines were many taxis, also carrying a vast cross-section of humanity. Orientals, Africans, Europeans, Westerners, Arabians, people of great power, esteem, and dignity from all over the world. As written in the scriptures, the kings of the earth, Tal observed, being made drunk with the wine of the great harlot's immorality. Babylon the Great, said Gilo. The great harlot arising at last. Yes, universal consciousness. The world religion, the doctrine of demons spreading among all the nations. Babylon revived right before the end of the age. Hence the return of the prince of Babylon, Raphar. Of course, and that explains why we were called. We were the last to confront him. Gilo only winced at that. My captain, our last battle with Rafar is not a pleasant memory. Nor a pleasant expectation. Do you expect him here? No, this gathering is only a party before the real battle, and the real battle is slated for the town of Ashton. Tal and Gilo remained where they were, watching the gathering forces of mankind and of satanic evil converge on the Gibson Hotel. They kept looking for the one key person, Susan Jacobson, Alexander Kasif's maidservant. They finally spotted her in a very fancy Lincoln Continental, 
probably Kasif's private vehicle, driven by a hired chauffeur. She was accompanied by two escorts sitting on either side of her. She'll be closely watched, said Tal. Come on, we need a better look. They stalked quietly through the department store, through walls, displays, and people, then ducked under the street and came up inside the restaurant right across from the hotel's main door. All around them, well-dressed people sat at quiet, candlelit tables eating expensive French cuisine. They hurried to a front window right next to an older couple enjoying seafood and wine, and watched as the Lincoln-carrying Susan pulled up in front of the hotel. Susan's door was opened by the red-coated doorman. One escort got out and extended his hand to help her disembark. She stepped out and was immediately joined by the other escort. The two tuxedo-clad escorts were very handsome, but also very intimidating. They kept very close to her. Susan wore a very loose-fitting evening gown that draped her body stunningly and cascaded to her feet. Gilo had to ask, Are her plans the same as ours? Tal answered assuredly, The general has yet to err. Gilo only shook his head in apprehension. To the alley, said Tal. They moved along under a cracked, cobbled alley and surfaced to a hiding place behind a fire escape. Night had fallen, and it was very dark in the alley. From their vantage point, they could count twenty pairs of shifting yellow eyes evenly spaced along the alley and against the hotel. About a hundred sentries are around the place, said Tal. Under better circumstances, a mere handful, Gilo muttered. You need only concern yourself with these twenty. Gilo took his sword in his hand. He could feel the prayers of the local saints. It will be difficult, he said. The prayer cover is limited. You don't have to defeat them, answered Tal. Just get them to chase after you. We need the alley clear for just a few moments. They waited. The air in the alley was still and dank. The demons moved very little, remaining at their posts, mumbling back and forth in different languages, their sulfurous breath forming a strange, meandering ribbon of yellow vapor that hung along the alley like a putrid river floating in midair. Tal and Gilo could feel themselves getting more and more tense, like ever-tightening springs with each passing second. The banquet must be in progress by now. At any time, Susan could excuse herself from the table. More time passed. Suddenly, both Tal and Gilo felt the prompting of the spirit. Tal looked at Gilo, and Gilo nodded. She was on her way. They watched the window. The light from the ladies' lounge shone brightly through it. They could just barely hear the sound of the door opening and closing as patrons came and went. The door opened. High heels clicked on the tile floor, moving toward the window. The demons began to stir a little, muttering among themselves. The door to the last stall swung open. Gilo's hand gripped his sword. He began to breathe deeply, his big torso heaving in and out, the power of God coursing through him. Their eyes were riveted on the window. The demons became more alert, their yellow eyes wide open and darting back and forth. They were talking louder. The shadow of a woman's head suddenly appeared on the window. A woman's hand reached for the latch. Tal touched Gilo on the shoulder, and Gilo instantly dropped into the ground. Only a fraction of a second passed. Yaha! came the sudden deafening war cry from Gilo's powerful lungs, and the whole alley instantly exploded in a blinding flash of white light as Gilo shot up out of the ground, his sword flashing and shimmering, tracing brilliant arcs in the air. The demons jumped, hooting and shrieking in terror, but recovered immediately and drew their swords. The alley echoed with the metallic ringing, and the red glow of their blades danced like comets on the high brick walls. Gilo stood tall and strong, and he bellowed out a laugh that shook the ground. Ho, 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 now you black lizards, I'll test your metal. 
A big spirit on the end shrieked out an order, and all twenty demons converged on Gylo like starving predators, their swords flashing and their fangs bared. Gylo shot straight up out of their midst like a slippery bar of soap, and added an agile spin as he went, throwing light everywhere in colorful spirals. The demons unfurled their wings and shot up after him. As Tal watched, Gylo looped and corkscrewed all over the sky like a loose balloon, laughing, taunting, and teasing, staying just out of their reach. The demons were in a blind rage by now. The alley was empty. The window was opening. Tal was beneath the window in an instant, unglorified and concealed in the darkness. He grabbed Susan the moment her hand came through the window and pulled so hard she practically shot through the window on his strength alone. She was dressed in a simple blouse and jeans and had small slippers on her feet. From the neck up, she was still gorgeous. From the neck down, she was ready for running down dark alleys. Tal helped her find her way down from the dumpster and then prodded her up the alley and out to the street, where she hesitated, looked this way and that, and then spotted the phone booth. She ran like the wind in a terrible and desperate hurry. Tal followed her, trying to stay as concealed as possible. He looked back over his shoulder. Gylo's diversion had worked. For now, Gylo was the main problem for the demons, and their attention was far from this one frantically running woman. Susan leaped into the booth and slammed the door behind her. She took a pile of coins from her jeans pocket, dialed the operator, and put through a long-distance call. Somewhere between Ashton and the little roadside of Baker, in a run-down warehouse refashioned into low-red apartments, Kevin Weed was awakened from an exhausted sleep by the ringing of his phone. He rolled over on his mattress and lifted the receiver. Yeah, who's this? he asked. Is this Kevin? came the desperate voice on the other end. Kevin perked up a little. It was a woman's voice. Yeah, that's me. Who's this? In the phone booth, Susan looked up and down the street fearfully as she said, Kevin, this is Susan. Susan Jacobson. Kevin was beginning to wonder about all this. Hey, what do you want with me anyway? I need your help, Kevin. I don't have much time. There isn't much time. Time for what? he asked very dully. Please listen. Write it down if you have to. I don't got a pencil. Then just listen. Now you know about the Ashton Clarion, the newspaper in Ashton? Yeah, yeah, I know about it. Bernice Kruger works there. She's the sister of my old roommate, Pat, the one who committed suicide. Oh, man, what's going on around here? Kevin, will you do something for me? Will you get a hold of Bernice Kruger on the clarion and... Kevin? Yeah, I'm listening. Kevin, I'm in trouble. I need your help. So where's your boyfriend? He's the one I'm afraid of. You know about him. Tell Bernice all about Alexander Kasef. Everything you know. Kevin was nonplussed. So, what do I know? Tell her what happened. You know, between us, with Kasef, the whole thing. Tell her what Kasef's up to. I, I don't get this. I don't have time to explain. Just tell her. Tell her that Kasef is taking over the whole town. And let her know I have some very important information about her sister, Pat. I'll try to reach her, but I'm afraid the clarion phone might be bugged. Kevin, I need you to be there to answer the phone, to... <laughs> Susan was frustrated, full of emotion, unable to select the right words. She had too much to say and too little time. You're not making a whole lot of sense, Kevin muttered. You on something? Just do it, Kevin, please. I'll call you again as soon as I can, or I'll write or do something. But please call Bernice Kruger and tell her everything you know about Kasef and about me. Tell her it was me she saw at the carnival. How am I supposed to remember all this stuff? Please do it. Tell me you'll do it. Yeah, okay, I'll do it. I've got to go. Goodbye. Susan hung up the phone and dashed out of the booth. Tal followed her, ducking inside the buildings as much as he could. He reached the alley a few moments ahead of her to check it out. Trouble. Four more sentries had moved in to take the place of the original twenty, and they were fully alert. 
There was no way of knowing where Gilo and the twenty might be. Tal looked behind him. Susan was running full speed for the alley. Tal dove headfirst through the pavement and penetrated deep under the city, gaining speed, bringing forth his big silver sword. The power of God was increasing now. The saints must be praying somewhere. He could feel it. He had only seconds, and he knew it. He checked his bearings, made a wide subterranean sweep away from the hotel, and then, over a mile away, he circled back, gaining speed, gaining speed, gaining speed, shining light, building power, faster, 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 his sword a blinding lightning bolt, his eyes like fire, the earth a blur around him, the roar of passing clay, boulders, pipe, and stone like a freight train. He held the sword crossways, the glimmering tip ready for that one infinitesimal moment. Quicker than a thought, like the explosion of a missile, a brilliant streak of light burst from the ground across the street and seemed to cut space in half as it pierced through the alley and right across the eyes of all four demons. The demons, stunned and blinded, fell to the ground, stumbled about, tried to find each other. The streak of light vanished back into the ground as quickly as it came. Susan came around the corner and into the alley, heading for the window. Tal cupped his wings and braked himself. He had to get back to help her through that window before any demons could recover and sound an alarm. He snapped his wings into a violent forward rush and doubled back. Susan clambered up the crates and cans and onto the dumpster. The demons started to regain their vision and were rubbing their eyes. Tal emerged behind the fire escape trying to judge the remaining time. Good. Gilo made it back and dropped like a hawk into the alley, grabbing Susan and thrusting her through the window in an instant, holding her up so she would not tumble to the floor inside. Gilo closed the window himself. Tal flew out to meet Gilo. One more time, he shouted. Nothing more needed to be said. The four sentries had recovered and were pouncing on them, and the other twenty had returned hot on Gilo's trail. Tal and Gilo shot into the air and streaked away, chased by a flock of frothing demons. The angels flew a course high over the city and kept their speed just slow enough to encourage the demons. They headed west, off into the dark night sky, trailing brilliant white streaks behind them. The demons were tenacious in their pursuit for hundreds of miles, but eventually Tal looked back and found that they had given up the chase and returned to the city. Tal and Gilo picked up speed and headed for Ashton. In the ladies' room, Susan hurriedly rolled up the legs of her jeans, took her evening gown from its hook in the stall, and quickly resumed her proper appearance for the banquet. She removed the slippers and put them in her handbag, slipped on her dress shoes, then opened the stall door and came out. A man's voice outside the lounge door called, Susan, they're waiting for you. She checked her appearance in the mirror, combed her hair, and tried to calm her breathing. Hasty, hasty, she called teasingly. With ladylike dignity, she finally emerged into the hallway and took the arm of the escort. He led her back to the grand ballroom, now filled with people, and showed her to her seat at the head table, giving the other escort a reassuring nod. Chapter 19 the Clarion office was finally recovering the nice, healthy efficiency Marshall liked to see, and the new girl, Carmen, had a lot to do with it. In less than a week, she had taken the old bull by the horns and had more than filled Edie's shoes, re-establishing a tight office routine. It was only Wednesday, and already the paper was in full swing, heading for the Friday edition. Marshall stopped by Carmen's desk on his way to the coffee machine. She handed him some fresh copy and said, This is part of Tom's article. Marshall nodded. Yeah, the thing on the fire department. I'd broken it down into three headings, staff, history, and goals, and figured we could run it in three parts. Tom already has it slotted for the next two pay stops and thinks he can bump something for the third. Marshall was pleased. Yeah, go with it. I like it. I'm glad you can read Tom's writing. Carmen had already proofread the bulk of the material for Friday and was halfway through preparing the copy for George, the typesetter. She had gone through the books and balanced all the accounts. She planned on helping Tom with the paste-up tomorrow. The negatives for the sportsman's club layout were ready. Marshall shook his head with happy amazement. 
Glad to have you aboard. Carmen smiled. Thank you, sir. Marshall went to the coffee maker and poured two cups of coffee. Then it dawned on him. Carmen had found the cord to this fool machine. He took the two cups back toward his office and gave her a smile of approval as he passed her desk. The location of her desk had been her only request on the job. She had asked if it could be moved to a location right outside Marshall's office door, and Marshall was happy to comply. Now all he had to do was turn and holler, and she would spring into action to do his bidding. Marshall went into his office, set his cup of coffee on his desk, and offered the other cup to the long-haired, slightly dazed man sitting in the corner. Bernice sat in the chair she had brought in, with her own cup of coffee. Now, where were we? Marshall asked, sitting at his desk. Kevin Weed rubbed his face, took a sip of the coffee, and tried to pick up his thoughts again, looking around the floor as if he had dropped them down there somewhere. Marshall prompted, Okay, let me at least make sure I've got this straight. Now, you used to be the uh, male acquaintance of this Susan, and she used to be the roommate of Pat Kruger, Bernice's sister. Have I got that right? Weed nodded. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, what was Susan doing at the carnival? Beats me. Like I said, she just came up behind me and said hi, and I wasn't even looking for her. I couldn't believe it was her, you know. But she got your phone number, and then she called you last night. Yeah, all tripped out, shook up. It was wild. She didn't make a lot of sense. Marshall looked at both Weed and Bernice and asked Bernice, and this is the same ghostly-looking woman you photographed that night? Bernice was convinced. The descriptions Kevin gave me match perfectly the woman I saw, and also that one older man who was with her. Yeah, case of... Kevin said the name as if it tasted bad. All right. And Marshall made a list in his mind. So, let's talk about this case of first... Then we'll talk about Susan, and then we'll talk about Pat. Bernice had her notepad ready. What's Kasef's full name? Any idea? Weed strained his brain. Alex, Alan, Alexander, something like that. But it starts with an A. Yeah, right. Marshall asked. What is he? Weed answered. Susan's new boyfriend, the guy she dumped me for. So what does he do? Where does he work? Weed shook his head. I don't know. He's got bucks, so he's a real wheeler dealer. When I first heard about him, he was hanging around Ashton in the college and talking about buying property and stuff. Man, the guy was loaded, and he liked everybody to know it, too. Then he remembered. Oh, and Susan said he's trying to take over the town. What town? This one? I guess, Bernice asked. So where is he from? Back east, maybe New York. I think he's a big city type. Marshall told Bernice, Make a note for me to call Al Lemley at the Times. He might be able to track this guy down if he's in New York. Bernice made the note. Marshall asked Weed, what else do you know about him? He's weird, man. He's into weird stuff. Marshall was getting impatient. Come on, try harder. Weed stirred and fidgeted in his chair, trying to get comfortable about talking. Well, you know, he was like a guru or witch doctor, some kind of far-out ooga-booga man, and he got Susan into all that stuff. Bernice prodded. Are you talking about Eastern mysticism? Yeah. Pagan religions, meditation? Yeah, yeah, all that stuff. He was into all that stuff. He and that professor lady at the college, what's her name? Marshall was sick of the name. Langstrat. Weed's face brightened with recollection. Yeah, that was it. Were case of the Langstrat associated? Were they friends? Yeah, sure. They they were teaching some night classes together, I think. The ones that Susan was going to. Kasev was a special guest star or something. 
He really had everybody wowed. I thought he was spooky. All right, so Susan was attending these classes. And she got crazy, and, and I mean crazy, man. She couldn't have been on a higher trip with mescaline. I couldn't even talk to her anymore. She was always way out in space somewhere. Weed kept talking, starting to roll a little on his own. That's what really started to get me, how she and the rest of that bunch started keeping secrets and talking in codes and not letting me in on what they were talking about. Susan just kept telling me I wasn't enlightened and wouldn't understand. Man, she just gave it all to that case of Guy, and, and he took her. I, I mean, he really took her. He owns her now. She's gone. She's had it. And was Langstrat mixed up in all this? Oh, yeah, but Kasif was the real heavy. He was the guru, you know. Langstrat was his puppy dog, Bernice said. And now Susan gets your phone number and calls you after all this time? And she was scared, said Weed. She's in trouble. She said I was supposed to get in touch with you guys and tell you what I knew, and she said she had some information on Pat. Bernice was longing to know. Did she say what kind of information? No, nothing, but she, she wants to get a hold of you. Well, why doesn't she just call? That question helped Weed to remember something. Oh, yeah, she thinks your phone might be bugged. Marshall and Bernice were silent for a moment. That was a comment they didn't know how seriously to take. Weed added, I guess she called me to be a go-between to tip you guys off. Marshall ventured, like you're the only one she has left to trust? Weed only shrugged. Bernice asked, Well, what do you know about Pat? Did Susan ever tell you anything while you were still going together? One of Weed's most painful undertakings was trying to remember things. Uh, she and Pat were good friends for a while anyway, but... You know, Susan left us all out in the cold when she started following after that case of bunch. She kind of pushed me off, and Pat, too. They didn't get along very well after that, and Susan kept saying how Pat was uh, just like me, trying to get in the way, not enlightened, dragging her feet. Marshall thought of the question and didn't wait for Bernice to ask it. So, would you say that this case of Bunch may have regarded Pat as an enemy? Man, we'd remembered some more. She did stick her neck out. I mean, she got in the way. Her and Susan had a real fight once about the stuff Susan was getting into. Pat didn't trust Kasif and kept telling Susan she was brainwashed. Weed's eyes brightened. Yeah, I talked to Pat once. We were sitting at a game, and we talked about what Susan was getting into and how Kasif was controlling her, and Pat was really shook up about it, just like I was. I guess Pat and Susan really had some fights about it, until Susan finally moved out of the dorm and ran off with Kasif. Boy, she dropped out of her classes and everything. So, did Pat make any enemies? I mean, real enemies. Weed kept digging up new things that had been buried under the years and the alcohol. Uh, yeah, maybe she did. It was after Susan ran off with this case of guy. Pat told me she was going to check the whole thing out once and for all, and I think she may have gone to see that Professor Langstrat a few times. A little later, I ran into her again. She was sitting in a cafeteria on campus, and she looked like she hadn't slept in days, and I asked her how she was, and, and she would hardly even talk to me. I asked her how her investigation was going, you know, her, her checking out Kasif and Langstrat and stuff, and, and she said she'd quit doing anything about that, and said it was really no big deal. I thought that was a little weird. She'd been so torn up about it before. I asked her, hey, are they coming after you now? And she wouldn't talk about it. She said I wouldn't understand. Then she said something about some instructor, some guy that was helping her out and that she was doing okay. And, and I got the message she didn't want me butting in, so I just sort of left her there. Did her behavior seem strange to you? Bernice asked. Did she seem like herself? 
No way. Hey, if she hadn't been so against that whole case of and Langstrat bunch, I would have thought she was one of them. She had the same kind of dopey, lost-in-space look all over her. When? Just when was it that you saw her like that? We knew, but hated to say it. Uh, just a little while before they found her dead. Did she seem afraid? Did she give you any indication of any enemies, anything like that? We'd grimace trying to remember. She wouldn't talk to me, but, but I saw her once after that and tried to ask her about Susan, and she acted like I was some kind of mug or something. She hollered, leave me alone, leave me alone, and tried to pull away, and then she saw it was me, and she looked all around like somebody was following her. Who? Did she say who? We looked at the ceiling. Oh, what was that guy's name? Bernice was leaning forward, hanging on his words. There was somebody. Thomas, some guy named Thomas. Thomas, did she ever say his last name? Don't remember any last name. I never met the guy, never saw him, but he sure must have owned her. She acted like he was following her all around, talking to her, maybe threatening her, I don't know. She seemed pretty afraid of him. Thomas, Bernice whispered. She said to Weed, is there anything else about this Thomas, anything at all? I never saw him. She didn't say who he was or where she'd meet him, but it was kind of strange. One minute she'd be talking like he was the greatest thing that ever happened to her, and then the next minute she'd be hiding out and saying he was following her. Bernice got up and headed for the door. I think we might have a college roster somewhere. She began rummaging around in the desks and shelves of the front office. Weed fell silent. He looked tired. Marshall reassured him. You're doing fine, Kevin. Hey, it's been a while. Uh... I don't know if this is important. Consider everything important. Well, this stuff about Pat having some new instructor. I think some of the case of Bunch, maybe it was Susan, they had instructors. But I thought Pat didn't want anything to do with that group. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Marshall shifted directions. So where did you fit into all these goings on besides your relationship with Susan? Hey, nowhere. I didn't want anything to do with him, man. Were you going to the school? Yeah, taking accounting, man. When all this started coming down and then Pat killed herself, hey, I got out of there fast. I, I didn't want to be next, you know. He looked at the floor. My life's been nothing but hell ever since. You working? Yeah, logging crew for Gorse Brothers up above Baker. He shook his head. I didn't think I'd ever see Susan again. Marshall turned to his desk and searched for some paper. Well, we'll have to keep in touch. Let me have your number and address at work and at home. Weed gave Marshall the information. And if I'm not there, you can probably find me at the Evergreen Tavern in Baker. Okay, listen. If you hear anything else from Susan, you let us know, day or night. He gave Weed his card with his home phone number added. Bernice came back in with the roster. Marshal, you have a call. I think it's urgent, she said. Then she turned to Weed. Kevin, let you and I step outside and go through this roster. Maybe we'll find that guy's full name. Weed stepped outside with Bernice as Marshall picked up the phone. Hogan, he said. Hogan, this is Ted Harmel. Marshall scrambled for a pencil. Hi, Ted. Thank you for calling. So you talked to Eldon, and Eldon talked to you. Carmel sighed and said, You're in trouble, Hogan. I'll give you one interview. Got a pencil handy? I'm ready. Shoot. Bernice had just said goodbye to Weed and seen him to the door when Marshall emerged from his office with a scribbled-on piece of paper in his hand. Any luck? He asked, Zilch, there are no Thomases of any kind, first or last name. It's still a lead, though. Who was that on the phone? 
Marshall produced the scrap of paper. Thank God for small favors. That was Ted Harmel. Bernice brightened considerably as Marshall explained. He wants to see me tomorrow, and here are the directions. It must be way back in the sticks. The guy is still paranoid as all get out. I'm surprised he didn't make me wear a disguise or something. He wouldn't say anything about all this? No, not over the phone. It has to be just the two of us, in private. Marshall leaned over just a little and said, He's another one who thinks our phone might be bugged. So, how do we make sure it isn't? Make that one of your assignments. Now here's the rest of them. Bernice grabbed her notepad off her desk and made her list as Marshall spoke. Check the New York phone book. I did. No A case of listed. Uh, scratch that one. Next, check around with the local real estate offices. If Weed's right about case of looking for property around here, some of those people might know something. And I'd look around in the commercial listings as well. Mm-hmm. And while you're at it, find out what you can about whoever owns Joe's Market. It's not Joe? No, the place used to belong to Joe and Angelina Carlucci. C-A-R-L-U-C-C-I. I want to know where they went and who owns the store now. See if you can get some straight answers. And you were going to check with your friend at the Times. Yeah, Limley. Marshall added a note to his piece of paper. That it? That's it for now. In the meantime, let's get back to running this paper. All the time, all through their meeting with Weed and their following conversation, Carmen sat at her desk, busily working and acting like she hadn't heard a word. The morning had been tight, with the next issue's deadline galloping up on them. But by noon, the paste-up was ready to go to the printer, and the office had a chance to resume its normal pace. Marshall put in a call to Lemley, his old comrade-in-arms at the New York Times. Lemley got all the information Marshall had on this strange character case of saying he'd get right on it. Marshall hung up the phone with one hand and grabbed his suit jacket with the other. His next stop was his afternoon appointment with the reclusive Ted Harmel. Bernice drove off for her appointed stops. She parked her red Toyota in the parking lot of what used to be Joe's Market, and was now called the Ashton Mercantile, and went into the store. About a half hour later, she returned to her car and drove away. It had been a wasted trip. No one knew anything. They only worked there. The manager wasn't in, and they had no idea when he would be back. Some had never heard of Joe Carlucci. Some had, but didn't know whatever happened to him. The assistant manager finally asked her to quit bothering all the employees on company time. So much for getting any straight answers. Now I was off to the realty offices. Johnson Smythe Realty occupied an old house remodeled into an office on the edge of the business part of town. The house still had a very charming front yard with a redwood tree standing tall in the middle of it and a quaint log cabin mailbox out front. It was warm and welcoming inside and quiet. Two desks occupied what used to be the living room. Both were empty at the time. On the walls hung bulletin boards with snapshots of house after house, with cards below each photograph describing the building, the property, the view, nearness to shopping, and so forth. And, last but not least, the price. Boy, what people would pay these days for a house. At a third desk in what used to be the dining room, a young lady stood and smiled at Bernice. Hi, can I help you? she asked. Bernice smiled back, introduced herself, and asked, I need to ask a question that might seem a little odd, but here goes. Are you ready? Ready. Have you done any business with anyone by the name of A. Kasef in the last year or so? Uh, how do you spell that? Bernice spelled it for her, then explained. You see, I'm trying to get in touch with him. It's just a personal matter. I was wondering if you might have a phone number or address or anything. The young lady looked at the name she had just written on a piece of paper and said, Well, I'm new here, so I sure don't know, but let me ask Rosemary. In the meantime, might I have a look through your microfiche? Sure. You know how to run it? Yes. The lady went toward the back of the house where Rosemary, apparently the boss lady, had her office in a back bedroom. 
Bernice could hear Rosemary talking on the phone. Getting an answer from her might take a while. Bernice went to the microfiche reader. Where to start? She looked at a map of Ashton and vicinity on the wall and found the location of Joe's Market. The hundreds of little celluloid plates were arranged by section, township, quarters, and the street numbers. Bernice had to do a lot of looking back and forth to get all the numbers off the map. Finally, she thought she might have found the right microfiche to put into the viewer. "'Excuse me?' came a voice. It was Rosemary marching down the hall toward her with a grim expression on her face. "'Miss Kruger, I'm afraid the microfiche is only for the use of our staff. If there's something you'd like me to find for you—' Bernice kept cool and tried to keep things flowing. "'Sure, I'm sorry. I was trying to find out the new owner of Joe's Market.' "'I wouldn't know. Well, I thought it might be on the machine here somewhere.' No, I don't think so. It's been a while since the files have been updated. Well, could we look anyway? Rosemary totally ignored the question. Is there anything else you'd like to know? Bernice stood firm and unshaken. Well, there was my original question. Have you done any business with anyone named Kasif in the last year or so? No, I've never heard the name. Well, perhaps someone else on your staff. They've never heard it either. Bernice was about to question that, but Rosemary interrupted with, I would know. I know all their accounts. Bernice thought of one other thing. You wouldn't have a, a cross-reference file, would you? No, we don't, Rosemary answered very abruptly. Now, is there anything else? Bernice was tired of being nice. Well, Rosemary, even if there was, I'm sure you would not be able or willing to supply it. I'm leaving now, so breathe easy. She left hurriedly, feeling very lied to. This audiobook has been broken into multiple parts to make the download faster. You have reached the end of a part, but not the end of the complete audiobook. So please check your library for the next part of this audiobook. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.